Welcome, welcome to today's episode of the Law of Self-Defense show for, what is today, Tuesday, January 17th, 2023. I am, of course, attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we started just about perfectly on time today. Glad you are all here. Let me check to make sure all the streams are working. So we should be streaming on YouTube, and we are on the Law of Self-Defense member dashboard, and we are on Rumble. Come on, Rumble. And we are, I can tell by the tie. And finally, finally, I don't have this prepped quite right. Uh, finally, on Twitter. And we are, I can't believe how good I'm getting at all of this. So we're all gathered here today. Thank you for coming in. Uh, for the continuing coverage of the Louis Casada self-defense immunity hearing. This was a four-day hearing, took place in Florida in mid-November, and Louis Casado, in a self-defense case, uh, was granted self-defense immunity by the hearing judge on December 30th of last year, meaning he was immunized from ongoing prosecution, not, I should note, from civil suit uh, by the survivors of the young man he uh, shot and killed, um, but from prosecution. So uh, technically, the state has the option to appeal that grant of immunity through Thursday of this week. And uh, they may do that. I don't believe there's any indication of that so far. But if they don't do it by Thursday, uh, effective Friday, uh, Louis Casada has permanent immunity from prosecution. And by the way, on Friday, on Friday, very exciting, we have coming onto the show... How do I find that now? Let's see. Coming on to the show, the defense counsel for, there we go, for Louis Casado. Uh, Dan Hilbert and attorney uh, Pat Kanan are the defense counsel during this hearing. They're doing a fantastic job. Uh, the state's doing a, not a great job in large part because it seems that the state doesn't really have all that much to work with. Uh, but certainly the defense is doing a great job, and that'll be airing on 1 p.m., Eastern time on Friday, January 20th. So we are now caught up with, uh, uh, oh, here comes the train folks. <laughs> we'll see how much train and, uh, and siren noise we managed to get today in today's show in, uh, at, at law self-defense HQ, man, that guy, that, that conductor, he loves that horn coming through town here. He loves it. Can you hear it? <laughs> you don't get this on any show, folks. Only on Law of Self-Defense. I, I believe I may be the only live streaming show, a certainly law tuber type show on the internet where you get train horns and uh, fire and police sirens as just embedded as part of the show. It's amazing. Uh, so this was a four-day set of hearings. Uh, Self-defense immunity hearings, of course, are uh, pretrial hearings in which a person charged with the use of force crime who's claiming self-defense is a legal justification can seek a final adjudication, a final decision on the question of whether or not he did act in self-defense without having to go to a full-blown trial. It's kind of a mini trial before the trial, less expensive, less time-consuming, less risky than a full-blown trial. I've gone over this in considerable detail in the, uh, the prior day's shows on this particular case. Uh, the facts of this case are that Louis Casado, who worked at a local uh, St. Augustine, Florida hotel uh, as security slash valet for the hotel, after working 30 days straight, decided to go out and have a couple drinks in St. Augustine to a couple of popular bars, uh, had a few drinks, uh, caught on surveillance, camera having drinks, uh, eyewitnesses came in to talk about his demeanor having drinks. He just appeared to be having a pleasant time chatting with people, was not in any way aggressive, obnoxious, nobody complained. Uh, the eyewitnesses, bartenders, uh, managers of these um, enterprises didn't have anything negative to say about Louis Casado or his conduct that night. Uh, he doesn't appear overly intoxicated. He's not stumbling around. Um, we don't know how intoxicated he is. He did have, I think, three or four beers and then a couple of cocktails over the course of several hours. Um, we do know uh, that the other party involved here, Adam Amoya, who this early in the morning hours of May 29th, 2021, would be shot dead 
by Louis Casado. Adam Amoya was juiced. He was His blood alcohol level was 0.266, which is more than three times the legal limit for drunk driving. And he was on oxy. Not a lot of oxy, uh, like a therapeutic dose of oxy, as if he'd suffered an injury and been prescribed oxy. But oxy and alcohol potentiate each other. So they increase each other's effects. So whatever you would expect, however drunk you would expect someone to be at 0.266, he was effectively drunker than that. So Adam was pretty juiced. Uh, the uh, the conflict happens after closing at the bar they were hanging out at, Dos Gatos. Both men had been there. Uh, they weren't interacting there. They apparently did not know each other. But after last call, a group of people are standing on the sidewalk outside the bar, still chatting with each other. Uh, Adam Amoya was there with a group of his friends. Louis Casado was by himself, but was chatting with some of Adam Amoya's friends. Um, and at some point, Adam Amoya seemed to take offense and uh, seemed to uh, began conversing with Louis Casado uh, and abruptly slapped Louis Casado hard across the face, hard enough to knock off Louis Casado's eyeglasses. They flew into the street. Immediately, one of Adam Casado, uh, sorry, one of Adam Amoya's friends, a very large dude, instantly smacked Louis Casado again. Then Adam Amoya followed up with more open-handed smacks, left, right, left, right to Louis Casado's face, backing Louis Casado up against the wall of the building, at which point Louis Casado drew a pistol, fired seven rounds, struck Adam Amoya five times mortally. So I do have the video of that confrontation, I believe. All right, well, I had it. Let me pull it back up again. Um, and uh, we don't see the shooting in this video, which is fine. We don't need to see that. But we see everything up to the moment of the shooting. From when the, uh, the people are standing outside. And this uh, surveillance video begins um, before this, during the hearing proceedings. We've seen a longer version of this video. And the longer version of the video uh, we can see that Louis Casado, the defendant here, is chatting with other people on the sidewalk, particularly the man in the uh, in the red shirt here on the left. Uh, they seem to be having a perfectly fine conversation. But at some point, Adam Amoya, the victim in this case, the victim of Louis Casado's use of force, he's the gentleman wearing the black baseball cap here. He begins conversing with Louis Casado, gets his attention. Uh, and this is the conversation that leads to physical conflict. So we'll see uh, Adam Amoya in the black hat smack Louis Casado's eyeglasses off his face. They fly into the street. Instantly, Mr. Redshirt on the left also smacks Louis Casado. And these are smacks hard enough uh, to make Casado stumble backwards. He's got his hands up in a placating position. Uh, and Adam Amoya follows up with a series of left, right, left, right, continuing slaps, continuing to close on Louis Casado, backs him up against the wall. That's when this video stops, but that's the moment the shots are fired. Uh, so there's no gore, uh, but there is physical violence here. So fair warning, uh, and there's no audio. So all we'll see is the video. It's, it's relatively short. It's only about 40 seconds long. But to set the context for how this all played out. So here we go. First lap, glasses, second by red shirt. Then Adam Amoya follows up. Hand still up, Louis Casada placating, placating, smack, 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 and the gun comes out in uh, Louis Casada's left hand, fire seven rounds. Um, now, uh, this certainly looks like a response to uh, Adam Amoya's use of force. Uh, the legal questions here would be one is um, can you use a gun against a barehanded attack, or do you lose on the element of proportionality? Uh, also, I think what might have troubled the prosecutor sufficiently about this case to bring this to trial or attempt to bring it to trial to charge Louis Casado with manslaughter, which is a criminal charge here. Uh, but manslaughter in this context under Florida's sentencing standard, uh, they have a very uh, severe gun sentencing enhancement statute in Florida called 1020 Life. Uh, and if you use a gun... Uh, to commit a use of force crime, and it's not self-defense, uh, you fire the gun, you kill somebody, it's a mandatory minimum 25 years to life in prison. So Louis Casada is looking at life charged with manslaughter here. Um, usually manslaughter in other states would not be as severe a sentence. You wouldn't be looking at a life sentence, but you are under Florida law. 
uh, is that, of course, Casado did have a few drinks himself, so presumably he was at least slightly intoxicated. And of the five of the seven rounds that struck Adam Amoya, uh, the one that was most certainly fatal, uh, it entered his back. That one pierced his heart, pierced his aorta. I mean, there was no recovering from that injury. Uh, the, the way the round struck, there was one to the shoulder, which is rather inconsequential. There were two to the chest, one to the flank, and then one to the rear, which suggests that Adam Amoya may have begun spinning away from the muzzle uh, of Casado's gun as the shots were being fired. So uh, Louis Casado is pleading self-defense. He stayed on the scene. He waited for the police to arrive. He's never claimed anything other than this was self-defense. He's not saying, hey, it wasn't me. You got the wrong guy. He's saying the opposite of that. He's saying it was me. I shot Adam Amoya, didn't know his name at the time, but I shot that guy, uh, killed him uh, with my gunshots, but I did it in lawful self-defense. And once that happens, and there's a prima facie case, there's more than zero evidence to support self-defense, and there is here, uh, then the burden shifts to the state to disprove self-defense. But they don't have to disprove your claim of self-defense entirely. They have to disprove any one of the required elements of self-defense. Now, we have this handy cheat sheet we make available for free, the five elements of self-defense law cheat sheet. Uh, we don't charge a penny for it, folks. It's just a PDF download. It lists the five elements of self-defense, provides a brief description of each. If you don't understand these, you can't possibly understand self-defense law. So if you do nothing else, please download this free PDF. You can get this at lawofselfdefense.com slash elements. In fact, I'll change the little name here under my face, lawofselfdefense.com slash elements, and you'll get this cheat sheet. And you'll see it lists five elements. That's the maximum required for justified self-defense, five elements. Often, not all five are applied. In Florida, for example, the majority of states, about 80% of states are stand your ground states. They don't apply this element of avoidance in an otherwise lawful case of self-defense. And if avoidance is not being applied, you're only looking at four elements you have to have for self-defense. That's the case here. Uh, innocence, imminence, proportionality, and reasonableness are the remaining four elements. But the state doesn't have to disprove Louis Casado's claim of self-defense in its entirely because these remaining four elements are required and cumulative. They must all be present. If any one of them is disproven, then you don't have self-defense as a strictly technical legal matter. So of course the prosecution knows this. They know it's a self-defense case. They know there's these discrete elements for them in this particular case, innocence, imminence, proportionality, and reasonableness. And they know that these are the state's targets of attack. They need to disprove one of these elements. If they can do that, it's a walkaway conviction because Louis Casada has already conceded. I shot and killed that guy. Unless there's a justification that's, just a crime. So the state knows it has to target one of these, and proportionality might well be one of those. Were the open-handed slaps uh, sufficient to justify the use of deadly defensive force by Louis Casado? Because normally, um, the courts treat by default a, a bare-handed attack as non-deadly force, a traditional fist fight between two men of similar size, strength, and fighting ability. They're going to treat as non-deadly force, and under the element of proportionality, which is on this side here, if all you're facing is a non-deadly force threat, you can't use deadly force in self-defense. Your, your defensive force has to be proportional to the threat. So if you're facing a non-deadly force threat, you're limited to non-deadly force in self-defense. You can't use deadly defensive force like a gun unless you're facing a deadly force threat. Well, here, Louis Casado used a gun, which is, as a matter of law, deadly defensive force. Was he facing a deadly force threat? If he wasn't, then the gun was disproportional. He loses the element of proportionality. He loses self-defense. But are there circumstances in which even a bare-handed attack can be a deadly force threat against which a gun would be appropriate? And the answer there is yes. There are aggravating factors that can exist that would make a bare-handed attack not simply a traditional fistfight not merely a non-deadly force attack, but a deadly force attack. Now, importantly, the definition of deadly force is not just force that can kill. It's also force that can cause serious bodily injury or grave bodily harm. Every state has a three-word phrase for this, but it means the same thing. It means a substantial in injury, more than a minor injury, more than a bruise, uh, something disabling, uh, causes a loss of bodily function, 
uh, loss of consciousness, a broken bone. You get the idea. So if this was the kind of, if a barehanded attack is of a nature that it can cause serious bodily injury, well, then it's a deadly force attack. It, it transitions from the non-deadly force bucket to the deadly force bucket. And if it's in the deadly force bucket, you can use a gun to defend yourself. You can use deadly defensive force to defend against a deadly force attack. So what kind of aggravating factors would apply that would transition a barehanded attack from the non-deadly force bucket to the deadly force bucket? Well, one of them is when there's a substantial disparity in size, strength, or fighting ability of the, the, the parties involved. Um, so it's not a traditional fist fight between two men of similar size, strength, and fighting ability. Uh, one's substantially larger than the other or stronger than the other or has an exceptional fighting ability. Mike Tyson attacking me, for example, that the uh, defender doesn't have. Uh, it's not clear to me to what extent those factors apply here. Uh, when they do apply, uh, they often apply, for example, when you have a male attacker and a female defender, then those factors tend to be kind of baked into the cake because male attackers tend to be larger, stronger, more fighting capability than the, the women they attack. But there are other aggravating factors that could exist. Uh, if there's a disparity of numbers, so there's a single defender and multiple attackers. Well, we have that here. At least two men actually struck Louis Casado, and it would appear from the video that other parties of Adam Amoya's friend group on the sidewalk were advancing on Louis Casado as well. But certainly he was struck by two different people at the very least. Uh, Mr. Redshirt being particularly large. So there is a definite disparity in size there between Mr. Redshirt, uh, Flex, I think is his street name, uh, and uh, Louis Casado. So there's a disparity of numbers. One of the attackers is certainly substantially larger. Um, also, if the defenders suffer some kind of disabling injury. So fights are dynamic, things change. You might have two men of similar size, strength, and fighting ability, but if one of them suffers a broken arm in the course of the conflict, well, they're not similarly situated anymore to the attacker, right? Now they're exceptionally vulnerable to harm. Here, one of the key factors for the defense is going to be that the very first blow uh, stripped Louis Casado of his eyeglasses. They go flying into the street. Uh, and all the testimony we've heard so far is that at the very best, Louis Casado's eye vision without his glasses was 2,800. It may have been, traditionally it was as bad as 2,200. Uh, the defense brought as a witness his lifelong optometrist. Uh, and although there was one exam uh, a few years ago where um, uh, an associate optometrist in the office diagnosed Louis Casado with 2080 vision, traditionally he'd normally had 2200 vision, which is uh, legally blind for purposes of, of driving, for example, unless it's corrected with glasses. Uh, so Certainly, Louis Casado suffered, at the very least from the loss of his glasses, a substantial degradation in his vision, uh, and those blows were rocking his head back. So there certainly could have been concussive ev um, events, consequences as well, from the severity of the blows, the number of the blows, the sustained nature of the blows, no real opportunity to kind of recover uh, between blows in this particular case. So those are all aggravating factors that could lead a reasonable person in Louis Casada's position to reasonably perceive a deadly force threat, even though it was barehanded in nature. And that would justify going to the, uh, the gun in self-defense. Uh, certainly on the other elements, uh, innocence, while Louis Casado was not the initial physical aggressor here, the initial unlawful physical aggressor, that was Adam Amoya uh, and his friend, and Adam Amoya continued that aggression. So in, the element of innocence seems clearly in Louis Casado's favor. Imminence has to do with whether or not Louis Casado was facing a threat either actually in progress or immediately about to occur, and both of those are clearly the case here. Reasonableness, Louis Casado was not unreasonably perceiving that he was being struck in the head repeatedly, uh, so that seems in his favor as well. Uh, it's only proportionality that one might argue he's vulnerable on, but I think he has a robust counter-narrative for an attack on proportionality. I expect that's fundamentally where the state's going to go, however. The state may attack reasonableness based on Casado's drinking that evening. Uh, you know, when, when you're intoxicated and you act in self-defense, just because you're drunk doesn't mean you've lost your privilege of self-defense. You have all the privileges you normally have. But if you make bad decisions because you're drunk, you own those decisions. You don't get a special drunk person's self-defense. You're same, held to the same legal standard uh, as if you were a sober person. 
But if you're drunk and you make the right decisions despite, despite being drunk, that's still lawful self-defense. But it does open an opportunity for the prosecution to argue that, hey, we all know drunk people tend to make poor decisions. So we're arguing that this defender did that as well. So the prosecution may attempt to attack the element of reasonableness on, on that basis. Doesn't seem very compelling because on the substance, we don't really see... I mean, if you buy the proportionality argument by the defense that I expect the defense to make, what did Louis Casado do wrong if, if proportionality was sound? I, I mean, I just don't see it here. Uh, another important thing to keep in mind is in every state in the country, when you're at trial, so there's a judge, typically there's a jury, unless there's a bench trial, um, and you've you've properly raised the legal defense of self-defense, you've you've met your burden of production to get self-defense accepted by the court as a legal defense that you're allowed to argue in front of the jury, which is generally not that hard to do. Uh, then the burden is on the state to disprove self-defense, meaning disprove one of those required elements beyond a reasonable doubt, which means that the, the jury could think it's really likely that it wasn't self-defense. They still have to acquit unless they believe one of those elements was disproven beyond any reasonable doubt. In the self-defense immunity hearing, the state still has a high burden, but it's not that high. So uh, a common burden in courts is 51%, a preponderance of the evidence. And in many states, self-defense immunity hinges on a preponderance standard, uh, but Florida is an exception. Uh, so at trial, the state has to disprove self-defense by this much evidence, beyond a reasonable doubt. Let's call that 95%. Preponderance is 51%. Under Florida law, at the self-defense immunity hearing, the state has to disprove self-defense, disprove one of those elements of self-defense by clear and convincing evidence. What does that mean? Let's call it, it's something in between preponderance and beyond a reasonable doubt. Let's call it 75% of the evidence. Uh, so the state could, in theory, um, if the state fails to do that at the self-defense immunity hearing, then the judge is supposed to grant um immunity. And frankly, if the state can't disprove self-defense by this much at the hearing, why would they think they could disprove it by this much at the trial? Right? That's not rational. Uh, so I think it's it's a perfectly fine standard. Um, and I love self-defense immunity laws because they give you an opportunity to adjudicate self-defense before the trial. Uh, trials are incredibly costly, uh, especially killing trials like this, manslaughter, murder trials. The ones I consult on, they, they routinely go through $200,000 before they get to trial, before they get to trial. So you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars for legal uh, defense, especially this kind of legal defense. The, the, the defense here has called six expert witnesses for the hearing. Maybe they would have called more for a trial. But just for the hearing, they called six, and expert witnesses are expensive, especially some of the expert witnesses of, of the level we're seeing here. Uh, there are use of force expert witness, which we'll, we'll, who we'll hear from today. Uh, Roy Bedard is quite well known uh, and uh, presumably extremely well paid. Uh, he's here. So that those expert witnesses make trials expensive. Uh, and they're, they're often very time consuming, can be weeks for a high profile trial. And they're very risky. If you lose a trial as a defense, well, your, your client's convicted. And in this case, Louis Casado could be looking at life in prison. At the self-defense immunity hearing, uh, they tend to be just, a, most often they're like a day. Uh, this one was kind of long. It was four days of hearing. Uh, so, but still shorter than weeks for a trial. Uh, they tend to be less expensive than a trial. Uh, maybe not this one because this was four days. Most murder trials, most killing trials, folks, are like a day or two, the whole trial. So a four-day hearing is kind of long. Uh, so they may not have saved all that much money here in this particular hearing. Not that it wasn't worth it because immunity was ultimately granted. So they saved themselves the cost of the trial. Um, but it's also lower risk. So if you're the defendant and you're at trial and you lose, off to prison you go. If you're the defendant at the hearing, a self-defense immunity hearing, and you lose, well, you still get another shot at it. You get to go to trial. And you lost at the 75% threshold, the burden on the state. Meaning in, in that context at the hearing, if the state has to have 75% of the evidence, you have to have 25%. So if you lost at the hearing, it means you failed to hit 26%, right? But a trial, the state has to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. Let's call that 95%. So a trial, as a defense, you only need to come up with 6% of the evidence is one way to 
conceptually think about this. So uh, the, the challenge for the defense at trial is much less than it is at the hearing. So if you lose at the hearing, you still get another shot at the trial where the conditions are much more favorable to you in terms of the, the burden, the threshold of proof uh, that has to be uh, met by the state. Uh, and by the way, these are routinely, these hearings are routinely referred to as stand your ground hearings. They're not stand your ground hearings. There's no such thing as a stand your ground hearing. Stand your ground is a completely legal, uh, separate legal doctrine from uh, immunity. Stand your ground has the effect of removing uh, the element of avoidance in an otherwise lawful case of self-defense. Stand your ground effectively redefines what qualifies as self-defense by instead of requiring five elements, requiring only four elements. It changes the definition of self-defense. Understand your ground. You don't have a legal duty to retreat before you can lawfully defend yourself with deadly force. If you don't have stand your ground, then you're in a duty to retreat state. And in a duty to retreat state, you do have a legal duty to retreat, if safely possible, before you can use deadly force in self-defense. But in a stand your ground state, in otherwise lawful cases of self-defense, avoidance is taken off the table. So self-defense only requires four elements, innocence, eminence, proportionality, and reasonableness, not five elements. So stand your ground redefines what qualifies as self-defense. Self-defense immunity doesn't do anything like that. Self-defense immunity simply says, if what you did qualifies as self-defense, however it may be defined, then you're granted immunity from prosecution and or civil suit, depending on the state. Uh, so there's no such thing as a stand your ground hearing. You just qualify for, everybody qualifies for stand your ground in a stand your ground state if you, if you meet the conditions. Like lots of states have conditions that have to be met for stand your ground, like you weren't involved in criminal activity, you weren't a place you had a right to be. Um, it varies a little bit by state. Uh, but assuming those you're not doing those things, you're not violating those rules, everyone qualifies for stand your ground. You don't need a hearing for that. To get immunity, you need a hearing because somebody, the hearing judge, has to make the call on whether it looks like it was self-defense to him under the appropriate legal standard. Uh, so if you ever hear of a stand your ground hearing, that's nonsense. There's no such thing as a stand your ground hearing. It's a self-defense immunity hearing. The trouble is under Florida law, they adopted the doctrine of stand your ground and this doctrine of self-defense immunity at the same time. And when the media reports on these things, because the media is largely composed of idiots who don't know what they're talking about, uh, when the media reports on these things, uh, to simplify the, 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 all of this for their news reporting, they blurred together the concepts of stand your ground and self-defense immunity. And of course, the, the media was very hostile uh, to both these concepts uh, because, well, they're anti-gun and anti-self-defense. And both stand your ground and immunity are favorable to self-defense. So the media was hostile to both concepts uh, and tried to create a very negative perception of the phrase stand your ground. And once they'd done that, they applied the phrase stand your ground to anything they didn't like, including self-defense immunity. But because the media did this, it's common in Florida, even for competent defense attorneys and judges, to follow what's become this practice of calling these things stand your ground hearings they're not stand your ground hearings. No such thing as a stand your ground hearing. They are self-defense immunity hearings. And that's what we're watching here with uh, in this Louis Casado case is this four day self-defense immunity hearing. We're now entering day three with today's live show. Of course, I'm live right now, if you're watching this live. Uh, the video I'll be sharing with you of the proceedings are from mid-November, so that's recorded. Uh, the good part is that allows me to you know play it at a faster rate than a live broadcast from a courtroom, uh, and also to skip over break. So I'm hoping today to get entirely through day three, which will get us through, uh, I think, all the defense witnesses except for two. Uh, so the last two defense witnesses speak on the morning of day four of the hearing. Then the state presents two rebuttal witnesses on day four. Uh, and then the the uh, the state and the defense basically make what, what would a trial be their closing arguments to the judge. Uh, and then the hearing's over uh, while the judge considers his ruling. Now, we know in this case, the judge handed down his ruling on the, December 30th, about six weeks after these hearings, after the, the four-day hearing here, uh, and granted immunity. So we know what the judge's ruling is. Uh, and once we finish with the hearing proceedings, we'll jump right to the judge's written order granting immunity, and we'll step through that as well. Uh, and we'll, we'll get all that done before 
we have the uh, Defense Council appear as live guests on Friday's live stream at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Now, uh, I'm hoping to get through all of day three of the hearing, all the way through Roy Bedard, and then I think uh, the witness after uh, Roy Bedard is uh, a plastic surgeon. Uh, who I expect will talk about the injuries that can be suffered even from open-handed slaps. Uh, I'm hoping to get through all that today uh, because tonight we have a big storm coming into my area, snowstorm. Or we're expecting to get something close to a foot of snow. So I'm not sure what tomorrow is going to look like in terms of being able to get into the office. Uh, we'll have to see. We'll kind of play it by ear. But I do want to get a big chunk of what's left to cover in the hearings done today, hopefully all of day three. Uh, and then we'll we'll play it by ear for the rest of the week. But we do have Wednesday and Thursday and Friday morning to get through the rest before we have a uh, defense council live at 1 p.m. Eastern time on uh, Friday. Okay, let's see. I think that's the substance of what we'll cover today. Of course, I do have other stuff to talk about because at Law Self-Defense, we have stuff we would like to share with you. Um, one of those is we have one of our rare, meaning once or twice a year, full day law of self-defense advanced courses coming up on April 15th of this year. This is our full day, the most comprehensive class on self-defense law we have. We cover all the five elements of self-defense in great detail. We cover the realities and practicalities of the criminal justice system, how prosecutors make decisions to drag people into a trial so you know how you should not appear to a prosecutor, what kinds of things to avoid. We talk about defense of property, defense of others. We talk about defense of highly defensible property like your home, which is quite different than defending personal property. Um, we talk about interacting with the police in the aftermath of a use of force event, uh, which we spend an hour on all by itself. So what, how do you interact with the police? And if you think there's only one type of interaction with the police, folks, you're mistaken. There's at least three different types of police interactions, and each one needs to be treated differently, I would argue. Uh, so we spend a full hour covering that, uh, we, uh, and much, much more. And we illustrate all this with real-world cases to provide you with a real-world context. So it's not just dry academic legal lecture. Uh, it's actionable information that makes you uh, harder to kill and harder to convict. Now, we only do this class often once a year, sometimes twice a year, but we just scheduled one so far for 2023. Um, if we do another one, it won't be for another six months after that. But can you wait an extra six months before you know how to lawfully defend yourself, your family, your property? Do you know when you're going to be the victim of an attack? I mean, you don't get to decide that, right? The bad guy decides the time, place, and manner of attack. So I would urge you not to wait. And another reason not to wait is the sooner you sign up, the bigger the discount you get off the registration. So for the April 15th class, if you sign up this month in January, it's 50% off the registration. That saves you 100 bucks right there. You can still sign up in February, but in February, it's only 25% off. And in March, it's only 10% off. And then, of course, in April, it's just the full price, the roughly $200 uh, registration for the course. So if this full day law self-defense advance course is of interest to you, I would encourage you to register sooner rather than later. Save the most money. Get the information uh, sooner than whenever our next class might be, which could potentially not be until the next year, at lawofselfdefense.com slash advanced. And if you'd like to prep before that, you can also, of course, always get our best-selling book, The Law of Self-Defense Principles, for free. Now, I would encourage you to look up this book on Amazon. It's got over, Law of Self-Defense has over 1,200 reviews, five-star rated book. Uh, but don't buy it on Amazon. Amazon will charge you $25, roughly, plus shipping and handling. We'll eat the cost of the book and send it to you just for the shipping and handling. So less than nine bucks, I think, for the shipping and handling to pay for the warehouse guys and the U.S. Postal Service postage service, uh, postal service, I suppose, USPS. Uh, and we'll send you, and it's a real book. It's not a PDF download or something. It's a real physical book that you'll get. Um, and if you read this, and most people can read it in an afternoon, it's written in plain English. The, the biggest compliment we get on this book is that it's easy to read. Uh, you'll know 80% of what I know about self-defense law, and you'll have made yourself a lot harder to convict. So I would encourage you to do that. You can get the book at lawofselfdefense.com slash free book. 
And if you would like to have your questions answered during the course of today's live show, there's two ways to do that. Uh, the, the way I, I really don't recommend, but you're, it's open to you, is on if you're watching this on YouTube, you can do a super chat on YouTube, minimum of $5. Uh, the more you contribute, the more I prioritize your question, uh, but a minimum of $5 super chat, or you can become a Law of Self-Defense member and ask as many questions as you want. And in fact, uh, the normal Law of Self-Defense membership is only it's less than 10 bucks a month, about 30 cents a day. So for the entire month for less than $10, you can ask as many questions as you want, as opposed to paying a minimum of five bucks a piece on YouTube. By the way, YouTube takes a third of that five bucks or whatever it is you pay for a super chat. Instead of that, you could be a law self-defense member for less than 10 bucks a month, get all your questions answered, or even better yet right now, you can become a law self-defense member for two weeks for just 99 cents, 99 cents and get all your questions answered for those two weeks. And if you don't like it in the two weeks, just let us know and we'll refund you 200% of your money. Okay, it's only $1.98 you're getting back, but we didn't ask for much up front. Uh, so it's a negative risk proposition. You you can't, you make money <laughs> if you quit being a member. And if, but I, we don't really have people do that very often at all. Uh, and if you stay a member, it's I think 9.95 a month uh, The nor is a normal membership rate. So you would just flip over to that Again, 30 cents a day uh, to be able to ask as many questions as you want. And you can take advantage of this two week 99 cent trial. You can do it right now. So you can ask all your questions today for 99 cents uh, at lostselfdefense.com slash trial. All right, so with all that out of the way, let's pull up the actual live stream of day three. Uh, before I dive into that, let me take a quick look right away and see if we have any questions that I already need to address. Let's see. We have our member dashboard. That's where the members can pose their questions for free and the members only chat. All the usual suspects have come in. Great. Uh, Law Self-Defense member Richard asks, at no cost, because he's a member, Law Self-Defense member, asks, why did the state even pursue this case? It just seems to me the state prosecution has changed to a continuous adversary rather than a mechanism for justice. Or am I just jaundiced and it has always been this way? So I don't personally know this prosecutor. Uh, I can tell you that the uh, attorneys who practice in that area, who do know this prosecutor, uh, have, have nothing nice to say. I mean, they have really vile things to say about this prosecutor. I'm not gonna repeat them because they're not based on my personal knowledge, but you know, I, I've worked with a lot of prosecutors and the ones I know uh, are, are almost invariably, almost invariably uh, really uh, hardworking public servants trying to do a good job and make the right calls. Uh, often in these high profile cases, we see the worst of prosecutors. We see the Angela Corys in the Zimmerman trial. We see the Binger and, and Kraus in the, in the Rittenhouse prosecution. Uh, but often those are high profile cases because they're politically energized or racially energized and they attract those kinds of politically motivated prosecutors. Uh, again, I, I spoke earlier about some of the factors the prosecutor may be looking at here. Uh, they may be looking at the fact that a gun was used against a barehanded attack. They may be looking at that Casado had been drinking. I mean, of course, his attacker had, had also been drinking. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, when, when the when the state makes its effectively its closing argument on day four of this, which hopefully we'll get to tomorrow, but if the snow blocks me out of the office, then certainly on Thursday, th then we'll really get a chance for the first time to hear the state's narrative of why they think this was not self defense. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that Louis Casado fired six rounds. Uh, sorry, he fired seven rounds. Five of them hit uh, Adam Amoya. All seven rounds were fired in 1.6 seconds. So this was a flurry of shots. This was different than some other cases we've seen where a couple shots are fired and then there's a pause where, and then circumstances change, like the Taqueria shooting that just happened in Texas, right? Uh, there, there were four shots fired. Uh, into the back of or the flank of the armed robbery suspect, certainly lawful under the circumstances. But at that point, the armed robber starts to fall to the ground, right? Uh, and hits the ground and he loses his gun and four more shots are fired. Different circumstances now. 
Uh, so not the same rationale, legal rationale for firing those last four, sh uh, those the second set of four shots. Um, and then the shooter uh, picks up the robber's gun, has it in his own possession, and fires a ninth round into uh, the armed robber's head while the armed robber appears to be unconscious, prone on the ground. Um, and that that's very different circumstances. Uh, we don't really have that here. The, the the attack more or less is in progress when the seven shots are fired in 1.6 seconds. Uh, so a different uh, a different set of circumstances without the big pause. When when you have these pauses or opportunities for a defender to, for a reasonable defender to identify that circumstances have changed and deadly defensive force is no longer warranted, and they continue using force. Uh, well, then an argument can be made that that later force was no longer justified, even if the earlier force was. Uh, here, that would be hard to justify in the brief period in which all these shots were fired. I mean, uh, that would be a difficult argument, I think, for the prosecution to make, but they might make it. Uh, let's see. Uh, Law self-defense member Joe asks, uh, do we know where the other two rounds went in the current case? I don't believe we do know. And frankly, it's the most common thing in the world. In fact, Louis Casado may be legally blind because his glasses had been knocked off, uh, fired seven rounds and hit five times. Uh, now, granted, the target was pretty close within a couple feet, um, but police officers routinely hit only about 30% of the time. So missing in a chaotic, violent uh, self-defense shooting is not at all unusual. Obviously, it's not optimal. We should do everything we can to make sure we're hitting our intended target. Uh, but it, it doesn't become criminal just because there are errant rounds. Uh, Law self-defense member Jim asks, uh, since he was found to be defending himself and there were two attackers and someone died, shouldn't the other attacker be charged with at least manslaughter? Uh, I don't see the rationale for that. If somebody else in the group had been committing a felony, then they might be subject to felony murder charges, but... At, at worst, I think it would be a simple battery by like red shirt, for example. There was a question raised about whether or not red shirt had a had red shirt been charged with battery in this case, uh, because he also struck Louis Casada, and the answer was he hadn't. We had a police, one of the police investigators inv involved uh, was an eyewitness already for the uh, for the state, and he said no, no, red shirt. Flex, I think his street name is, was not charged with battery for striking Louis Casado, but the reason is because. There was no complainant. The complainant would have been Louis Casado. And for Louis Casado to file a complaint, he'd have to provide a narrative for why he was bringing charges of battery. And you don't want to do that if you're facing life in prison. Because anything you say in your narrative about the battery could open doors, could be evidence that could be used against you uh, in your fight to try to avoid life in prison. So it's understandable why Louis Casado just left the battery on the table. But certainly it was a simple battery. I mean, just on its face. Uh, Thomas C. asks, uh, are the rules of that law self-defense member, Thomas, um, are the rules of discovery similar for pretrial hearings and actual trials? Uh, this seemed like an expensive gamble for the defense if the state case was stronger than they thought, since if they didn't slam dunk it, they would have to do it all over again at trial. Uh, well, they would have done the discovery stuff anyway. Uh, so like all the depositions, for example, Florida is, has very generous rules uh, for the parties in a criminal case, the state and the defense, to uh, have an opportunity to depose each other's witnesses. Not every state allows for that. Uh, I think it's a great policy because I think when we go into the trial, there should be no surprise testimony, in my opinion. Everybody should know, not everybody, everybody except the jury, but the parties should know exactly what the testimony is going to be. They should know exactly what answer they're going to get to every question. So there should be no surprises in the trial for the parties, for the state and the defense. Uh, their purpose in the trial is not to uh, elicit surprise testimony. The purpose in the trial is to tell a story to the jury. The state gets to tell a story of guilt. The defense gets to tell a story of innocence, of not guilt. And then the jury gets to make the call. So for the jury, everything is fresh, but for the parties, the, the trial should be completely predictable. There should be no surprises at all. So I love that Florida has such generous provisions for depositions because once you depose someone, they're kind of locked into the answers they gave at the deposition. If they change their answers on, on the witness stand at trial, you can impeach them with a deposition transcript. 
Uh, so I'm a big fan of that. Now, depositions are extremely expensive, easily thousands of dollars. That's another reason that it's so easy to run up these legal costs in these self-defense trials. You wonder, how can you spend a couple hundred thousand dollars pre-trial? Well, you know, you're, if you're dropping five grand a deposition and there's a lot of depositions, there's a lot of witnesses. And folks, if you have the opportunity and you have the resources, you want to do that. Because again, the deposition locks that witness in. Sometimes we saw this in the George Zimmerman trial. Uh, the event happens, but it's 14 months until the trial. And during that 14 months, in the first couple months after George Zimmerman shot Trayvon Martin, nobody thought there was going to be a trial. The, 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 the police investigators and the local prosecutor, they, they spent a lot of time and effort, a lot of group meetings looking at that shooting. And they were like, it's just self-defense. They weren't going to charge George Zimmerman. But then the Benjamin Crumps came in, the Al Sharptons came in, it became a racially energized case. The state brought in Angela Corey from a different judicial district in Florida to be the prosecutor. And uh, and then another you know, 12 months, a year went by before the case actually got to trial. And the whole time, George Zimmerman's being demonized in the press. And every prospective witnesses, uh, witness now knows this is a racially energized trial. And George Zimmerman's supposed to be a horrible a racist assassin who killed a 12-year-old. Well, those witnesses sometimes change their testimony due to that influence and, or out of fear. Uh, so there were a couple witnesses in the Zimmerman trial who got on the witness stand and said things that were very harmful to George Zimmerman's legal defense. Like George Zimmerman, I, I heard, it was an ear witness, I heard George Zimmerman chasing down Trayvon Martin, a fleeing Trayvon Martin. Uh, but that witness had said completely different things in their deposition. So the defense could just bring up the deposition and said, well, you, you never said a word about this months ago and completely impeached the value of that apparently false testimony by that witness on the witness stand. So you want to do those depositions if you have the opportunity and you have the money, but you need the money to do them. Uh, so yes, these cases can get very expensive, but folks, you want to spend the money if you can. Um, and, you know, so... I had, of course. And by the way, if you're worried about having the money, uh, one thing you can do is become a Law of Self-Defense member. Now, uh, this is a discount code here at the bottom. The discount code has changed. I need to update this slide. Uh, but CCW Safe is one of the what are commonly referred to as self-defense insurance companies. They, they don't sell insurance. That's a misnomer. But CCW Safe promises to cover your legal expenses if you're involved in a use of force event and you're a member. Uh, and uh, I've worked with them for many years. I think they're a great organization. In fact, they're the only one of these companies that I recommend even considering. Um, they uh, And they do more than cover the cost of your legal expense. They drop your an, an investigative team. They have a team of experienced homicide investigators retired now that work for CCW Safe. They become your investigators on the scene working for you. And if you don't have that, the only investigators on the scene work for the prosecution, which is not great. Um, so I, I think they do a lot of fantastic work. I think they're a great team. I do a lot of partnering with them. Uh, so full disclosure. Um, but uh, if you're thinking about how you might cover these kind of unbelievable expenses if you're ever involved in a use of force event and, and are facing trial, then I would encourage you to take a look at lawofselfdefense.com slash ccwsafe. And if you do decide to join, you can get 10% off your first year of membership using the discount code LSD10, LSD like the drug. Uh, it's not LOSD anymore. LSD10 will get you 10% off your CCW Safe membership. And then you don't have to worry about the cost. By the way, Unlike some of their competitors, a lot of the competitors, if you're convicted of trial, they cut you off. They say, well, you're convicted now. You're a criminal. CCW say, if you're convicted and you have grounds for appeal, they cover your appeal. A lot of these other organizations, if you appeal and you get a second trial, they say, well, you spent all your allowed coverage on the first trial, and they don't cover you for the second trial. CCW Safe says, hey, if you appeal and you get, you're lucky enough to get a retrial, we cover the retrial. So something something to think about. I, I think CCW Safe is by far the most advantageous of those organizations. Uh, that's why they're the only one I really recommend. I don't recommend any of the others. Uh, okay, so. Oh, yes, we were answering questions from members. Let's see.
Uh, Law Self Defense member Steve asks, would this be a circumstance where having an alternative to deadly force such as pepper spray might be appropriate? Maybe it's a tough call. Um, you know, if Casado believes he's under a deadly force attack, if you're under a deadly force attack, then pepper spray is not really the appropriate response. I mean, if you're under an imminent deadly force attack, which is what the law requires for deadly defensive force to be justified, you know, pepper spray is not magic. It doesn't always work. It often has a delayed response. Uh, and you're and you're facing imminent death or serious bodily injury. So I, I, I encourage people to carry pepper spray. I carry pepper spray every day. Uh, even though I carry a gun every day, uh, but I carry the pepper spray to deal lawfully with non-deadly force attacks. If I'm facing an imminent deadly force attack, uh, probably the pepper spray is not my first choice. Uh, I don't know if he had pepper spray on him or not. I, I would recommend to anyone who carries a gun for personal protection, make sure you also carry pepper spray because according to Department of Justice FBI statistics, you're, you're five times more likely to be threatened with a non-deadly force threat than a deadly force threat. Now, that means the gun the gun is only really the answer to your problem, right? 20, 25% of the time, 20% of the time. Uh, now, when, when a gun is the answer, it's generally the only answer, but it's rarely the answer. So what's your answer for the, for the five times more common non-deadly force threat? You better have a non-deadly means of self-defense. And I, I like pepper spray for that. There are, of course, other options. I just encourage you to have some, some non-deadly means of self-defense. Uh, let's see. Oh, so we were talking about the discovery, the deposition stuff. Uh, there's another component here, of course, and that's all these expert witnesses. So that does increase the cost, right? So the defense called all these expert witnesses for this hearing. If they lose the immunity hearing, they're going to have to call them all again for the trial. And they're going to have to pay them all again for the trial. <laughs> that's a lot of money to pay these guys to show up twice and gals to show up twice. Um, I, I guess they. If you know you have the money, then it's that's not an issue. Um, I wouldn't want to be in a position necessarily. I, we can ask counsel about this on Friday, uh, where you know you can all you only have the money to call the witnesses once, and you're doing it in the hearing as opposed to the trial. I, I don't know if that was something they were concerned about or not, but that that would be a difficult decision. By the way, folks, there are reasons not to do a self defense in the trial. Um, that I, I hear commonly from defense attorneys in, in Florida, for example, where you can do this kind of immunity hearing. Uh, and that is, you're in, in effect, you're exposing your entire defense strategy to the state. So the state hears all your witnesses, they hear your arguments. And if those witnesses and arguments expose weaknesses in the state's own nerve of guilt, well, the state gets to patch those up before they get to trial. So those weaknesses don't exist anymore at the trial in front of a jury. Um, so that's that's a risk you take. You you are exposing your defense strategy. Let's see. Uh, law self defense member Donnie asked, "Do I have a copy of the motion to dismiss on grounds of immunity?" I I don't have that. I do have the judge's order granting immunity, and we'll step through that. The order to dismiss is generally not that helpful because it's just the the defense narrative of self defense, which we're going to hear uh, at the close of the hearing anyway. Uh, let's see. Okay, more questions about the, the Zimmerman trial, but I don't want to get buried in that here. We're, we're doing, today we're doing the uh, Louis Casado trial. All right, let me take a look at Super Chat. And it looks like uh, there are no, no Super Chats yet for today. Okay, fair enough. So let's go ahead and start now with the day three of the Louis Casado self-defense immunity hearing. This is the judge, uh, Lee Smith. And he's going to, uh, right now, the defense is continuing in its presentation of witnesses. The state's presented all their primary witnesses. The defense has a bunch more witnesses to go through today. Uh, those include, uh, let's see, uh, we'll start, I believe, with Per Ward. He's a forensic video analyst. So he's going to have things to say about the surveillance video that captured this confrontation. Uh, uh, Nicholas Ray, I don't know what his role is, Corporal Nicholas Argitis. 
who presumably is an investigator. Dr. Roy Bedard, he's the use of force expert. I'll, I'll have more to say about Dr. Bedard when we get to his testimony. Uh, he's very uh, popular. He's very prominent, I should say, as a use of force expert. Uh, but in, in my experience observing his testimony, it's it's been a mixed bag. Sometimes solid, sometimes a train wreck. And I'll, I'll share stories about that as we get to his testimony. Uh, and Dr. Deidre Leak, a facial plastic surgeon, is the last defense witness of the day. Uh, then tomorrow, or uh, and day four of the hearing, the defense also has Dr. Lawrence Miller, a psychologist. That's the last defense witness. And then the state calls two rebuttal witnesses, Dr. Alan Dean, an optometrist, to rebut the defense optometrist that we heard from yesterday, and Dr. Richard Howe, a criminal justice and criminology professor, uh, to rebut the Dr. Roy Bedard use of force expert for the defense testimony. So here we start with, with uh, I believe, Nicholas, uh, sorry, Paris Ward, the forensic video analyst. So we should expect to see a bunch of video here. No, sir. Uh, call your name, sir. Yes, sir. We would call Paris Ward. Paris, would you stand up and with you, thank you, Judge. Good morning. Uh, please state your full name. My full name is Paris Ford. That's P A R R S W A R D. And what is your occupation? By the way, we'll probably be doing this for hours today. If anyone is going to be looking for an opportunity for a restroom break or a snack break to step away from the computer, a great time to do that is anytime there's an expert witness taking the stand, they're going to spend the first probably five or 10 minutes talking about their background and credentials, things that are not substantive to the legal issues in the case. Um, I mean, unless you care about their background and credentials, that's a great time to step away. I'll probably take advantage of that myself to refresh my coffee and so forth. I'm a certified forensic video analyst and expert in computer modeling. And how long have you had that designation? Uh, I've had the forensic video analyst uh, designation through LEMA, which is the Law Enforcement and Emergency Services Video Association, uh, for just a few, actually a few weeks before that, I was certified as a video tech, uh, certified video, forensic video tech. We have a coffer. So your corporate. designation is actually Improved or what's the right word? Yes, it has improved. Yes, okay. in the last couple of weeks. Yes, yes. So tell uh, tell us what your educational background is. Okay, um, I went to school uh, at Pepperdine University, got a degree in journalism. Actually, went on to law school, uh, and then I also took uh, classes at UCLA in uh, video technology, including video systems and uh, various softwares that use in uh, both computer animation and video editing. I took a class at MIT in high-speed digital imaging, and I've taken uh, classes since then through uh, various training uh, in forensic video technology and in uh, laser scanning. I'm certified as a or laser scanning through phase of Faro Technologies, that's F-A-R-O. Uh, By the way, I see someone mentioned in the comments that I should someday do an entire show on the Zimmerman trial. Folks, I covered every minute of the Zimmerman trial live while it was happening. I watched every second of the trial, including most of the pretrial proceedings. Uh, and I aggregated, I was writing for it every day on uh, legal insurrection. That's a, uh, a legal blog that's run out of Cornell Law School. Uh, that was before I was doing the blogging myself. I was doing it for them. Um, and I've aggregated all those blog posts, all my legal analysis on one web page, lawofselfdefense.com slash Zimmerman. It is hours and hours and hours and hours of video and dozens of blog posts. Uh, so it's not something that you're going to casually review. But if you want my detailed coverage, including my shocked face every time something ridiculous or crazy happened in that trial, 
That's the original material, folks. Lawofselfdefense.com slash Zimmerman. Z-I-M-M-E-R-M-A-N. And you can get it all there. There may That was, what, 12 years ago now? So there may be a couple of links in there that, that don't work anymore, but most of it should still be up and running. Have you been qualified as an expert as a video analyst in the past? Yes. At approximately how many times? Uh, in trials and, and hearings, probably more than 20 times. Okay. And let's go, before, two weeks ago, you got a new certification. So I want to talk about prior to that. Yeah. What, were you, what would you be qualified as an expert in? Uh, forensic video analysis. I, I've been doing it for about 30 years. So um, this organization has their higher echelon. There's it's an international organization that's the preeminent uh, video for forensic video. There's only about 54, 55 of us in the world that reach. Hey, somebody just asked for closed captioning in the comments. Uh, thank. First of all, thank you for reminding me. I, I do sometimes forget about that. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, it's not available. The button's not working on the on the stream. So uh, maybe the stream has to catch up or something. I'll, I'll keep my eyes on the button when it's not grayed out anymore. I'll hit it, or you can remind me to hit it uh, if you see that happen. But uh, I, at the moment, I, there's nothing I can do about it. And I think this is not quite. There we go. That's kind of the technical. And that's what you received two weeks ago. Yeah. And explain how that process worked. Uh, well, you have to have experience, first of all, in, in the field. And then you go through certification levels. There's a one, two, three, and four. Each one of those are certification level. And then once you go through the fourth level, then you have to um, show them a case that you worked on professionally that was at a high level of analysis. And when you said show them, who is them? The certification board, which are all a group of forensic video analysts, and they, uh, you give them one of the reports that you've used professionally, and then a few months later, you go before the board, and they drill you on it, and they take it apart and make you defend it, and then you have to, it's kind of like a dissertation, so to speak, you might have for a degree or something like that, and then they decide whether you're the caliber that they think that would qualify for a certification for fit forensic video analyst. And where was that? Where did that occur? Uh, San Diego. And how many people were in the process of attempting the certification? Uh, at that time, there were four of us. And how many? Hey, guys on YouTube, those of you watching on YouTube, the 400 or so watching YouTube, there's only about 125 of you who've hit the like button. We need to maintain at least 50% likes, folks, or, or there's no point continuing the YouTube stream. Uh, the, the like button is free. I'm sure most of you just forgot, but it's there. It's free. It doesn't cost a penny. Please hit that like thumbs up. That's probably the most important factor that YouTube uses for disseminating this content more broadly to recommending it to people. And also, if you could uh, hit that subscribe button, we're just at just over 46,000 subscribers. We'd love to hit 50,000. Uh, so if you could hit the subscribe button, that would also be much appreciated. We made it. Just me. Have you, over the years, presented on video and uh, forensic analysis uh, at different seminars around the country? Yes, I've taught classes and I've also presented a number of Just uh, it up, to the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, uh, the Society of Forensic Engineers and Scientists. So I, I've been doing that for 20 years or so. Judge, may I approach the witness? Okay. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification as defense. Okay. Tell me if you recognize that. Yes, that's my CV. And is that a current CV? CV? Yes. And does it include the certification from two weeks ago? Yes. Is it true and accurate copy of your CV? Yes, as far as I can tell. Judge, I would now move that into evidence. Any objection? That'll be received as next number 10. That's eight. My first witness. Yes. Every time I see a head of hair like that, I think wig. But it could be his head of hair. I mean, I don't have the hair I used to have for sure. Mr. 
Mr. Ward, you indicated that you have a law degree. Yes. Do you practice law? No. Do you ever practice law? No. So your profession has been for many years as a video analyst. Yes, and computer modeling. Our company does uh, for years did biomechanics, and so I'm also familiar with uh, biomechanics as well because we do the testing. Which biomechanics is analyzing injury events from an engineering standpoint. And what type of equipment do you use to do your models and your and your testing? All kinds for testing, uh, but you know, human dummies and we're doing crash testing. Uh, high speed video for doing analysis of events that happen quickly. Uh, so, we also do for my forensic video work, I use specialized software uh, that is very much a niche software, but it's used worldwide by the FBI and all those in different groups, law enforcement around the world to enhance video. Uh, so, also for computer modeling, I have my own laser scanner and go out and do laser scanning and computer modeling using software set for doing that work. And we heard some of what yesterday about a ferroscan. Could you give a brief description of what a ferroscan is? Yes. Uh, ferroscan is a laser scanner, uh, sometimes called LIDAR nowadays. And what it does is it is a device that spins around and shoots a laser in all directions, and the laser bounces back off of an object. And so when it bounces back off an object, the scanner can tell where that point in space that it hit was in XYZ coordinates. And so the result is one scan can produce like 40 million points. And those points are called a point cloud. And that point cloud is like a three-dimensional picture of the scene. So it's made up of millions of points, what we call a cloud. And you can look at it any, from any direction after you have a point cloud. And you can go inside it. It's, it's used in construction for buildings. It's used by law enforcement to document crime scenes. It's used uh, by accident reconstructionists to go to a scene where or scan a car so they can see what the damage is on the car. So it's a technology that's been in use for a number of years now, but it's becoming very popular just because of the capabilities it gives you afterwards to go back and take measurements, for example, if you want to know, you know how distance from here to there after you've already been to the scene, you know, you can go back and analyze it that way. And you said for one scan alone, it's 40 million points? It can be. It can be less than that or more than that, depending because on the scanner, you have a setting to say, how much density you want that particular point cloud. So a high density point cloud can take longer to scan. So, but what typically happens is you take multiple scans in an area and use software to register the scan, which means to pin it in together by how they overlap. The software looks at overlapping points and can stitch them together to one big scan so that you can look at a whole street or a whole neighborhood or whatever those scans. And obviously you have training and use of the Pharaoh scan. Yes. And a certification as well. Yes. And what you were contacted by my office in this particular case? Yes. And what were you asked to do? Uh, primarily was to look at the video that you had available and to see uh, what kind of analysis can be done to understand the video better. All right, let's, uh, what I'd like to do, and you're talking about the raw data, the, the video from Dos Gatos and from Spangled Bagels? Yes. Okay, so that was the first. So by the way, folks, uh, the last witness yesterday for the uh, defense was, um, uh, Charles Brian Moody, an accident reconstructionist who used this machine that they're talking about, the FARO, F-A-R-O, scanner, to scan the scene of this confrontation. Um, so I don't know if this guy did his own scan or if he's just going to testify about the results of the scan that were done uh, by the accident reconstructionist. But the, uh, all, all the accident reconstructionists talked about was how he did scan. He didn't draw any like fact conclusions that would be relevant to the legal questions in this case. So it may have been that they used Charles Moody to make the scan, and then they'll use this witness to talk about the substance of that scan. First thing that you looked at, correct? Yes. All right. And we'd like to play just a little bit of that. You know, I, I apologize yesterday for not advising. This is not, I'm going to try to do a better job today. This is not, nothing that's going to be, I think, upsetting. Just basically, I'm showing the video of the group in the street. And I'll, I will try to provide a warning. So apparently, the victim in this case, the victim of Louis Casado's uh, gunshots, uh, who died, of course, as a result, uh, the courtroom, the gallery is full of, he was apparently he was a pretty popular guy. So the, the courtroom is full of his family members and friends all wearing giant uh, justice for 
uh, Adam buttons on their clothes. This is the kind of thing that would almost certainly not be permissible in a trial where a jury is present. But of course, in this pretrial hearing, there is no jury. Uh, the judge is playing the role in this hearing, the normal role of the judge, the finder of law, but he's also playing the role of the finder of fact. The judge here is deciding uh, what facts he believes to have been proven or not proven, what evidence he finds credible, what testimony he finds credible, and uh, so forth. And so there's no jury to be influenced. So the judge is allowing for these buttons. Uh, here the question was, they were just going to show some video, and there's family members of the victim here. So if the videos were going to show the victim getting shot dead, uh, maybe the family wouldn't want to see that. But apparently the defense is saying that's not what they're about to show. Well, I don't know if I push yes or no on this. So it looks, I just want to watch uh, just a little bit of this if you can play it. Um, <coughs> Does this appear to be um, the raw data video that you received? Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. And you um, you also received raw data a video from Schmegel Bagels. Yes. Can you tell? Um, give us an idea of uh, you guys stop that for now of the quality of the videos and what the, what it meant to you. Okay. Uh, this particular video is HD. It's uh, 1080 p It means it has uh, 1920 pixels across by 1080 vertically, so it's a high definition video. Uh, the one from across the way at Schmegels was a very low quality video and it is at a distance. So ultimately for analyzing what happened in relation to the shooting, this particular video, this particular camera view, which I believe is channel nine, which is labeled as the front door, uh, is the best view of, of what happened for most of the time. And does channel nine have any audio? No. How about Schmegels Bagels camera? Yes. And as far as accuracy um, or, and or distortion, can you give us an idea of whether or not what we see here is actually in proportion to, to each other? Yes. So all uh, security cameras, or mostly security cameras, and other types of cameras too, like uh, body-worn cameras or action cameras like a GoPro, have what's called an ultra-wide-angle lens. This is a very wide-angle lens. And with a wide-angle lens, you get what's called barrel distortion from the lens, which if you look at that uh, edge, the upper edge of that doorway on the screen, you see it has a slight curvature to it. And if you look at the sidewalk on the opposite side, there's a curvature to it. That's the barrel distortion caused by the lens. So if you're going to do an analysis, uh, photogrammetric analysis, uh, then you have to first uh, take into account that lens distortion. And how do you do that? So you can use, in, in the case of what I, I did, you can do a basic uh, lens correction by, in forensic software by defining lines that are supposed to be straight that aren't straight and tell it the straightening. Or if you want to be more precise, you can use a program such as I use, which is called photo modeling, which you take a laser scan and so you have all these known points at the scene, like where your script is and where your line is, and you take enough of those points and you put it into the program and you tell it, this is the picture of those points. It can then calculate how light hit those points and bounced into the, through, came through the lens and hit the sensor. Kind of reverse engineer that and tell you where that camera was that took the video and the lens characteristics of the lens that took that video. And based on your initial review of the raw data from those guys and from Schmegels, did you recommend that we do additional testing at the site? Yes, if you wanted to know certain distance. Plus, I thought that having a laser scan of the scene is helpful in other ways, because if you wanted to do diagrams of the scene, or you wanted to know later how far something was from somewhere else, you have that information at your fingertips once you have the laser scan data. And what about being able to put time to the video? Can you explain that? Yes, so every video is a, a stream of pictures. Uh, if you know, like movie film is uh, 24 frames per second, and we have a, a psychological perception uh, uh, characteristic called persistence of vision, where if we see pictures flashed in front of our eyes fast enough, we see it as motion. Even though it's still just a bunch of still pictures, if we look at it fast enough, it looks like motion, which is hence how animation is done. Animators draw a bunch of pictures when they show it fast enough, it looks like the things are in motion. So that's what video is. It's really a bunch of still pictures that we call frames. And when we have like this video, for example, it is actually very good because it is 30 frames per second. And that's what we're normally used to seeing. Like television is 
seven frames per second nominally in the United States. And so we're used to seeing things at 30 frames per second. And so because if, if the video has a constant frame rate, and it doesn't always, sometimes it can vary, but there's a constant frame rate, it gives us a time base for how things happen because we can count the frames and know each frame is a third of a second. So, and we also have a clock, what's called a timestamp in this video, where we can verify that. So the timestamp gives us some idea of time because it's counting off seconds. But if we want to be more precise than that, then we look at the individual frames and see what's happening. So if we know it's been 10 frames, then it's a third of a second for something to happen. After you saw the raw video from both establishments, did you feel like you had the capability of synchronizing the two? Yes. And explain that. Well, if you have two videos and you can figure out what the frame rates are and nominalize them to one frame rate, one faster than the other, then they were both about 30 frames per second. So if you can find common things that are happening, in this case, a muzzle flash for a gun, or something in a person in motion when his foot steps on the ground, or something that you can see in both cameras, you can synchronize two views together. And when you have the synchronized view, that's helpful for analyzing events because now you can see it from two different directions at once. So you can put them on the screen side by side, and you can say, okay, let's look at from this angle and this angle simultaneously, which is a lot better than trying to fast forward through one video and see what happened and then go to the other one. You can see it simultaneously. So the fact that the one camera at Schmegels had audio, how does that interface? How, how are you able to include that in your analysis? Yes, the, the camera at Schmegels is actually not a very good quality video. So some players, uh, the audio won't synchronize properly with the, with the pictures. But the audio is clear, fairly clear, as far as the gunshots part. You can hear the, the, the gunshots. And so you can match that video, that audio to the muzzle flash that you see, or the one muzzle flash, for example, that you see in this video. And then you can take that sound and made it to the synchronized video or to just this particular video. And did you end up being in contact with a gentleman by the name of Brian Moody from Jacksonville? Yes. Okay. Can I approach the witness, Judge? You may. I'm going to show you Defense Exhibit 7. And tell me, uh, just look through that and tell me if you recognize it. So they just described as Brian Moody, uh, the. Um... His full name is Charles Brian Moody. I guess he goes by Brian Moody. He's the accident reconstructionist who ran the Faro device to do the scan of the street, this laser dot cloud uh, that they're talking about here. So Moody's scan is going to be testified to now uh, by uh, this Paris Ward, the forensic video analyst. Yes, these are pictures and diagrams that Mr. Moody did when he did the laser scan at the scene. And did we task him to do to get the raw data to do the Faro scan, Faro scan um, at the street, uh, then to provide you that data? Yes. Okay. And did you two converse throughout the process, even before the scan and after the scan? Yes, I sent him uh, information about which areas I wanted scans done, and he actually did that and more, and sent me back these photos and actually I think a few others where there were tape measures on the ground. So that I could verify in my own model, uh, for example, how long the distance is between two different points and make sure that it's accurate. And in your professional opinion, the data that you got from Mr. Moody, did you consider it accurate in a professional job? Yes. And did you use that information then to do some modeling? Yes. First witness. I'm going to show you what's been marked as uh, defense exhibit uh, for identification L. Tell me if you recognize it. Show through that. Yes. And can you describe what the, what those photos are? Uh, these are screen captures. They're individual frames of video from a video that I prepared. That is a uh, an enhanced video in terms of it is. Uh, cropped, enlarged, and then I added a timer uh, up in the corner that is a seconds timer that counts down to when the first shot is fired in the sequence. And is your, um, your analysis of this, does it provide um, testimony that would, and, and information that would not be obvious by watching the video itself? Yes, I've also added frame numbers as well so that any particular frame can be referenced in the record or identified. 
the timing is not something coming down to the first shot is something that you couldn't do on your own, but it's very helpful to analyzing what happened, especially for a person who's like a use of force person or a human factors person who's looking at things like matching times or uh, how things develop prior to uh, when the injury occurred. And is this a true and accurate copy of, of your work of, the, of, of blowing this up and um, putting the timestamp to it? Yes. All right, Judge, I would ask that this be moved into evidence. Are you good? I had seen it last night. So, uh, Mr. Ward, this is a series, a sequence of frames that takes us through uh, the event. Is that accurate? Yes, I prepared a video that has that timer on it, and then these are selected frames from that video. And what I'd like you to do is help me, because I want to be able to uh, warn the family uh, of the tenderness uh, of some of these um, uh, frames. So these will be single frames of the gunshots. So anybody who doesn't want to see that, just like to put that out there right now. It starts earlier than that, but there are going to be uh, still frames when each gunshot is fired. Alright, you guys go ahead and play the first frame. So let's I want to make sure we're using references to the timestamps. And can you see from there what the stamp is? Uh, yes, it is 60.1 seconds prior to the first gunshot. So it, it's actually um, stamped 5129? Yes. And what you're saying is that this um, frame right here, um, that it's 60 seconds, point 10, before the first gunshot? Yes. And at, at this point, can you see Mr. Casado in the frame? Yes. And at some point, does he then turn towards the wall? Uh, Mr. Pizzano? Oh, yes. This yes. is early when he was just talking to the gentleman in yellow and red, and that he eventually went to turn. Okay. So let's go ahead and move through these. Is this what it seems like he turns, and this would be how many seconds before the first gunshot? Uh, you can read it. It's 454 seconds before, 0.1 seconds. Okay, move forward. This is slide 5141. Yes, this is, is that the frame 12,412, and it's 47.9 seconds. Next slide. This disappeared when the Mr. Moya and Mr. Casado were facing each other. Yes. And that's at 5142. And how many seconds is this before the first shot? Uh, looks like 46.9. Next slide. This disappeared. It's the gentleman on the right with a hat has come off the wall and is pointing a finger. Yes, he's pointing a finger at Mr. Casado. He's come forward and it's 41 seconds before the first shot. Next slide. And this is a slide where uh, Mr. Casado seems to be gesturing towards the red shirt. Yes. And that's at 5151 at the slide. And this is how many seconds before the first shot? 37.4. Next slide. Next slide. <clears throat> this is 5206 when it seems like Mr. Moy and Mr. Casado are engaging in something. It looks like there's a conversation that leaned into each other and it's 22.87 seconds prior to the first shot. Next slide. 
Next slide. This appears to be a point where Mr. Moyer puts his hand on Mr. Casado. Could you tell us what the timestamp is? 12.73 seconds before. The timestamp is 52 uh, minutes, 16 seconds. So, but it's relevant to the first shot of, in reference to the first shot, it's 12.73. Next slide. Next slide. This is 5218. It, it seems that Mr. Casado is turning to his left. Yes, uh, uh, other gentleman, Mr. Moyer, is passing by on by Sutto's right arm and is turning. And this is 11.33 before the first shot? Yeah. Next slide. This is when Mr. Casado's hand starts to come up at 52.19. How many seconds before the first shot? This is 10 seconds before the first shot. He has both his hands on his hand. Next slide. This appears to be when Mr. Moyer was struck. The stamp is 52.20. How many seconds before the first shot? It's actually Mr. Casado that was. I'm sorry, right? My bad, sorry. Uh, by Mr. Moya, but this is at 9.23 seconds prior to the first shot. Next slide. Well, actually, can we, can we go back two slides? Mr. Moya, can you tell us from this frame at 52.19 how much time elapsed before Mr. Casado was hit in the face? From this, from the prior frame, by doing the math, or yes, okay. So this one is at nine. What was the prior one? So it, yeah, less than a second. Less than a second. Next slide. Next slide. This appears to be when Mr. Richard, Mr. Santiago, is swinging toward Mr. Casado. Yes. And we'll, and this is that time time stamp fifty two twenty. This is what? How many seconds before the first shot? So this is frame 13, 5, 94, and it is eight and a half seconds before the shot, first shot. And can you tell us how much time between the first blow to the face and the second blow to the face? Uh, about three quarters of a second. Next slide. This is 5221 with Mr. Casado leaning backwards. Yes. And how much? How many seconds before the first shot? 8.3. Next slide. Next slide. This is at 52.23, which is how many seconds? This seems to be there's uh, additional now physical contact from Mr. Amoya to Mr. Casado. Would you agree? Yes. Okay. Can you give us an idea of the time after being hit the second time by Mr. Santiago? How much time elapsed before this particular? Uh, brief sequence. Yeah. Three seconds or a couple seconds. Next slide. This is 5225. How many seconds before the first shot? So this is yeah, frame 13, 721. It is 4.27 seconds before the first shot. Next slide. Next slide. This is 5226. We see Mr. Moyer's right arm down to his right side. How many seconds before the first shot? 2.4. Next slide. Next slide. Now, this is so off camera at this point. Correct? Yes. You can't see the top of them, at least. Yes, Mr. Casado is occluded by the gentleman in the kind of white blue shirt, and we don't see either one of their heads. It's cut off. So it, it, it does seem like the man in the blue shirt starts to turn at about 52.28. Uh, by the time stamp, yes, or about 1.3 seconds before the first shot. And do you see the red shirt? Yes. Is, based on your analysis, is he returning? Do you see him returning towards the fray? I think you see it better on the, the whole video because you see the whole frame. This is cropped. But yes, he retreats to a position about 12 feet back from where he was, and then he moves forward again starts walking in that direction. Next slide. Next slide. This is 5229, and this is how many seconds before the first shot? This is the first shot. This is the first shot. And you can see the muscle flash. Uh, see. And Mr. Amoy's right hand is back 
to his right side. Yeah. Similar to what was in a previous slide that we saw a few frames ago. Is that accurate? Yes. So this is 5229. And next slide is shot one. This is shot two. How many seconds have gone by? Four tenths of a second. Next slide. This is shot three. How many seconds have gone by? Six tenths of a second. Does it appear that Mr. Amoy is still facing Mr. Posada? Yes, and I think one of the reasons this is helpful is if you correlate this with the medical examiner's report, because we have two shots at the front, one shot at the side, and two shots in the back. And so after this is when we start seeing rotation away. Next slide. This is the fourth shot? The fourth shot, and you can see uh, Mr. Amoya is turning away, so his left flank is in the general direction. Mr. Posada. So this is the best opportunity for the shot that enters Posada. Next slide. This is shot five. How many seconds have gone by so far between the first shot and shot five? 1.13. Next slide. This is shot six. How many seconds have gone by? 1.37. <clears throat> So presumably, uh, this is what bothers the prosecutor, right? Because at this point, the sixth shot is fired into Adam Omoya's back. Uh, this is the shot that almost certainly uh, pierced his heart, pierced his aorta, was the unavoidably mortal shot in the sequence fired. And it's fired at a moment, if all you look at is this uh, still shot, uh, when Adam Omoya has turned his back on Louis Casado and appears to be running away, moving away at speed. Of course, the counter argument by the defense is this all this is not happening over a series of minutes. It's happening over 1.6 seconds. Um, and their client, Louis Casado, the defendant's vision has been substantively impaired uh, by first the first blow that knocked off his glasses. He's traditionally had been diagnosed with 2200 vision, which is legally blind for driving purposes when it's uncorrected. Uh, and uh, and also, of course, his vision is likely so also impaired and is cognitive abilities impaired by the series of uh, rather vicious blows to the head that he suffered over the course of this encounter. And then shot seven. How many, how much time from the first shot to the last shot? 1.6 seconds. <clears throat> All right, I would like my approach to witness. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification as uh, states, I mean, defense exhibit M, and ask you if you recognize it. Yes. This was a flash drive that you showed me earlier. Yeah. And what is it a flash drive of? Uh, the video that I produced. It's an enhanced video? Yes. Okay. And you had a chance to look at it this morning to see? Yes. And it's what you produced for my request? Yes. And is it true and accurate copy and version of the events that occurred? Yes. Because at this time I would ask to move uh, M for identification of the evidence. Objection to the That would be received as. Sir, may I now publish the video? And this does have sensitive material. This is a video version. And so I want to make sure I disclose that. This also has audio, which is different than the, it's also audio. Uh, worth mentioning that Dan Hilbert and Pat Canan, the two uh, defense attorneys on this case, uh, Canan Law, the firm for which uh, they work or are partners, I, I don't know exactly, um, is very highly respected in this jurisdiction uh, for criminal and other kinds of legal work. Explain that a little bit. Um, you might have to listen to it a few times to see what we hear. Um, this is the audio that you were able to synchronize with the Schmegels, is that correct? Right? So the audio is from Schmegels camera, which is matched to this by way of the gunshots matching the muzzle flash. So you're seeing the video from Vascatos, uh, and you are uh, hearing the audio from across the way. So that's why you hear different pieces of the conversation, uh, not seeing your lot of crowd noise, but then you will hear the gunshots. What I'd like to do is play it up until the time of the first two hits and, um, 
and then to go back, Mr. Hobart, and play it again just to listen to it. So let's let's play through. And before we do, um, this exhibit is um, stamped at 5129. And again, this is basically the same as the frame shots, where this is 60.10 seconds to the first shot. Is yes. that correct? And also the frame numbers are below that. And what are they? So that's 12,046 is the first frame. So if you're referencing into the whole video that we received, then this is that number and the timestamp is burned into the picture. So the timestamp is from Roscados' uh, system. That's the 005129. <coughs> All right, could you go ahead and play? And Judge, I don't know how the sound is going to be on this, so I might just stop it and restart because it doesn't sound. Like it. Oh, Here, we're, we're going to actually take it through the gunfire. Okay. And and you've also now put the seconds to the first shot, and it's basically going to, going to stay, be the same thing to 1.6 seconds from first to last shot. Right? Right. And you will hear the gunshots, and you will hear when he's getting hit. Okay, go ahead. And just for everybody's knowledge, the shots will be louder. <laughs> So quick pause here. I, I, I thought I had seen another video that uh, he shot left-handed. This looked like he shot right-handed and uh, he had his hand in his pocket pretty early. Uh, I mean, soon after he started getting hit, uh, which would explain the very quick presentation of the pistol. You have a pistol in a pocket holster. You have your hand on the gun. It's not hard to have a quick presentation. I'm going to show you what's been marked as defense exhibit for identification N. Tell me if you recognize it. <laughs> Can you uh, explain what this uh, exhibit is? This is uh, frame 13, 849, which is when the first shot is fired, and then that's what the frame is on the first page. And then there is a corrected lens version and the computer model I developed with the mannequins in place in a computer model showing the distance that um, Mr. Posado was from Mr. Amoy at the time of the first shot. And are they true and accurate depictions of what happened there on the street that night? It is, this is the, what I created uh, and it is the 
correct information from the software I have based on the computer model that I took care of. As far as the ferro scan, how exact is the ferro scan? With this particular scanner, uh, the error rate for points, individual points, is about two millimeters. Okay. May I publish? Yeah. Oh, actually, I'd like to move it down. I'd like to see the other steps. Yes. Yes. So, uh, Mr. Ward, please uh, explain what you have created here. So, we're looking at two different frames and where uh, the. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just the same. Okay, yeah, let's go to the first one. Let's just let's identify this uh, first shot by the frame number at the bottom. Yes, 13849 in sequence of this video. And so what, is, what are you demonstrating here? So there's a red circle around, uh, this is the whole frame. We're, in the previous video, we were looking at a crop area. Right? So we're seeing the whole frame here. The red circle is around uh, Mr. Amoya and Mr. Casado at the time the first shot is fired. You can see the muzzle flash. Okay, next slide. And this says video frame 13849, correct with the lens distortion. Please explain that. So if you looked at the previous one, I was talking earlier about curved lines that you see. Now it's been corrected for that ultra-wide angle lens. And so you can see the lines on the road, uh, the first pathway in the middle of the road, that those are all straight now. So it's better to have the corrected image when you're trying to do a computer model to find out where people are in, in the frame. Next slide. This is says uh, security can be do replicated in computer model. Explain that. So what you're seeing is a composite here. You're seeing the actual video frame, which is the thing that looks kind of like a sideways hourglass there. Uh, and you are actually seeing the laser scan itself. So you can see it goes beyond the edges of uh, the frames so that you can see uh, how well it matches. This is the camera. This is a uh, camera created in the software with the image plane in front of it on the frame, you're looking through it and you see what it looks like. It shows that it's matching when it's in the right position. And once we do that, we can move mannequins around in our computer model and put them in places. And then once they match the places where we see people on the screen, then we can measure the distance between them. And you were able to do that? Yes. Next slide, please. This says computer model showing locations at first at time of first shot. Can you explain this slide? So these are the mannequins in the scene. So the, the scenery you're seeing here is actually a laser scan of the scene. And the two wire meshes that you see there are the two people representing Mr. Casado and Mr. Moya. Next slide. This says computer-generated image from different angles. Could you explain that? So once we have a computer model, we have these mannequins in place, we can look at it from a different perspective. So we can look at it from a different and the next view is going to be a top-down view, so we're looking at them vertically. Next slide. Over, overhead view of first shot locations. Could you explain this? Yes, this is just looking straight down on that last view. Next slide. This says locations determined through photogrammetry. That's how that correct pronunciation? Photogrammetry, yeah. yeah. So we're looking at two different frames. That I did. One was when they were talking early on, which is the frame 13200 on the right side. So they were standing there, and this shows that Mr. Casado retreated 10 feet 7 inches, or he was 10 feet 7 inches further up the sidewalk uh, from the point where he was talking to them and then was moved. And then at the time that the shot is fired, I have the 2 feet 3 inches between them. Those are two different kinds. Uh, folks, it's none of this manipulation of the video is tampering with evidence. It would be tampering with evidence if it was not done with the court's permission. There would have been a Daubert hearing already to ensure that this was scientifically valid approaches to video analysis. This is all done with the court's permission. Kind of things, uh, measurements because the 10 feet 7 inches is from center of mass to center of mass. That's how much he's physically moving. Uh, the other one is and all of this is defense work product. This is not Binger manipulating images. This is not the prosecution doing this. The defense paid for all of this. It's chest to chest because you can see their arms are closer to each other. 
and also uh, it's hard to judge exactly where center of mass is. That is the distance uh, between them at the time from chest to chest. And I'll also point out here, which would be helpful for anybody who's analyzing later on the video, if you see the major lines in the sidewalk, like where uh, the two are standing on the right, there's a line to the right of them across the sidewalk that are uh, seams in the concrete, and then there's another one closer to where they are there. Those are 10 feet apart. So if you look at the video and you want to see how far a person moves, you can kind of ballpark it. It's like you're watching a football game with lines on the field. So they're 10 feet apart. And the smaller ones, the smaller squares around the edge, those are four. So you can kind of just by looking at the video get some idea of distances based on knowing those numbers. Now this position here where they are two foot three inches apart, chest to chest, this is after Mr. Casado came off of the wall. Is that correct? Yes. I'm going to show you, Mr. Ward, what's been marked as defense exhibit for identification. Oh, tell me if you recognize it. So a question had come up a few days ago uh, about whether when the when the state was done in this hearing, the state had called its witnesses, its primary witnesses, uh, and they had a very weak case, really. Many of the state's witnesses that we heard on cross-examination, the state witness testimony was very, very favorable to the defense. So it, it would seem, I think, to a reasonable person that perhaps the state had failed to meet its burden to disprove self-defense by clear and convincing evidence when they rested, basically, when they were done. Um, so in a trial process, that would be an opportunity for uh, the defense to ask for effectively a directed verdict. Uh, and say, uh, Your Honor, the state hasn't met its burden. So obviously this is the high point of their narrative of guilt. They haven't met their burden. You should dismiss the charges against my client. Uh, but it's different in a hearing. In a hearing, the judge has to uh, make a call on a motion by one side. Uh, the motion here is for a motion for immunity made by the defense, right? In a trial, you're being charged by the state. Uh, in the hearing, it's a motion made by the defense, so they have to hear the defense side of the, the judge has to hear the defense side of uh, of the argument. So there wouldn't be a dismissal halfway through like there could theoretically be in a trial. Yes, these are frames from the whole video. It has my frame numbers that I've added, but it's not the enhanced one or the crop one. Are really they a true and accurate representation of the video that you were provided? Yes. The fact that this has been moved into evidence? That's exactly. Can you explain the difference? Uh, this is a focus on Mr. Santiago, a different view than one other. Oh, okay. Can we publish to the judge? This, could you explain this first slide? Is, do we have a number on the left side here? Yes, so sorry. <laughs> this appears to be uh, 5221. Is that correct, Mr. Ward? So that is the timestamp, the frame number is 13621. And this is after Mr. Uh, Santiago has hit Mr. Casado? Yes. Okay, next frame. So, what does Mr. Santiago do? He seems to retreat. Is that what this shows on 13653? Yes, you can see on the, where his feet are on the sidewalk lines. If you go back to the previous one, where you see he's up by that one seam uh, of the smaller sections that are on the side. And so he's at one seam there. And so if you go to the next one, you can see that if you keep in mind those are four feet, uh, he's retreated more than four feet from where his prior position is. Next slide. This is 13681. Having retreated about halfway between the two 10 foot seams? Yes. Next slide. This is 137725, indicating a further retreat. 
Yes. This is 13767. Seems to be some, doing something with his hands. Yes, he's looking around and laughing and standing right above that scene and the sidewalk there. So that, that's a smaller thing. Looking actually the opposite direction. Yes. Appears to be a smile on his face. Yeah. Next frame. 13781. Starts to make a move back towards Mr. Casado. He has moved a little bit in that direction. Next frame. 13819. Further towards. Yes. So keeping in mind that that other line was about four feet back, just moved a little more than four feet in that direction. And here at 13819. Mr. Britton in the blue shirt has also turned his frame towards Mr. Casado. Is that correct? Yes. Next frame. 13849. Now, these are one frame at a time. It seems like, and you tell me, has the speed of Mr. Santiago back towards Mr. Casado increased or decreased? I think he's moving in that direction. So this, this frame appears to be the one where the first shot is fired by Casado. Uh, and red shirt, Santiago, street name Flex, appears to now be advancing once more towards San Diego. Flex has already struck, uh, I mean, uh, advancing towards Casado, the defendant. Uh, Flex has already struck Casado once viciously hard. Uh, and now Mr. Blue Shirt, who appears like a sizable dude, is also turning and who is a member of Mr. Uh, Adam Amiado, uh, Am Amayo, uh, the victim here, the, the person throwing the, uh, the blows here who's about to get shot. Uh, Mr. Blue Shirt appears also to be advancing on Mr. Casado. So we have a, that disparity of numbers um, scenario I talked about earlier, which would aggravate, could aggravate uh, even a mere barehanded attack into something that's readily capable of causing death or serious bodily injury. And therefore, it would qualify as a deadly force attack against which deadly defensive force would be appropriate. Direction, uh, I think from the video, you'll be able to see it. Can you give us an idea, just by looking at the scenes and the concrete, how close Mr. Santiago has, has now returned towards Mr. Casado? Yes, you can't really see his feet, but you can see he's kind of standing over one of those scenes. So he's moved approximately 12 feet in the three of those four perspectives. So he's moved 12 feet, and now how far away from Casado? Uh, it, it's hard to tell. It's about, uh, and I didn't measure that. Okay, that's it. Okay. All right, that's it for direct with the video experts. The one that had the shots labeled. Draw your attention on this right here. Can we go back up to the 
previous slide? You cannot see that here. Right, right? That's right. Okay. This right here is blood coming from a sermoid. Yes. And that's a sick shot. Yes. But I would point out it's not necessarily related to the sick shot because time doesn't happen instantaneously. It's not going to be blood on the ground the second that the sick shot fired. And we don't know the source of the blood. So if it's hard, and I don't, that's not my expertise. So I'm not going down that, but it could be, you know, if he had a lung puncture, he could be shooting it out of his mouth or something like that. So I don't know what the source. Also, this this video expert doesn't know that that's blood. <laughs> that's that's not appropriate testimony. This is the frame where you see it on the ground. Go to the, go to the previous slide. So the previous slide was 1.13 seconds since the first shot. Go to the next slide. And then this slide was blood appears at 1.37 seconds. We're talking two tenths of a second, right? Yeah. So it's almost instantaneous. It instantaneously appears there, correct? Yes. And that in that frame. Mr. Moya is completely turned in the opposite direction and appears to be in a full sprint in the opposite direction, correct? That's correct. Next slide. And this right here is frame number 13897. And this is shot number seven, correct? Yes, that's the last shot. And it's 1.6 seconds after the first shot. Uh, did you do any measurements? I know you're asked a lot about measurements. Did you do any measurements um, with these from shot number four to shot number seven? Um, how far away Mr. Moya was from Mr. Posada in those frames? I did not. You weren't asked to do that? No. All right, so this is obviously the uh, what the state thinks is the key issue in this case, that the arguably the killing shots, the one where the blood appears, were fired when the victim, Amoya, had his back turned to Louis Casado. And Louis Casado, from the state's perspective, I presume they're going to argue that Louis Casado basically executed him as he was trying to run away. Can we go to the slide that um, that was concentrated on Mr. Santiago? Not to get to that. Can we go to the last one? I think it's frame number one, two, three, four, nine. So this is uh, what the defendant said this is. I'll give you a lesson. The defendant said 11. And this is frame 13849. As I understand, this was essentially the closest that Mr. Santiago, uh, there was questions about after he hit him, he retreated, and then there were some questions about him getting closer after that, correct? Yes. And, and this frame here is the closest that he got, correct? He, interestingly, keeps walking that direction after the shots are fired. So he, but at that point, Mr. Sato is also backing up a little bit. So they're they're both moving. So and you know reaction times and stuff, that's for somebody else to talk about. But you can see that um, Mr. Santiago continues walking further that direction even after the shots start to come. And I know we're keeping still frames here. The video will probably be the best evidence of this. But Mr. Santiago is not running in his direction, right? No. He's moving maybe perhaps slowly in his direction, but he's not he's not moving in a particular way that you can really say that he's moving aggressively or with intent or anything like that, right? I'm not going to assign intent. I think if you watch the video in motion, um, people, when they watch things, are attuned to uh, the way people walk or how their attitude, or you know, even the fact that he's grabbing his crotch, what, I don't know what that means. I mean, I don't know what his intent is. Right. But you can probably, based on watching it, develop your own kind of instinct based on your own common knowledge of people. Right. Uh, were you asked to measure the distance between how close Mr. Santiago got to Mr. Casado? Did you measure that? The only measurements that I did with the computer model were the ones that I did early on in the case, which were those two that we showed. What I've talked about today is based on looking at those marks on the paper. Right. And those are for estimates, right? Yes, those are estimates. I mean, they're educated estimates, but they're estimates on the right. Yes. And I think, you, what did you say that this, this was? Uh, how, how close? He was at this point he moved eight feet forward because we're looking at those smaller slabs on the side, yeah, right there. Right. And those are those lines across, those are 18 inches one way and four feet the other. I, I think you, in response to Mr. Finan's question, you said you couldn't really tell how close, right? Because I guess something about the picture made it difficult to be able to look and tell. 
Yes, in this point, even if we did try to do the analysis, it's hard to see Mr. Casado because he's blocked by the gentleman in the blue shirt and khakis there. So we don't see where his feet is. Maybe that's a little tip of his foot sticking out there, but it's hard to know exactly where he's standing on the plane. And that's that's why you did that you had the same issue with respect to Mr. Amoya. And that's why you had somebody go there and do the Sarah scan and create the model as it relates to Mr. Amoya and Mr. Casado, correct? Yeah. But you weren't asked to do that with regard to Mr. Santiago and Mr. Amoya, correct? Yes, sir. Even though you were asked questions about Mr. Santiago, there's reasons for those questions, but you were not asked to actually measure that distance, correct? That's right. Even though you had you actually did have the ability to do that. It would require determining a frame that, of interest and then uh, converting that frame using the software to do that and then doing the extra work. <laughs> but you had you did have that information at your disposal and could do that, but we're not it asked could, to do that. It could do that. That's further. So, folks, uh, I see a lot of questions in the comments about what firearm was used here. I, I don't have any information on the firearm. Uh, somebody suggested it could be a Glock, uh, a Glock uh, uh, 43. A Glock 43 is a, a nine millimeter pistol, holds six in the magazine, one in the chamber for seven rounds total. Uh, it's small enough to be carried in a pocket. It's a it's a good pistol for personal protection. Uh, personally, I would probably get the Glock 43X that holds ten rounds, uh, but I believe 10 round magazine, if I remember correctly. Uh, I think it's 10 plus one. Yeah, 10 plus one. Uh, but, uh, you know, nothing wrong with the Glock uh, 43. And uh, that would account for seven shots fired. He basically emptied the gun in the course of uh, shooting a Mayo. But I don't know for a fact what the gun is. I haven't seen any record of it and haven't been able to find any. <clears throat> You were asked about, uh, suggested, uh, that Mr. Mr. Johnson suggested that Mr. Santiago was walking back. And you indicated that the video would be the best evidence of that. Can we pull up that video to determine whether or not he was increased his speed? For the record, we are looking at Exhibit 2, and we are at the point, the frame is 5149, watch the video, and we're going to be paying attention to Mr. Santiago. Defense wants to show the speed of Santiago now. Bam! Man, that's a hit. Up there. Sir, did it, did it appear to you that he was increasing his speed back toward Mr. Casado? Watching it, yes. Now, can we, can you, is it possible to give an idea after the first shot how, how much further or how much time elapsed that Mr. Santiago actually proceeded? I think if you go back to the frames, uh, you can see where that other video, he has the timer, you can see when he reaches the point where he's farthest forward, you can see what the time is relative to that time. So I didn't independently get that. Because it, it takes a while to react to the, the shot before he figures out that it, that their thing. There's no objective, so if you want to use that person's mistake. That's all. Okay. Please, you're on. All right, is with the issues. Yes. All right, sir, thank you very much. Pretty good. All right, that's it. All right, that's it for Paris Ward, the forensic video analyst. Next up is Nicholas, N I C K O L A S, Nicholas Ray. I don't know what Nicholas's deal is, uh, but uh, we'll find out in a moment. I'll fast forward through this break and we'll find out what Nicholas Ray has to share with the courts. Uh, before I do that, let me uh, catch up on questions. Let's see. Like, let me do this. I'll uh, I'll get up to Nicholas Ray, so we're ready to go. Oh, there he is. Okay. Uh, let's see.
uh, from Law of Self-Defense member Kyle, who did not have to pay a super chat for his question because he's a Law of Self-Defense member. Is there any indication what his actual legal fees were? With this defense and these excellent experts, I'd really be curious. Yeah, I smell uh, Canaan Law is a very well-respected law practice. That they won't come cheap. Uh, Roy Bedard, the use of force expert we'll hear from later, doesn't come cheap. Uh, I'm not familiar with the other experts, but there's five other experts. And generally speaking, experts don't come cheap. So uh, it's, it seems likely to me that a lot of money was spent on this defense. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's better if you have the resources. Um, I don't know if uh, we're going to have a defense counsel speaking to us uh, on Friday, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern time uh, uh, as live guests on our live stream on Friday afternoon. So maybe they'll be comfortable talking about that. I don't know. We'll have to see what they have to say. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Law of Self-Defense member Donnie says, uh, Andrew, I've seen people convicted of murder on the state's theory that the person who had that the person who had been drinking could not have a reasonable belief and that a reasonable man in the same circumstances who had been drinking could not have had a reasonable belief. And anytime, I'm not ex exactly sure what your question is, Donnie, but um, you don't lose your privilege of self-defense even if you're drunk, three sheets to the wind. You have all the rights of self-defense you normally have. But you have to be making the same good decisions you would be making if you were sober. If you're making bad decisions because you're drunk, there's no special drunk person's self-defense. So if you're if because you're intoxicated, you're making unreasonable decisions, voluntary intoxication is not a legal defense to a criminal charge, uh, except in very unusual circumstances. Uh, so you're just you know, they're going to hold you to the same standard as if you were sober. If you if you were drunk but made sound decisions anyway, that's still lawful self-defense. But you do open up the prosecution to be able to argue to the jury, hey, we all know drunk people make unreasonable decisions, right? We've all been drunk. We've seen people drunk. And therefore, you should infer that this defendant, because he'd been drinking, was making unreasonable decisions. Yeah, my understanding, and I don't work for CCW Safe, and I don't speak for CCW Safe. Um, uh, you know, you might imagine that any of these companies they don't want to be paying for self defense claims for people who are three sheets to the wind, right? They're not looking to defend people who are getting into drunken gunfights. Uh, but my understanding of the CCW Safe position, and please, you have to speak to them for their exact position. I don't work for them. I don't represent them. I just think they're a good organization. I think if you're home having a glass of wine after work or with dinner and there's a home invasion and you shoot that guy breaking into your house, that they'll still defend you. Um, if, if you're out at a bar getting your brains blown out on, uh, on, with shots, uh, you know, then, then they may then have a reasonable re reluctance to want to pay. But you'll have to ask them about it. Uh, let me see if there's any super chats. Not yet. All right. So let's get back to the next witness. This will be Nicholas Ray. We'll find out what he's all about now. Nicholas Ray. Very important. All right, sir. Please stand and raise your right hand. You swear a firm testimony you're about to give. We'll be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you guys. All right. Have a seat in the witness stand. I'm just trying to speak into that mic. Counselor, your witness. Yes, sir. Good morning. Please state your name for the record. Nicholas Ray. And what county do you live in? Well, and have you lived in there since 2021? Yes. Now, I'm going to take you immediately to why you're here to testify today. Before um, we do that, can you just have to spell his name for the record, please? Please spell your name. N-I-C-K-O-L-A-S. Last name Ray, R-A-Y. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, now, do you recall being in downtown St. Augustine on the night of May 28th, leading through the morning of May 29th when the incident happened? Yes. And who were you out with that night? Uh, girlfriend and a couple of her friends. And where did you guys go that night? We started at No Man's. Okay. Did you kind of bounce around to a couple bars? We, yes, we, we moved on from there. Okay. And did you did you have any alcohol that night? I did. Remember how much? I believe three beers. And eventually, did your group uh, wind up near the Dos Gatos bar? Yes. And were you guys able to go inside the Dos Gatos bar? No, we were in close. And so what did you guys do? We stood outside. Okay. And remember about approximately where you stood in relation to the entrance to Dos Gatos? Yes, I stood on 
I'm going to show you some images that are already in the evidence as Defense Exhibit 3. Uh, and this the reference is frame 5225. And do you see the entrance to those top of this car in here? Yes. And where is that? Just describe it. Uh, it's right on the right. Is it that iron sort of black gate looking thing? Correct. And where are you seeing it? Or describe what you're wearing. Blue question. jeans, black shirt, black shoes. Okay. And at this time, in this specific frame, are you looking down the sidewalk towards where the incident occurred? Yes. And again, are you looking in that same direction? Yes. And is that uh, the person in the black suit that's kind of backing up towards you? On the bottom there? What is that? Do you see the person in the black suit yes. that's backing up to you? And this is frame 5229. And once again, on. Not the light is that. That's okay. Those two frames are good. So that gives us a good idea of where you were standing when the shooting occurred, right? Yes. All right. Now, when did you first become aware that something bad was happening? Uh, I heard a commotion on me. And at that point in time, what direction were you facing? Were you facing up the street towards Cordova? Were you facing in the direction of the commotion? More towards uh, the middle, looking towards Scarlet. I was having a conversation. And then I am going to pull up now on Defense Exhibit 2. This is going to be the video from Schmegel's Bagels. This does include shooting. Uh, this potentially will include shooting, yes. Pause this right here. Yes. Can we start yes. folks? Yes. Really cool. <laughs> So the videos include shooting potentially, so they're going to uh, give the uh, family of the victim here, Adam Amoya, an opportunity to leave the courtroom so they don't have to watch their loved one getting uh, shot and killed on video. All right, just to sort of orient this one more time. So you're standing up against the wall, and I'm going to move my mouse over here. Is this you right here in the beginning at all? Correct. And eventually, you're going to filter to the wall. <coughs> right here. Is this you right here? Yes. What time is this? This is time 1 49 49 on Schmeckel's Bagel's video. And then uh, at this point, are you aware of this group at all? It's sitting down the street towards the windows. Any, had you seen them when you left or when you were standing around before the promotion happened? Yes, there were, there were multiple people on the street, so I didn't notice multiple, multiple groups there. And did you recognize anybody over here? I did not. Did you know Mr. Adam Moya prior to this incident? I did not. Did you know Mr. Louis Casado prior to this incident? I did not. Uh, so you hear the commotion. Uh, what's the next thing that you remember? Um, breaking from the conversation to turn and look at what might be causing the commotion. So playing the video now. So we just saw the two strikes, and then we see your head turn right there. Is that accurate? Is that accurate? That's correct. Okay. And that's from minute 50.04, right? And so is that the commotion that gets your attention and turns your head? Yes. Okay. And at this point forward, are your eyes consistently locked on uh, the attack that's happening here? Yes. What do you recall seeing from this point forward? Another uh, Mr. Casado backing towards my direction. Uh, both Moya and Mr. Casado backing this way. Uh, multiple jabs are occurring and being thrown um, as they're coming our direction. Do you see any of those strikes hit Mr. Casado in his head or face area? Yes. And what's Mr. Casado doing as he's being struck by Mr. Moya? Uh, he had it. I remember he had his head up and he was just backing. He continuously backing towards our direction. Okay. And as he got closer to your direction at any point in time, uh, did you see him go towards the wall? Yes. Tell the court what you saw as he was heading towards the wall. Yes, he, there were multiple uh, strikes thrown. Um, as the final um, strike was thrown, it, it made him stumble backwards. Um, it, was, it was quite a blow because I noticed his head get knocked back as it, and I could tell he was dazed. And at that point, my mom was kind of telling me like, okay, I need to kind of like step in and do something here, but obviously, my mind versus what my body was talking about. 
here. And this all happened very quickly, right? So when you see his head go back and he stumbles, where does he go back and stumble to? And when you say stumbles, did it appear to you like he had his feet with him or that he was potentially falling off of his feet like he could go to the ground? That he was falling. That's when in my brain at that time I was trying to think, okay, this, you know, someone needs to step forward and intervene. Um, that would probably kind of like turn into, you know, a double into something like, you know, like a turn serious. Um, obviously, that was. So the blows were serious enough to cause his head to go back. Could you see anything with his eyes? Like I said, it looked at, like in the eyes, kind of like a dazed. Um, so if you were to get punched, I'm not sure of that. Did you see whether his eyes had rolled back into his head in that fashion? Kind of like a boxing bit, just that amount of force. When he went backwards, he would stumble. Uh, I was doing that, going that direction. Okay. And so he, he gets knocked hard enough to his head go back. So this is an impartial third-party witness, not associated with any of the people involved in this fight. And this is his testimony. The state knows this is the testimony that is going to be presented when they bring Casado to trial. <laughs> But it's those shots to the back that the uh, the state just can't let go. Back, he's dazed, he hits the wall, what happens next? As he's coming up from the wall area, trying to catch his balance, uh, Mr. Moya was coming back from, from that forward movement into uh, a more stand-up position. At the same time, while they were both coming into a more balanced position, um, within the blink of an eye, a gun was pulled. And then did the shooting happen? At the time when the shooting happened, was Amoya running away when it first started? When the first shots, uh, they were both standing, um, looking very much you know, straight at each other. Okay. So I'm going to play it through into the wall. Or not. And those last two or three blows that we saw, were those the significant strikes to Mr. Casado's head that caused his head to go back and caused him to stumble into the wall? Yes. Now, let's, we have a separate angle of it as well. At this point in time, I'm now on Defense Exhibit 2, Channel 9, the enhanced version. So actually, this would be um, Defense Exhibit 10, I believe. Mr. Ward's enhanced version of the shot clock line. Okay, let me back up just a little bit. In this video, are these, and I'm pointing to the upper right hand corner of frame one, three, four, five, one. I see a pair of jeans and black shoes. Is that your body? Yes. Okay. And then you're close to this seam on the ground, correct? Correct. Okay. And Judge, just for reference, point that seam as you recall from Mr. Ward's testimony. So, all right. So, pursuant to your testimony in the last video, that caused you to turn. Is that right? That is correct. Playing it through again. Again, uh, those last couple of blows that you saw, those are the blows that you saw connect with Luis Casado's head, causing his head to fall back and for him to fall into the wall. That is correct. What did you do after the shooting occurred? Um, I tried to, you know, the first couple of shots to register what was happening. Um, that's when I kind of turned and I had the two people in front of me, kind of, you know, kind of like, like run. Kind of took all took off. Uh, I, as soon as I got closer to the end, I started. I immediately pulled out my phone and I called 911. Okay. And at that point in time, did you wait around for law enforcement officers to get them a statement? That is correct. And you gave them a statement. That is correct. Judge, that's all I have to answer. Cross examination. Is with the experience? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you very much for your work. Yes, sir. No cross. Right Judge, we call Officer Nick Argitis. Corporal Nicholas Argitis. Two more, sir. Please right hand. You swear from the testimony you're about to give me the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He probably took the report, the statement from the last witness. Can you the record and spell it for us? Nicholas Arbitus, N-I-C-H-L-L-A-S. Last name is A-R-G-I-T-I-S. And sir, what do you do for a living? I work for the San Jose Police Department. 
Full Volume Control. How long have you been with the San Augustine Police Department? So in July of 2009. And were you working on the evening of May 28th leading through the morning of May 29th, 2021? Yes, sir. And what were your duties that morning or night and morning? <clears throat> I was assigned to patrol working with them. And at some point in time, did you become aware of an incident that occurred on High Polo Street? Yes, sir. And did you respond to High Polo Street? Yes, sir. What was the first thing that you did when you arrived? Uh, we responded from one South Castillo, which is the four parking lot. Um, I parked my patrol car on Cordova Street at the intersection near Carrera. Um, I deployed my department chief rifle, uh, ran towards uh, off the corner of my tunnel, Cordova Street. Uh, once I got to the corner over there, Officer Barrera came up next to me. Uh, we began clearing the scene from there. Um, as I was walking up, uh, Officer Barrera went in front of me a little bit. A uh, gentleman pointed in my direction and said, that's the guy. Um, pointing to Mr. Casada, who at the time Officer Yarborough was securing. Um, once I saw that he was being secured uh, without any trouble, uh, I moved on down the road because I saw a few gentlemen um, emotional, yelling and screaming. Uh, they were wearing red shirt and jeans and a yellow shirt and black shorts. If I may real quick. Yes, sir. So we already have an exhibit evidence. It's defense exhibit one. And we have the identity of some of these individuals. That's what I'm wearing. You go to court to that. Uh, is the person in the red on defense exhibit one and the person on yellow that you have contact with? Yes, sir. Okay. For the record, they've been previously identified as Mr. Santiago and Mr. Weir's guy. Did you know either of those two individuals prior to this incident? Personally, no, sir. By the way, for those of you uh, who um, I understand the volume from the court is not well synced with my volume. There's nothing I can do about that, folks. I've made all the adjustments I can. But for Law of Self-Defense members, uh, when we're done with the show, every show, every live stream that we do, uh, we do a little bit of post-production work, and we put a playback of the video on the blog for our, our Law of Self-Defense members. And in that playback, we have an opportunity to normalize the volume. So if the volume is so bad, you just can't take it, and you're a Law of Self-Defense member, you might consider looking at the blog version of this show that goes up each evening, um, because there the volume between myself and the court will be uh, have been normalized in post-production. So just something to keep in mind. All right, so you already sort of mentioned that they were emotional. Uh, what were they doing? Um, it appeared that uh, the gentleman in the yellow shirt was uh, holding back the gentleman in the red shirt. Uh, the gentleman in the red shirt was screaming, he killed my brother, bro, um, and was having to be held back by the gentleman in the yellow. Uh, I kind of went up just to kind of calm the situation down. Um, I put my hand up initially. Um, I didn't have to use any kind of force or anything to hold them back. Um, and then I began telling them to stay here, stay here. Um, and then just to clear the scene, I asked them to go through the coach parking lot just down follow the street way there. Uh, when you approach them, I think you already mentioned that you had your agency issue rifle on you. Yes, sir. Did you pull the firearm and point it at them at any point in time? Uh, initially, when I turned the corner, it pointed in the direction at them. But once I, you know, when I was walking up to them, my rifle was at what we call the low ready, pointed at them. And let's reference for the judge on that. When you turned the corner, you were turning the corner. Cordova, I follow. Cordova, making a left. I right. follow, yes, sir. And so when you say point in that direction, they still would have been down the road, yes, sir. Quite a bit, correct? Yes, sir. And so as you sit here today, did you directly point your rifle at anyone specifically? No, sir. Okay. Uh, now, did you have your agency issued body camera footage rolling at the time when you arrived on scene? Yes, sir. And from there, approach? Yeah. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification as defense exhibit P. And do you recognize this? Yes, sir. And is that a thumb drive with a clip from your body cam footage? Yes, sir. And have you reviewed that? Yes, sir. Is that a fair and accurate copy of the clip of that portion of the body cam footage that I showed you? Yes, sir. Is that a new recent evidence? Okay. You shall be received as defense exhibit 13. You get permission to hold it. The very end of it may show uh, Mr. Hoy's body, but that's it. It's going to be purely just uh, Mr. Weir's body. So uh, much of the questioning has been done by attorney, defense attorney uh, Pat Canan. This is defense attorney Dan Hilbert. You can tell the difference between the two because Dan Hilbert has a uh, rather uh, prominent beard, facial hair.
I'm just to be clear, Officer Argos, did you clearly tell them to stay on scene? Yes, sir. And to your knowledge, did they stay on scene? No, sir. That's all I have. All right. I'm up here. That's all I have. Cross. There you are. All right. Thanks for the speech. Yeah. Yes, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, all right, so red shirt and yellow shirt both <laughs> both fled despite being told to stay on scene. Oh, Santiago's in federal custody. <laughs> That's Mr. Red Shirt. That's why he fled. He had paper out. That's not that, right? That's you can, I guess. Judge, we've, we've done the best we could. Uh, Sergeant Barr over the jail has been coordinating with us. He's the point of contact at Wilmington Correctional Facility. Uh, so I have actually set it up to post, so I'll have it ready to go. He has the email traffic to convey that to Lowman. Uh, we've tested it in courtroom. We know our end will work, and that's about as far as we can go. Can we start fire and start 15 minutes early? So then we can come back in uh, 10 minutes till 1, so that we can just get through the traffic. We'll do it for this part. And I'll, I'll plan to be back here. I'll be back here no matter what. We'll start sooner we can, but we plan on having this testimony at 1 o'clock, to be honest with you. I would like to address the 1 o'clock testimony uh, before we break, Your Honor. Um, we we um, we were not going to call Mr. Santiago on his defense and insisted that they will call him. Of course, it's their right to call who they want as long as that's relevant. But one of the concerns that I have, and I think that's been somewhat illustrated here with, with the story of the last witness, is Your Honor knows um, it's not appropriate to call a witness solely for the purpose of impeachment. If there is a specific substance of evidence that a party believes that that witness may offer um, the position that they're taking in the course of a trial or hearing, that's one thing. But the only reason that they're calling that witness is to impeach them, and that's not appropriate in the case law on that. And it is my belief that Mr. Santiago is not being called for any specific substance purpose that benefits the defense um, substantively with direct testimony, but rather he's going to be put on the stand simply to impeach him. Um, for example, Your Honor, um, his criminal convictions. Now, they're not they're not particularly relevant in this particular case. They would only be relevant in two different ways. Number one is if Mr. Um, Mr. Rosado had some knowledge of him uh, in his in, in violent past. It's been established in this particular case that they didn't none of them knew each other. It might be it might be relevant if there was evidence of a reputation for violence. But as we've seen during this hearing, there's been no such evidence to indicate that Mr. Moya has a reputation for violence. And so Mr. Santiago or anyone else, Mr. Moya, anyone else is a part of that group, their past would not be relevant. Uh, but I have this feeling that he's going to be called to testify so they can impeach him with prior convictions and, and other things, Your Honor. And that's the concern I have. And so I want to address that now versus wait until kind of the last minute. Um, but I wanted to do that before the break because I do have some concerns that that's kind of what we're looking at. Uh, you know, quite the opposite. I mean, the state has called uh, Mr. Moore uh, and Mr. Britton and uh, Mr. Barnes, because why? Because they were right there and saw the whole thing and could talk about who said what, could talk about who was under the influence. And so it's the state's decision not to call Weirs and Santiago, but they're critical witnesses to what happened. And so I have lots of questions for him to answer, um, and it's not based on impeachment. I mean, it's, he's a, obviously a major witness to this event and actually participated in it. And actually, in part, he's responsible for the shooting. So I think it's definitely fair game for us to be able to ask him questions. I will allow the defense to call Mr. Santiago. Obviously, if it pertains to any testimony about uh, impeachment matters, uh, that would not be appropriate unless the, the door is open to those matters uh, as to reputations, prior acts, and prior uh, convictions. Uh, that would be more if the state wanted to impeach him and they bring those things out, unless it becomes uh, as relevant or necessary during the direct examination. Circumstances where that might happen. Uh, I don't know at this point whether or not that would be open to the defense as they are calling him as their witness. Yeah, so it's a little complicated here. So the state could have called Santiago, red shirt, flex, right? They could have called them as a witness. But if the state called them as a witness, then the defense would have had the privilege to impeach him impeach the credibility of his testimony, talk about his prior convictions, some of which I would appear are for acts of violence. And so the state made the strategic decision not to call Santiago. They didn't believe he would be helpful to their case. He would be harmful to their case, probably. And they didn't want the impeachment door to be opened. 
So the defense has called Santiago, but because he's a defense witness, because the defense called them, they can't impeach their own witness. Does that make sense? You can't call someone to make statements and then just say you're lying about those statements. You can impeach the other side's witnesses, but not your own witness. And just to be clear, I wasn't asking for him to be excluded as a witness, but I did have concerns about his purpose and what he did call himself. Um, and I think you addressed my concerns, Judge, and we'll address what issues are otherwise. I don't think Santiago actually testifies because he's not listed as a witness in the court order granting immunity. So uh, maybe there's other discussion on this. Uh, what we have today is also about the rest of the hearing. So we have uh, this afternoon, we'll be having a full day and we may yes, anticipate sir. calling the majority of your witnesses with the exception of perhaps one for the political witness. That's correct. So we have one remaining witness for tomorrow. And then the state would have rebuttal witnesses tomorrow with respect to three rebuttal witnesses for the prosecutor. And that would be the arbitrary, and then we also have that for the uh, movie instruction testimony. Yeah, the music will take care of it. All right, and then uh, noted there was some discussion about closing arguments and then proposed written order. So we'll talk about that as well. As far as closings, I imagine this is not going to be a super long closing argument. I've seen all the evidence. I don't think we're going to do all that to sort of make points, make your legal arguments. Uh, we can provide any case law and then uh, there's some discussion about whether or not to submit proposed written orders. If that were the case, and if we were requested to do that, how long would, would you be requesting? Submit those proposed written orders. And, and I'll speak first um, because I've had some conversation with you know, Mr. Pan about this. I know sort of my, I guess my comparison judge would be the Austin Mass Band Director and we've we had for nearly a year and the time frame he gave us. Uh, my dilemma is, uh, as I've mentioned before um, on another issue, as soon as this hearing is over, I can usually turn around and prepare it for uh, for significant first two murder case in Putnam County, uh, which will be happening in the first part of December. So all of my concentration will be going to that. I was going to ask, is it okay? And I don't think Mr. Pan has an issue with this. I think it has to be in December uh, to submit the test orders. I know that's a lengthy time, but by the time I get that trial over with, it'll probably be a couple weeks after that. So, uh, which would be about the time frame that you, you gave us for Austin, right? I, I don't have any objection to that. <clears throat> all right, well, we'll, uh, we'll think about that and we'll continue that up tomorrow. Sure, sure. But this is, I mean, it will be somewhat dependent on whether or not that trial actually yeah. goes up. Obviously, we just need to know exactly what's going to happen. But I've got two of one of them has since um, two of them set. So, um, Judge McGill had told us in no extra terms that it was going to go. I got the offer yesterday from the, the defense, but it's uh, so uh, I, I, I fully expect it to go. All right. All right, we'll be in recess until uh, say 10 minutes until one o'clock, and then we'll uh, reconvene and we need to see her for any reason. Okay, so lunch break for the courts, which we are, of course, are going to skip. All right, so we come back from lunch and we do not have the promised video testimony from Santiago, red shirt, flex. Uh, instead, we jump right to Roy Bedard. Uh, so I have some. Thoughts on Roy Bedard. Uh, Dr. Bedard is a well-respected, often used use of force expert. Uh, he was used uh, in a couple of prominent cases that we covered. One of them was the popcorn shooting case, uh, the Curtis Reeves case in Florida. Uh, we covered his testimony there quite closely. The other one uh, that we case he was Bedard testified in that we co covered closely, and both of these are for the defense, by the way, um, was for uh, uh, Michael Draca in the handicap parking spot case. In the in both those trials, I don't think Dr. Bedard's testimony was very effective. One of them in the in the Curtis Reeves case wasn't his fault. It was because the judge so constrained what he was allowed to testify about that it became rather pointless. But in the, in the Michael Draca handicap parking spot case, uh, Bedard's testimony was uh, egregiously bad. It was a train wreck for the defense and it was, it was wrong on the merits. So, uh, you know, he didn't get to be a prominent defense use of force expert because he always sucks. Uh, but he, uh, he, uh, 
he sucked in the Michael Drake case. No question about that. And I'll, I'm, I want to share with you the evidence of that, of how badly he, he handled the Michael Drake case. In the, in the popcorn shooting case, uh, the, the judge there, Judge Barthel, Susan Barthel, uh, inappropriately constrained uh, Dr. Bedard's testimony. So he could potentially have been effective in that trial if he'd been allowed to be effective. A key issue in that case is, again, it's similar to this case. It's a barehanded attack against uh, being defended against by a gun. So you had Curtis Reeves, an elderly retired uh, cop in a movie theater with his elderly wife. In front of them is a young couple, a large male and, and his wife. A dispute happens. The male stands up, uh, grabs Curtis Reeves' popcorn, throws it in his face. Curtis Reeves says, uh, throws his phone at him, at Curtis Reeves, strikes him in the head, uh, uh, looms over Curtis Reeves, who's trapped in his chair, and Curtis Rees draws his pistol, fires a single shot into the heart of the uh, the male looming over him and kills kills the victim. And is charged with a, a, an unlawful killing for that goes to trial. Now, the looming man, uh, arguably, only had his bare hands. He certainly didn't have a gun on him. He didn't have a weapon on him, per se. Uh, so it's a barehanded attack against uh, that was defended against with deadly force, Curtis Rees' pistol. And so we're looking for those aggravating factors. Uh, what would make the barehanded attack uh, a deadly force threat? Because, of course, that's what the element of proportionality requires, right? Before you can use deadly force in self-defense, you have to be facing a deadly force attack. Now, there's, there's lots of factors in what qualifies as a deadly force attack. Um, one of them is, as we talked about, the, the uh, disparity in size, strength, youth would play a role here. Curtis Reeves was quite a bit older uh, than the person he shot. Also, uh, if the defender has an exceptional vulnerability to injury, and Curtis Reeves was, again, older, uh, that would play a role. Uh, Curtis Reeves' ability to perceive the nature of the threat. Uh, here's a darkened movie theater, a large person looming over him. Uh, lots of these factors. But the, a key question in the case, is this proportionality issue? Was Curtis Reeves, did Curtis Reeves have a reasonable perception, doesn't have to be a correct perception, but a reasonable perception that deadly defensive force was warranted because he was facing a threat of death or great bodily harm? So a, a linchpin issue in the case is proportionality. And Dr. Bedard was called to testify about whether or not a reasonable person in Curtis Reeves' position would have perceived a deadly force threat. And the prosecution argued to the judge that Bedard should not be permitted to testify about that. Or more accurately, that um, Bedard should not be permitted to testify about um, whether a deadly force threat from the victim would have justified Curtis Reeves' use of deadly defensive force. In fact, Bedard, uh, the, the state argued that, hey, it's a question for the jury whether or not the victim presented a deadly force threat. And so Bedard should not be allowed to argue, uh, to testify about this issue of proportionality. And that's blurring two different things. It is up to the jury to decide whether or not the threat presented by the victim was a deadly force threat. But Bedard should be able to talk about not the ultimate finding of fact on that issue, but what the legal framework is. That if there was a deadly force threat presented, then Curtis Reeves was justified in using deadly defensive force. That's not a matter of fact. That's not something that has to be factually determined, or it does have to be factually determined, but that's that factual determination is done by the jury. But the principle of proportionality, if the jury believed that a deadly force threat was presented by the victim, then Curtis Reeves is justified in using deadly defensive force, that's a matter of use of force law. And Bedard should have been permitted to testify about that. He wasn't. Uh, and that was really the only purpose for bringing him. So Bedard testified about other things in the, in the Curtis Rees trial, but none of it was very important. That's not Dr. Bedard's fault. Dr. Bedard was prohibited by the judge to providing the value testimony he should have been providing. So I think Bedard's contribution to that acquittal was modest, but it's not his fault. It was only modest. It should have been more substantive, but he wasn't permitted to do that by the court. So that's not his fault. But, 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 uh, Dr. 
Bedard also testified as a use of force expert witness in the case of Michael Draca. This is the handicap parking spot case. So uh, if, uh, if you don't remember this, de the details or you're not familiar with the case, uh, Michael Draca was walking up to a convenience store and he saw a car parked in a handicap parking space and it did not have a handicap placard. And apparently this was a pet peeve of him. And there's a woman sitting in the driver's seat of the car uh, and Michael Draca says words to her to the effect of you shouldn't park in a handicapped spot if you don't have a handicapped placard. She tells him to piss off, says, hey, my boyfriend's inside that store. When he comes out, he's going to kick your butt. Uh, Michael Draca, then the boyfriend comes out of the store, sees Michael Draca conversing with his woman in the car and just does a running shove of Michael Draca, shoves him feet, 10 feet, 12 feet across the parking lot onto his butt. Michael, Dr Michael Draca now abruptly shoved to the, violently shoved to the, the, the ground, the parking lot, retrieves a pistol from his po pocket, points it at the boyfriend, fires a shot, single shot. It's a fatal shot. The boyfriend runs back into the convenience store, but he's been mortally struck by the round and he dies in the convenience store. Uh, and Michael Drake is charged with a killing offense. And a key issue in the case is whether or not the boyfriend continued to be a threat in the moment the shot was fired. So Draca hits the ground, he pulls out his pistol, there's a pause, and the boyfriend kind of shuffles his feet around. And the question is, could Draca have had a reasonable perception that the boyfriend was going to charge him, kick him while he was on the ground? If so, if he had that reasonable perception, a kick to someone who's already been knocked onto, onto the ground is arguably a deadly force attack. You don't have to wait for an attack to occur. You have to have a reasonable perception of an imminent attack about to occur. So the question is, did Michael Draca have a reasonable perception, even if mistaken, a reasonable perception that the boyfriend was in a position to and was about to launch a deadly force attack upon him, to wit, a strike with a shod foot? And so a key issue here is how far was the boyfriend from Michael Draca? Because... Michael, uh, the boyfriend, at the moment that Michael Draca fired the fatal shot, was the boyfriend, even assuming he was going to deliver a kick, was he in a position to be, to qualify as an eminent deadly force threat with that kick? And the traditional measure of whether someone who has an impact weapon, and in this case, the boyfriend's shod foot, the foot with a boot or shoe on it, is the impact weapon, uh, someone with an impact weapon, at what point, at what proximity are, do they become an imminent threat? So clearly someone who's, who's intent on kicking you in the head while you're laying on the ground, uh, if they're 100 yards away, they're not an imminent threat. They can't, they may have the ability to kick you in the head and the intent to kick you in the head, but they don't have the opportunity 100 yards distance to imminently kick you in the head. They would have to close proximity. And if they're standing next to you, clearly they could immediately kick you in the head. So there's some distance at which they're too far away. There's some distance at which they're close enough. And where, where's, the, where's the distance at which they become an imminent threat? A foot away, five feet away, 10 feet away, 15 feet away. And there's a very well-known exercise in the training community called the Tuller Drill, where um, a police officer at the time, Dennis Tuller, worked for the Salt Lake Police Department, ran a bunch of exercises. He was a, a, not just an officer, but a trainer for his department uh, to determine uh, at what point did an aggressor with an impact weapon become an imminent threat to a police officer with a holstered pistol. And from Dennis Tuller's perspective, the key, uh, <clears throat> the key issue here was how quickly could an officer get his holstered pistol deployed and engage the target with accurate fire. And Dennis decided that was about a second and a half. Well, if it takes a second and a half for the officer to effectively defend himself, then the, then the key distance involved is whatever distance that aggressor can close in a second and a half. And that's typically 21 feet. Most people from a standing position can cross 21 feet in a second and a half. So if the aggressor has a fist or a bat or a knife or whatever, some kind of impact weapon, not a projectile weapon, but an impact weapon, so they have to close distance. They can close about 21 feet in a second and a half, which by Dennis's measure was how long it takes a cop to present a pistol from a holster and defend himself.
So from the Tuller drill perspective, uh, the question would be, uh, was the boyfriend within 21 feet at the time that Michael Draca shot him? And he was. So arguably, in that context, he was an imminent deadly force threat at the time, or at least Michael Draca could reasonably have perceived him as a deadly force threat at the time. This was perhaps the key use of force issue in the case. And that's why Dr. Bedard was called by the defense to testify, specifically about this Tuller drill dynamic. But when he testified on cross-examination, he testified when the state asked him that the Tuller drill only applied to aggressors with an edged weapon. And in this case, the boyfriend did not have an edged weapon. So if the Tuller drill only applies to an aggressor with an edged weapon, then it was irrelevant to this case and could not legally explain Michael Drake's use of deadly defensive force. Here's the problem with that, folks. The Tuller drill is not limited. It's not limited to an aggressor with an edged weapon. Uh, let's see. So let me pull this up here. This is... Can we see this now? Oh, it's so small. Let me see if I can make it bigger. Because you won't be able to read it like that. Okay. It's a little better. So this so much troubled me uh, that I, uh, I actually transcribed the testimony because I was so shocked that uh, Bedard did this. So they're talking about the Tuller drill, the 21-foot rule. Uh, and here's the prosecutor. Um, Number two, he's saying to number Bedard, you were saying that the Tula drill, the person that had the edged weapon was advancing. Bedard, yes, prosecutor. Uh, so they're advancing and Bedard follows up. It's critical that I include edged weapon because that's what the drill is about. Prosecutor. Okay, so uh, the person that is advancing has an edged weapon. Bedard, yes. Uh, Bedard's writing now, I'll put retains edged weapon. Prosecutor, now common sense, edged weapon would be a knife. Bedard, yes. Uh, anything else you could think of? Anything sharp, screwdrivers, bottles, machetes. Uh, I suppose you could even argue a ballpoint pen. So throughout all this, Bedard is testifying that the Chula drill only applies to edged weapons. All right, here's the problem with that. The Chula drill does not apply only to edged weapons. Uh, and we know that, I think I have citations to the actual Tuller drill here somewhere. Oh, here's the article. The quintessential argue, article from Dennis Tuller. How close is too close? This was the article that was written in the Police Policy Studies Council, uh, first in SWAT magazine, reprinted here. Uh, but of course, SWAT magazine was in 1983 was the print magazine. I don't have a copy of it. So this is the repli replica of it on the website. Um, and when we look at what Dennis Tuller actually wrote, he wrote explicitly, uh, the good guy with the gun against the bad guy with the knife or machete or ax, those are all edged weapons, right? Or club or tire iron, those are not edged weapons. So the Tuller drill is not limited to edge weapons. And Dennis Tuller continues writing in that quintessential article. With that in mind, let's consider what might be called the danger zone. If you are confronted by an adversary armed with an edged or blunt weapon. So the Tuller drill doesn't apply only to edged weapons as Dr. Bedard testified in defense of Michael Draca. It applies to blunt weapons too. A blunt weapon would be a shod foot. But because Dr. Bedard testified in the Michael Drake trial that it only applies to edge weapons, the whole Tuller drill explanation for Michael Drake's use of deadly defensive force goes out the window. The only thing worse than Dr. Bedard's misrepresentation of the Tuller drill when he's testifying for the defense is that the defense lawyers themselves did not object, that this was a misstatement. They should have known better. So that was just absolutely terrible, terrible. Uh, let's see. I want to confirm that Bedard was called by the defense. 
not that it really matters because if he was called by the state, uh, then the defense, the defense should have known what the Tula drill was. And in any case, it doesn't change that it was a misstatement of law. Oh, okay, he's the state's use of force expert here, but that doesn't change anything. Uh, so he was hired by the state. He still, either he doesn't understand the Tula drill or he's lying about it. He doesn't understand it to the point where it's going to put someone in prison for the rest of their lives, convict Michael Draca, or he's, or he's lying about it. Which one is it? So that's my observation of Dr. Bedard. Not, not favorable, certainly in that case. All right, folks, let's continue now. This will be Dr. Bedard. Uh, so he's going to spend the first few minutes of his testimony talking about his qualifications. I'm going to take that opportunity to do a restroom break. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe, maybe heat up a little soup. Maybe I'll wait a little longer for that. Uh, and, uh, but I won't be gone long if I am gone. Here we go. The WebEx. So we called Cisco, who is the maker of WebEx, to figure out how to get that. Um, I was transferred out of the country, and the person on the other end of the phone said, we'll get back to you by email and telephone call, and we haven't heard from anybody since then. Um, so we have sat down and discussed it with my client. At this point, we're not going to be seeking continuance. I think we're ready to just go ahead and proceed forward. Unfortunately, we'll probably cut our afternoon shorter than anticipated, uh, but we did go ahead and get an, our next witness available so that we can go ahead and proceed. All right. Anybody else with us? So that's what happened in Santiago's testimony. Officers are continuously tasked with 
performing under stressful situations. Of course, it's a continuum. Sometimes the stress is uh, very minor. Other times it can be quite extreme. Um, of course, this is found in many of the enforcement occupations, such as the military, corrections, security, so on and so on. So um, I deal with a variety of people who are often uh, tasked with going into situations that are stressful. I also teach a civilian staff, self-defense, we could call it, um, through my background in martial arts. So from the martial arts perspective, I incorporate a lot of the ideas with uh, Mike, who, who might come to a seminar or a conference that I'm giving. And, and how often have you put on conferences or seminars? Over 36 years. And, and if you haven't already said it, in, in, in specifically what general areas are you actually lecturing on? I talk about um, fight transactions, combatants. Uh, I talk about use of force, the legal uh, criteria involved with actually applying some of the skills that we uh, teach students to use. Um, I talk a little bit about liability issues when I'm dealing with law enforcement agencies or training, for example, administrations that are concerned about high liabilities. I lecture to them as well. About um, consequences of not using force appropriately. How about teaching law enforcement? I have been doing that also since about 1986. I teach um, at two academies here in the state of Florida. One is the Pat Thomas Law Enforcement Academy, which I think must be the name of the state academy that is up in the Tallahassee area, a little city called Havana. And I also uh, teach at Seminole Community College in Seminole County. Um, and give us an idea of what you're teaching to law enforcement. Again, it would be areas of use of force, defensive tactics. I teach the legal law, I teach general law enforcement studies. Um, I teach instructor level courses, firearms, things like that. Give us an idea of, about how much you're involved in consulting, such as in this case. Uh, it takes up quite a bit of my time these days. Um, it, it, it started, I, I guess, where I was sourced by terms because of the work that I did. And uh, now I guess they just pass my name around because I get a lot of calls. I would say probably I split my time evenly now 50, 50, maybe 40, 60 doing consulting work. I don't work in an eight to five schedule, so it's a little bit harder for me to tell you exactly how many hours. Um, I oftentimes work around the clock and deadlines on cases and things like that. And how does it work as far as, are you consulting in civil cases, criminal cases, both? Give us an idea about that. Both. Um, so I consult mostly with civil cases when it deals with police liability. If a law enforcement agency, for example, is being sued or a uh, plaintiff may want to sue a law enforcement agency, I'll often... Uh, folks, I will mention that... Uh, um... This Monday is the scheduled start of the uh, Take Your Swing Mattress Dumpster Trial. Uh, and I expect to be covering that uh, live, assuming it's televised. I believe it is being televised and uh, it's out of Texas. And I'll be doing that on Rakita Law's uh, show on Rumble or wh wherever he's streaming. Uh, so Nick and I will be back together. The, uh, the band will be back together for covering that particular trial. But it, it, I don't think it'll be on uh, the Law of Self-Defense channel. I think we'll just do it on Nick's channel. Uh, but Law of Self-Defense members will get a, either a copy or a summary of each day's events as a, as a blog, vlog type content. Have you ever been retained by the state attorney's office in the Seventh Judicial Circuit? To provide consulting, uh, yes. And can you explain that? Um, you have to give the counties. Um, it's a Volusia, Volusia County. Volusia County, yes. So for Volusia County, I have been retained actually by the county for county cases involved in the use of force of uh, mostly jail staff, correctional officers. Um, were, you ever, were you ever hired by the state attorney to testify to grand jury regarding a police shooting? Yes. And, and that was also Volusia County. Um, that was a, a grand jury presentment that I attended. And who did you testify on behalf of? Um, the law enforcement officer who was famous. And that was, you were hired by the state attorney of this case? <clears throat> state attorney hired me, yes. What, you were hired um, in this particular case, and what were you asked to do? Um, I was asked to look at um, a case file, information presenting, uh, uh, presented uh, by um, defendant's counsel with respect to a shooting that occurred in St. Augustine. Was it given to you like openly, like you tell us if it's good or bad, if it's a case that you would testify in, or was, were you led to, to believe that you're only hired for one particular case? Well, it's been a while since I've had a case. Um, I think with COVID and everything, it's set everything way back. So I don't remember the original conversation, but I can tell you my method, which is generally to receive cases openly and to have a sort of summary of what it is that I would be looking at. Um, and then generally I would ask to look at some. Uh, particular documents, usually in a criminal case, they would be the police reports themselves. Um, they might be uh, the information that's been filed, or, or uh, perhaps if there's an indictment, to take a look at the language and see exactly what I'm dealing with. And then I'm asked to offer a, uh, 
sort of cursory opinion on what I think about it. And um, in my experience, if I don't tend to agree, I guess, with the attorney's side, I don't want to call that. Um, but if I, in my cursory understanding of the case, um, it seems that I would have something to offer that's within my wheelhouse. And um, that I perhaps would agree with uh, the attorney's side that's contacted me, then I would uh, usually get a call back and then the entire file would be sent to me for, for my observation, for my review. And uh, then I would take however long, sometimes I write reports that sometimes they can take months. Um, sometimes I go to scenes, sometimes I interview witnesses, so there's a lot to it. Um, but generally I'm, I'm asked to uh, conduct my own investigation and come together and take it. And what material did you obtain and review um, to prepare yourself for an opinion in this case? There was a lot of materials, and I don't have an um, exhaustive list with me, but I, I looked at things I normally look at. I looked at, of course, the police reports. There were several videos. There was uh, body-worn camera videos. There were stationary camera videos that were taken from the geographical location where the event happened. Um, some cell phone video. Um, I listened to some 911 calls. Um, I looked at uh, the investigator's report when we went in and actually conducted a full investigation. Um, those types of things. Did you review any interviews or depositions of any of the witnesses involved? I did. I looked at not only the depositions, but the statements. A lot of that is done in the police reports, but then I also subsequently looked at the at NFL depositions. And did you feel like you received sufficient information based on what you'd seen in the videos? In other words, who was involved in the videos, where then you could read what each person had to say about the event? Yes. And what do you believe um, in a case such as this is the standard for uh, you to consider? How would you describe that? So usually my background in reviewing cases comes from the police department. Of course, we use force daily at the, at the varying level of force. Everything from um, grasping force to using firearms. And the standard that we always apply is an objectively reasonable standard that's been handed down to us by, by the courts to review whether or not an officer's conduct would be considered um, consistent with what a, another reasonable person would do. And so that's the standard that I apply not only to law enforcement, but, but anyone who uses force. And how many times do you believe you testified as an expert? I don't know. I think in both civil and criminal cases, it's 30, maybe 35. And you've been qualified as an expert in what particular field? Um, use of force defensive tactics, um, human factors, and I told you some of those other areas that are nuanced to the use of force. How many of the cases, I don't think I asked you this, uh, specifically in a criminal case involve standard ground? I think around six to eight, or I've actually testified, I've been involved in many cases, probably dozens of them, many of them never come to trial. But where I've actually testified, I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of you know, six or eight. And give us your understanding of the history of the standard ground law. So, dating back around, because I think it's important to know whether or not the, the witness who's an expert in the field understands the, state, the standard ground law and uh, its evolution. I'll give you a little bit of like leeway on this. <coughs> Keep it short. I'll keep it short. Um, the standard ground started in Florida until, I don't know, the next 1,300 years probably. It's been a requirement of existence throughout the United States. Just so th I'll be interested to hear his explanation. Uh, <clears throat> standard ground really should not be uh, relevant on this in this case unless the state does something to suggest that the defendant had a duty to retreat. Uh, first of all, there is no duty to retreat because it is standard ground, but also the defendant had his back up against the wall. I mean, he'd literally been backed up to the wall, which is the, the classic uh, definition of satisfying any legal duty to retreat. Uh, so it shouldn't really matter, uh, but we'll hear what Dr. Bedard has to say about stand your ground. I'll be interested to hear that. Uh, also, I should mention that one of the defense attorneys, Canan, Patrick Canan, I have been describing him as Pat Canan. He tells me he goes by Patrick. So I've corrected, uh, I've corrected the image I'm using to... Uh, to uh, this image um, for Friday's live appearance. So it's Dan Hilbert and Patrick Canan, both, of course, attorneys down in Florida representing uh, the defendant, Louis Casado, here in this uh, self-defense, successfully representing Louis Casado in this self-defense immunity hearing. Back to Dr. Bedard and his understand. I hope he understands Stand Your Ground better than he understood the Tuller drill in the Michael Drake case, but we'll see cease and desist from any type of, um, of violence if there's a confrontation by somebody who um, is threatening them. They had a duty, a legal duty, to, to simply turn and walk away. Um, until, and I think this was back to old English law, their back was against the wall, and only then did they need to engage. 
uh, in about 2005, Florida initiated it, probably on the heels of two crimes that we hadn't seen before. Uh, it would be carjacking and home invasion. Those two crimes were becoming um, more prolific in the, in the uh, late 90s and going into 2000. So there were uh, a group of uh, representatives, the senators that got together and decided that we needed to change the law where people would need to have to flee from danger if they were in a location that they had a lawful right to be in. And this was the first stand your ground law in the nation. Subsequently to that, there's been about 37, 38 other states that have adopted essentially the same language that Florida had. All right, so just just for clarity, uh, he's right. There's there's actually 39 states that aren't currently stand your ground states, but close enough, 38, 38, uh, 37, 38 is close enough for someone who's not an attorney. Uh, but uh, it's not true that Florida was the first. <laughs> uh, there's uh, about half those uh, 39 states that are stand your ground are stand your ground by statute, and a lot of those states became stand your ground by statute after Florida. But there are many states that are have been stand your ground just by case law. They've always been stand your ground, including states that might surprise you, like California is a stand your ground state. It's a very vigorous stand your ground state. In fact, California juries are instructed to this day. Uh, Cal Crim 505 is the jury instruction. They're instructed to this day that a defendant in a self-defense case, the defendant not only does not have a legal duty to retreat, he can actually pursue his attacker if necessary to secure his safety. But you won't find a California stand your ground statute. Uh, they have no stand your ground statute. Uh, that stand your ground law is found in case law in California going back to the late 1800s. Uh, so Florida was not by any means the first stand your ground state. And the, the, the models that you've talked about, why isn't that just common knowledge? Why, why is your expertise required? These models um, tend to be objective. They try to take into the characteristics of a real fight, but that's sometimes hard because of the human factor, because the psychological stressors that accompany decision making in particular. Um, I think this is something if you've never had an authentic punch in the nose, it's difficult for laymen to understand the amount of stress that you go through. Um, it's anxiety. When I say stress, it really is anxiety. And I teach my students, you know, that basic definition of anxiety is just a very healthy respect for the unknown. And when you are in a violent situation, um, most everything is unknown. You don't know how the fight is going to end. You don't know how it's going to progress. You don't know if there's going to be the introduction of weapons. You don't know any of that. So you, you tend to have a psychophysiological effect when you're trying to make decisions. You're, you're, there are things that change. For example, your, your eyesight changes. You become tunnel vision. You have what's called auditory exclusion. You'll actually not hear things. It's, again, a thing to like sitting stops responding. And we know this is sensory gating. Sensory gating is critical to the fight because, of course, it narrows the field of vision and it limits the ability to um, not only what they're doing, but what they are aware of. And so these decisions that they're making are not made in a calm way. For example, if you were to sit around the table and discuss what should have been done, um, they're made under um, very trying circumstances. And so the brain tends to, to move from a contemplative type of thinking to what's called heuristics. Heuristics meaning snap decision. What do I think will work for me to save me now? under the stress of not knowing how this thing is going to end. So we still, with all that in mind, need to be proportional to the amount of threat that we perceive. And so the objective models are known as generally continuums, and the continuums represent both the threat and the response on two different sides. And there, I guess to simplify the, the, the muddiness of, of, of a fight, there's broad categories that have been developed. For example, your presence, um, empty hand techniques, uh, aggravated <coughs> attacks, deadly attacks, things like that. And then those are corresponded by what we would think would be appropriate levels of response. And so the force continuum is requiring that not only do we have escalation and de-escalation on both sides, but that those things remain proportional. And so the defense uh, perspective is to always gauge what the attacker is doing or what the threat is, and then to correspond to that accordingly. And so subsequently, these models are often needed to explain when we come into a court of law where everything is calm, there isn't the stress, where, um, we're able to sort of tease apart when it happened. We have to relay some of those ideas to the prior fact to be able to understand it from the perspective of the person that was making the decision at that time. And so we are cautioned to not use, for example, 2020 hindsight, the ability to, to know things now that the person in the fight couldn't have known at that time and apply that to the standard. Um, and so I describe those things so that folks are aware that um, there may be more things to think about than just, well, I wouldn't have done that, or perhaps I would have done that too, um, which I think is the typical reaction that we have with see fights in YouTube or TV or things like that. Can you expound on the effect of the psychophysiological changes that occurs when one is attacked? Sure. So, I mean, I don't know if you want me to get into it, but there's actually a, a nervous system change. Do you yes, sir. Your sympathetic nervous system takes over when you feel danger. So in your brain, you have this little thing called the amygdala, and the amygdala is constantly looking for danger. 
it's part of our evolution. It is something that is um, always queued up. Some people have larger amygdalas than others. You, you know, they, they can change shape. We often heard that as PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, where everything around them seems to be a threat and they're very hypervigilant. But I'll say your ordinary person, a person who has not perhaps had the experience of war or something that's um, continuously trying, still has that amygdala functioning. And as a consequence, when something is threatening to them, the amygdala is the first thing that recognizes it. And it notifies the nervous system by shunting down the parasympathetic, which is the part of our nervous system that gives us homeostasis or balance. And it shunts up the alert part of our uh, nervous system. This is the, what we often refer to as fight flight. So these are, when we see this happening, there's physiological changes that are going to occur throughout the process because we're seeing things differently, we're feeling things differently, we're hearing things differently. There's a huge consequence on memory. Oftentimes we see certain block responses after a recent ball shooting. They don't remember much of it. They don't remember how many bullets they shot. Sometimes they don't remember shooting at all. Um, they have a very difficult time um, remembering everything at about the point of a the shot. They seem to have clear memories before the stress, but at the point of that extreme stress, those memories become very fragmented. And so um, we have to be mindful of that because oftentimes, uh, almost every time, I'll be asked to give, for example, an interview about what happened. And we tend to give them about 24 to 72 hours to let their brains rest. We typically think we need enough time to get a good night's sleep so that those memories that are broken consolidate and we're able to have a more clear picture of what actually happened. And you said there is also included in this is changes to someone's eyesight. Yep. Can you be more specific? Yeah, typically what happens, I mean, again, from an evolutionary perspective, um, our, our senses are all working together. We're sensory creatures. And the first sense that detects danger is typically going to be your ear. And the reason for that, of course, is because we can detect danger at greater distances when we hear things. Perhaps if there's brush or some type of cover that our eyes can't see, we can still hear the cracking of twigs and know that something or someone is there. But once we identify a threat, at that distance. The eye is the part that humans tend to use mostly from all of our sensory awareness. Unlike rats that use the olfactory or the nose, humans rely on their eyes. And so the eyes have to be acutely tuned into what that threat is. So you'll actually see physiologically the elongation of the eye will become farsighted because usually the threat is at a distance. Our eyes will reach out. So even if you're dangerously nearsighted, the eye will still, through a process of muscles, it will expand the lens and you'll become farsighted. So those kind of things um, we've been able to see, we've been able to replicate in empirical studies. Um, that is one example of you know, the, the, the type of sensory um, disruptions that we have. The memory disruptions are very obvious. They, they tend to um, be somewhat inconsistent with, for example, what a video might show, or sometimes what they reported yesterday after that night's sleep, they have consolidated thoughts, now they report to something else. And that's become a burden for law enforcement because you know, the question is always, well, why then and why now? And in fact, they just didn't have a full picture of what had happened. So um, again, we have to be mindful of all of those things. What, what are midbrain decision making? What is that? So midbrain decision making, the, the middle of your brain is the limbic system. So most of us, when we think about things, if we all sit here today and we think about what's going on, we're using the prefrontal cortex. This is the most advanced part of our brain. It is what we uh, uniquely have developed beyond the capacity of any other animal. We can reason with it. We understand high ideals like justice and truth and things like that that other animals probably are not in touch with. And we are able to communicate. We're able to actually take ideas and turn them into sounds so that we can communicate with each other. That part of the brain is the forebrain. But underneath that, it's actually the older part of our brain, is the midbrain. The midbrain is also known as the limbic system. This is the part of the body that's responsible for what I talked about earlier, which is going to be engaging the fight flight uh, phenomenon when we start seeing fight flight. But one of the interesting things about the, the midbrain is that even though the neurons are talking to the forebrain like a highway, it will shut the forebrain down. It will actually attenuate the effect of the forebrain. In other words, our ability to rationally understand what's going on, to contemplate it. And there's no reason for that. If you go back to our evolution, of course, our ancestors, the ones that we have to credit for all of us being here, had a good sense of danger. If they were, for example, confronted by a predatory creature on a plane, they didn't stop to think, I wonder if he's hungry. I wonder if he's interested in me. That's the kind of contemplation that might happen if you watch a movie. But when it's happening to you in real life, the only thought that generally enters is run. And that thought perseverates, run, 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 run. And so what we tend to see is the midbrain controls that. It has shut down the forebrain. It's forced it sort of to not work so that it can respond appropriately to the threat that it perceives. You just said flight, the term was flight, fight, or fight, flight phenomenon. And what is that phenomenon? The phenomenon itself is probably misstated. Um, today we understand there are other things that uh, humans do. They freeze, they fight, they flee, and they posture. And though of those four things, I think the, in, in the literature, a lot of times you still see it referred to as the fight-flight phenomena. Sometimes more 
within the last decade or so, we see referred to as the freeze fight flight phenomenon. Um, but probably the most salient part of being in danger or facing a threat is going to be the posturing. It's going to be that um, the different types of posturing, uh, like dynamic posturing, aposematic posturing, depending on whether or not you're just trying to frighten somebody or whether or not you actually have the tools to carry out the threat. And so um, when, when animals, all animals, engage, they have these natural mechanisms, and they operate from the midbrain. And these natural mechanisms are responsible for, oftentimes, survival. Uh, if, if the animal, for example, runs away and is fast enough to run away, they'll survive the day. If they're not fast enough to run away, they will have to fight. And they can only hope that they're equipped well enough to be able to endure the attack. Um, but it often does occur in that order of freeze, hoping that the rods and the cones of the eyes don't detect you because there's no motion, because our eyes trigger for that. If you're detected, then we run. But you can't run. Sometimes it might be the condition. You might be in a small room. You might be in your home. You might be other people to protect around you. Or you might not be fast enough. Then you, you move to fight. And fight, of course, is the disadvantage for human beings because we're not gifted with fang and claw like other animals are. We tend to use hand tools. We tend to use um, expressions of force through our hands. I know in police work, we always say, watch the hands, watch the hands, watch the hands. And we try to get officers who have a social context of looking at faces, like most of us do with movies. So police officers always go right to your hands because we know those are where the weapons will end up if they are attention to us. So um, all of this is controlled by the midbrain. It is a, it's a healthy respect for the unknown, as I said. It's an awareness, a situational awareness, threat assessment, and all of is undergoing throughout the process of everything that we do, especially as things start to become more salient and we start to understand, well, this is a threatening situation. Those things become very acute. Are there any models or the theoretical models that you use for the for your use of force analysis? Um, yes, I talked to you about the force continuum. I mean, that is a model that we would oftentimes use for analyzing whether or not force amongst our species that is, you know, does have the ability to contemplate, at least to some degree, would remain proportional to a, a particular threat. In your experience and your training and your education, do people sometimes shoot others when the threat is turning away? Not at all times. And can you explain that quickly? <laughs> There's probably a couple of reasons for that. I think um, if I can compare it perhaps most of the killing that goes on in the world today is on video, right? When you shoot somebody on a video, it disappears or evaporates. But in the real world, when you shoot somebody, it's still there. So the mind doesn't have the ability to quickly understand it as no longer a threat. It's there. It is still present. And so oftentimes, you'll continue. The, I talk about perseveration. Run, 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 run. When you start to perseverate with your mistakes, you do shoot, 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 shoot. For example, we see police officers that empty magazines or pull bullets into people, and we don't train them to do that. By the way, they often have no memory of doing it. But it happens because they're perseverating. They shoot, 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 the threat is there, the threat is there, the threat is there. That's one reason. The second reason that it happens a lot of times is because we do these things very quickly. They happen in the order of milliseconds. Um, and in a millisecond, it takes time to process. It may not seem like a long time, but typically reaction time is measured in quarter seconds. That means before something happens and you realize it's happening, about one quarter of a second or 250 milliseconds will have passed. This, of course, is why when we get in our automobiles, the Department of Highway Safety tells us, to keep a good car length between ourselves and the vehicle in front of us. Because our first recognition that it's stopping will be, we hope, the tail lights coming off. It'll take 250 milliseconds before your foot starts to move to the brake. And if you're traveling 60, 70 miles an hour too close, you'll never be able to stop the vehicle because you will have traveled that excessive amount of distance before your brain can actually engage that something is happening. So we see this a lot of times with threat. With threat, if you know that your threat threatened, you develop what's called a motor strip. Your brain downloads a motor strip to your motor system, your muscles, and they begin to automatons. They start to do things automatically. Fortunately, we don't have to stop and think about how we throw our punches, how we throw our kicks. Um, this is sort of a beginner's model of learning martial arts, for, for example. But at some point, those things automatically happen. So when the motor strip is launched, that now you have the problem of having to stop it. So if suddenly the threat stops. The motor program doesn't just stop. The threat is still having to be processed, and the, and the cessation of the threat is still having to be processed. And so we tend to think there's about a 400, 400 millisecond milligram, uh, millisecond moment where your brain can see something happening, but before it can issue what we call a veto to stop it from happening, the motor script is already acting out. Um, one of the examples that I often use, and we don't see it so much anymore, but I am old enough to remember when our car doors locked with those little buttons on top. And I can remember leaving my keys in the car and pushing the car door shut and realizing that my keys were in the car and knowing full well from a contemplative perspective that if I reached out and grabbed that door, it would pinch my hand in the frame. I was still unable to do it because I knew the door needed to be caught and I didn't have enough time to stop the motor script and sure enough, my hand caught the door. So um, I think people have experiences like that where they see that lag. And even though it's a short lag when you're talking about something, for example, dynamic firing, you can fire you know, multiple bullets in, in a second, um, 
it, it becomes very meaningful from an analysis perspective to say, is it even possible to stop shooting when you recognize that perhaps the threat may be ending or has ended? Does that suggest that trying to determine the timing in a shooting, such as in this case, is critical to the analysis? I think it is. I think it's critical because obviously if you have a, in a case like this, the shooting is going on for five, six, ten seconds, it becomes very uh, important to know that because there are moments there where the detail could have been issued but was simply not and the shooting continued. And now we start getting into vindictive shooting, right? We start getting into shooting where you're shooting somebody perhaps that you're angry at them for because you want to get some, um, uh, you want to get a bat or something like that. When you have a rapid volley of shots that come out in, um, I think for example in this case, 1.6 seconds, that's a continuous motor strip that's, that's being exercised on an advancing continuous threat. And so that measurement, knowing where those shot shots are, are very much consistent with what we would see with somebody who feels as if they're in great danger of either a serious bodily harm or worse, and is responding to it with the use of a, of a firearm. You can see that, that steady perseveration or nursing of the trigger before the motor strip is turned off. You just mentioned two words. Is it important for you as an expert to distinguish between fear and retribution? It is. Fear it is. and anger. Well, when you get into the emotive components of all of this, we have to also understand, I think sometimes, and perhaps this is another reason why I think it's important to talk to folks who have not been in a fight, fear and anger often work very closely together. As a matter of fact, we know that anger oftentimes is a survival instinct. We know that people who become angry sometimes get up off the ground where otherwise they might just go ahead and die. Um, so it, it, it is a motivator in that it, it causes our, um, our chemical system to get us to do amazing, extraordinary things because we happen to be angry. Um, so it's very closely related to fear. On the other hand, when you get into retribution where somebody can't control themselves, we're supposed to be able to shunt that down over time, right? So, um, you know, there are various tests some people are better or worse at it. But if you have a situation where, you know, for example, if a police officer is hit someone with a baton multiple times, no one's counting the strikes while the individual is still resisting. But if they turn and walk away and then come back and hit them again, that's excessive force. Because now we can see that that anger has bled over into retribution. So I guess to summarize that, if I wasn't too confusing, to try to make it clear. Anger is an okay emotion in a fight. As a matter of fact, it's almost expected. But if it isn't damped down when the threat has ended, then it becomes a legal issue. Doctor, do you feel like you have enough information to provide an opinion of whether or not you think it was object objectively reasonable for Mr. Casado uh, to fire his firearm? Yes, that question because I think it raises a central issue in this particular case. Uh, any opinion about the objective reasonableness is essentially the same as asking him if he thinks the shooting is justified or not. So, like that was not a matter for an expert to opine on. All the other things that he testified about, I think it's fair game. But the ultimate issue is for your honor to decide if it's a trial fact or a jury fact. Can I ask a question of the witness as far as whether he's ever testified to objective reasonableness? Okay. Have you ever testified in court as to objective reasonableness of a shooting? Stands, and I know from his deposition that he's also not allowed to testify to that as well. So there's two sides of that coin. Claudia, do you have any case law on this issue? Or whether or not he's capable of it? Because the case law is, goes both ways, so it really it turns out to be up to you. Um, do I, I'm sorry? That's, do you have case law that suggests that it would be appropriate for him to testify to the ultimate issue? Not specifically. Okay. Is that not the ultimate issue that I have to decide? It is. Let me do it a different way. Sure. Okay. Um, can we please uh, put up um, evidence, defense evidence two, which would be frame, I think that's nine. So it's kind of a fine point, but uh, Bedard is supposed to be allowed to testify as to the, the factors that might play a role in someone's perception of whether a use of force, defensive force was reasonable, but not to state definitively whether this defendant's use of force in this instance was reasonable. That's what the finder of fact is supposed to determine. And the finder of fact can consider things like response time, amygdala, perception of threat, uh, all, all these factors could play a role in whether or not someone's reaction in self-defense, action in self-defense was reasonable, but whether or not, given the totality of the circumstances, it was reasonable for a particular defendant in a particular case is for the finder of fact to determine. 
considering all those factors. The role of the expert here is to provide that finder of fact with a more contextual basis to arrive at that conclusion. And of course, here, the finder of fact in this hearing, there is no jury. It's a pretrial hearing, self-defense immunity hearing. The finder of fact here is the judge. The judge is playing the role of the judge, the finder of law, but also the finder of fact. At trial, assuming a jury trial, this, this decision would be uh, made by the jury, playing the role as the finder of fact. Yeah, Dr. Bernard, you told us that you um, have um, viewed the video in this particular case. And, and have you also had consultation with Harris Ward after he was able to um, actually define uh, the exact seconds in the video? So Paris Ward, of course, we saw him earlier today, was the forensic video ana analyst. He commented on the uh, the Faro video reproduction work done by accident reconstructionist Brian Moody in this case. Yes, and you reviewed those videos? I did. And did they assist you in uh, rendering your opinions about stress and how, how an individual would react to stress? Yes. Can we show that, focus that? Now, I can't help but wonder how, how productive it might be to, to pose the questions in the sense of, um, you know, d does the rapidity of the shots, the 1.6 seconds, is that more consistent with reasonableness or tends towards reasonableness as opposed to had it been 16 seconds, that would be less consistent with reasonableness or tend away from reasonableness. That's not an ultimate conclusion of fact. I wonder if that might be more permissible uh, to the court. This is uh, the video that actually has been put a time or two uh, by Mr. Ward. Um, you've had an opportunity to review this? Yeah. And we're looking at a frame that is, is at 51.29, and seconds of the first shot are 60 seconds point 10. And what I'd like you to do is provide the court with, with your insight as to what you see that could be considered a stressor or create anxiety or create fear uh, in, in, an, in any individual. Starting now or in the future? Um, actually, let's move frame by frame, and you tell us when to stop. Okay, let, let's go back to the last one. No, this is let's, 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 let's name the frame so it's clear on the record. 5135. Okay, 5135. Um, when I watched this, and of course, this has a little bit of hindsight, not that I, that I contemplated that um, Mr. Casado would be doing this, but I know the hindsight I took. So what generally would end up happening in this frame right here is that you see there's a confederation. There's multiple people that are involved. They are all focused on Mr. Casado. We don't know if they're friends. We don't know if their firearms are going to They are confederated. And that, of course, I think any reasonable person would recognize that this group of folks appear to be together. <laughs> At this point, um, if this is at 5142, 5142, obviously someone has commanded the attention of Mr. Casado. He's no longer looking at them. Right. So like here, Bedard just made a statement, right, that these these people in this image uh, with the uh, with the victim here, uh, Adam Amoya, they appear to be associated with each other. And I, I think that's reasonable inference to make from their interactions in this video. He's not saying that with certainty. He's not stating as a, a f finding a fact. He has no personal knowledge of these relationships. He's, he's making an inference. I think the same could be done with this reasonableness issue. You know, it appears to be more reasonable or appears to be less reasonable. It's not an absolute finding of fact on whether or not it was reasonable. That's for the judge, well, for the finder of fact to do, the judge here. Uh, but it's a, it, it can, you can make reasonable inferences from what you're observing. The whole group, um, he is engaged in some type of conversation. 
conversation is, but he is uh, exchanging communication. He's exchanging uh, with the individual who is against the wall. Oh. Now, this can be taken in many different ways. Obviously, the pointing of your finger at someone is generally threatening. I know that my mother used to know that I'd be pointing at her because she's very rude. And I think that in our society, um, we tend to recognize sort of hand signs like that as being perhaps rude, maybe threatening. It depends on what words are coming along with that. They can also be, because we're never in the context of this, this is a, um, it's a, it's a busy night, it's just out in a public area, there's a lot of activity going on. It could be because they're just joking together, and that somebody's trying to make a point or emphasizing the point, point of the finger. So once again, this could be perceived, this is just simple body language, it could be perceived as a threat. We also see a, a little bit of change in Mr. Casado. His head is slightly cocked, he seems to be attending more um, specifically to this individual than the finger is being pointed at. This frame is 5148. Stop here at 5151. Okay, on this frame, you can see now that it is not just a conversation between those two individuals. Now, Mr. Casado has turned and looked at someone else. Um, it looks as if he has his hand extended. I don't know if this is an um, expression of uh, familial kind of calming, but uh, he, he does have his hand extended. We see the other individual still has his finger out. It looks to me as if he's directing it at the gentleman in the red shirt um, at this point. It's very difficult to tell in a two-dimensional video, of course. But it looks to me as if he's pointing at the fellow in the red shirt, perhaps asking a question about him or saying something to, to him about the individual in the red shirt. At this point, 5201. We have more touching going on here. Uh, it's unclear, again, if Mr. Casado would perceive this as a threat, but he clearly is being, his attention is being drawn, once again, to the gentleman in the black shirt and black hat. Um, and it's being drawn physically. He's touched it. He's made him aware that he is to focus on him to look at him. And so we can see Mr. Casado is responding in time to turn his head. Now, uh, 50, 50, I'm sorry, go ahead. 5206, it, it appears to me as if this, this is um, becoming more intense. And this may be in fact where the threat really begins. I think uh, Mr. Casado is leaning in, the other individual is leaning in. There's very little social space between the two heads. Um, it's, it's not typically, unless it's very loud, like a club, what you would see in an open environment like this. So this can do, I mean, we get bigger, we get louder, we turn color. It's mostly empty do that. And this might be the first expression of him getting bigger because he's kind of looming over Mr. Casado right now and letting him know that. If there's bullying going on, how does, does that fit into the equation at all? Sure. I think bullying behavior doesn't end in middle school lunch. It usually goes through it all the time. And um, oftentimes the bullying behavior, bullies tend to pick on weak individuals or weaker individuals, someone that they think that they, um, they can handle. And so this could be going on here where we have a confederated group of individuals that are engaging Mr. Casado. It would all depend on me being able to hear what you're saying as to whether or not I could say thank you to serve you for bullying me at this point. And at 5209, you see a little bit of a retreat. The gentleman in the black shirt pulls back. He leans against the wall. Uh, Mr. Casado still is attending to him, probably still in some type of a conversation. 5216, he's stepping forward again. Now we have more touching, more stepping forward. Perhaps at this point, it is becoming threatening because um, there's no reason for someone to be looking at him. They're not trying to get their attention anymore. He is in continuous conversation, and now he has hands on it. So I would perceive this as, as definitely being uh, the, the first strong suggestion that, that there is a threat happening. How about the body language of the man in the red shirt? Uh, at this particular frame, I, I don't necessarily see it. I do know that this at some point is played in, in, in real time. It looks like a I think both move forward at the same time. But I can't say in this frame that's the moment he's doing it. Um, he's using what we call a defensive posture, kind of arms crossed, um, shielded, closed, but I, I don't know what's on his mind. You notice the reaction to the man behind Mr. Hoy in a blue shirt? Yes. Does that suggest anything? Only that he's there. He How about be, putting his hand to his head? He may be. I don't know. Okay. Now we are confrontational. Where he, needs, he is on the inside position of this individual. Um, he's got his arms, I guess, around him, and uh, it appears as if he is trying to become an enforcer of some type. I, of course, know what he's going to do is turn around, and so at this point, he is inappropriately um, putting hands on an individual who has a right to be there, and uh, preparing to, to physically take control of the right hand. Have you seen Mr. Casado make any threatening or hostile gesture towards Mr. Moya? No, quite the opposite. His hands don't even come up. You know, typically, in self-defense class, that's the first thing that happens when you infiltrate your personal space is the hands. You teach to bring them up to at least create that distance. He has got his hands down. He clearly is not interested in sparring. Um, he is, um, it looks to me like trying to talk this out or for, for reason with him. It seems like his head is a bit put forward from a self-defense perspective. It's also bad. 
That's what he's doing if he wants to be heard um, and he wants to continue the conversation. Next slide. That's 5217. 5217? That one. This is 5218. And now we can see um, the application of force. We actually see uh, he's using enough motor power to stand the return or, or redirect the ascending detour. Um, Mr. Kassar, once again, this is inappropriate, even at this low level, law enforcement could learn the same thing. You can't just redirect the people, even if you don't want to. Um, and so that's what I observed here. This to me is clearly defensive. Now, I, I believe in 5219, Mr. Kassar realizes that this is no longer friendly. He reigns his hands up for the first time. He sort of stands his ground. He's, I don't know what he's saying, but it appears as if he is making a bit of a plea to not fight. And generally what we teach and what we see a lot of times is this sign of showing me open hands is an expression of I'm not armed. And so, of course, we teach law enforcement officers to do that to help de-escalate situations. I don't know Mr. Casado's training, but this would be a this would be a universal sign of de-escalation, of hands open, not closed, not showing the back, not concealing them. It could be a very upfront, I'm not armed. You don't have to be afraid of me. That's generally what this position means. And I see Mr. Casado go into this position. Um, and create a space. Um, I, I don't disagree with Bedard. It is kind of a universal placating, I don't want trouble position. I, I'll mention as an aside, it's also an excellent defensive position uh, from which to uh, block incoming blows, uh, from which to uh, retrieve any weapon you might be carrying in, an, uh, for example, an appendix uh, position on your person. It's, uh, yeah, so. Perhaps because he's somewhat, he's pushed back, somewhat back into this position or perhaps because he voluntarily realizes that he's too close. Well, obviously he was on. So does this, the hands up, does that signal I don't want to fight? It does. You know, if, if you go back to history, we think this started with the old Romans who were also armed and carried swords. But when they met people for the first time, they would express this hand, that sort of concealed it, and each other, to show that I'm not armed at this moment. There's nothing to fear from me. So whether or not you have a weapon on you, it's not about being armed. It means that you don't have to worry about me at this moment. I don't have to be afraid. So at this point, um, is is Mr. Casado does not have to walk away, does not have to run away. He has a right to stand his ground. But even if he wanted to, Doctor, was he given the time to move away? Well, I mean, starting at this point, the answer is no. I mean, so, because so how much is it? One second until he's hit in the head from this yeah, point? Approximately. So he doesn't at this moment. I mean, when he first walks up on him, of course, he never had anything to speak to him in the first place. So the answer is he could always have disengaged. We are all free to choose to disengage. But when we're at this point, this is going to happen very rapidly. He has no time to really consider what's going on and to uh, contemplate what his response is. So this is where he becomes a little bit divisive. So at 52.19, when he puts his hands up. So it's an important point. So even if there were a legal duty to retreat, you're not required to retreat from every encounter in human life. Uh, the, the duty to retreat for use of force law purposes says, before you can defend yourself, you may have a legal duty to retreat. Typically, only before you have to defend yourself with deadly force do you have a legal duty to retreat. Well, you, you're not doing that. You're not making that decision until you know you're actually facing a threat, an imminent threat against which defensive force, usually deadly defensive force, would be justified. That's when you're supposed to make the decision to retreat. Uh, it's too early here. Here he may still be reasonably thinking, hey, the, these guys are getting excited, but I I'm going to calm everybody down, say a few soft words, maybe then I'll walk away. Maybe it'll cool the waters, calm the waters. Um, but uh, you're not required to just, the, the moment someone looks at you cross-eyed, you're supposed to turn around and run down the street. There, there is 10 seconds to the first shot. So let's pay attention to how much time goes by before he's hitting the head. What's the, the frame is 52.20, and how many seconds are on the clock for the first shot? Uh, 9.23. So he's been given less than a second to even have a chance to walk away. Right. Since he's putting his hands up. On the point that he tries to negotiate and de-escalate, he's not given an opportunity to understand exactly what's happening before he's struck for the first time. And watch his head go back. This, and this is the second hit. And now note the frame is 52.20. So in that second, he now has affirmation of what I said in the beginning, which is that there is confederation. How much confederation, we don't know. Is it four, five, two? We don't know, but more than one for sure. And this happens very rapidly. He gets it from two different directions. Of course, our eyes can't see that way, which is probably why he never getting hit the second time. My guess is he never saw it. Um, because we, you know, we, we tend to be binocular to the front. And so his head is then compressed with the first strike. He immediately gets another strike. Um, but the one thing you should be aware of is that he came from somewhere else. 
What does that mean? What's the significance of that? Uh, that he's outnumbered. And let's go back a slide, please. Can you see in this frame, and, or have you noticed in the video um, that this this first hit is what knocked his glasses off? Yes. And what's the significance of that? Well, so it's a star hit, first of all. I mean, it even broke glasses. Um, but it also has a profound effect on cognition. So with these concussive blows, the real danger of concussive blows oftentimes is not from the skin in your face, it's from your brain rattling around your cage. And this is what causes concussions. Of course, you know a lot about that from football, even with helmets on, where the head is allegedly protected, you still see these devastating blows to the head that come from that concussive force. And what causes, of course, is to cause unconsciousness immediately. I mean, you're not an artist to know how to do that if you're a boxer. That's precisely the area that he's going for. Um, they can cause um, uh, confusion, of course. Um, they can cause um, a little bit of discombobulation to where you immediately are trying to put everything together, but your brain is not capable of doing it. It's discombobulated. So it has a pretty profound effect on your reaction at this point, simply because it's not working, but your brain is not typically working the way that it would normally work after that first blow. What would you expect the fear level or the anxiety to be at this point? Oh, I think it would be quite high. I think this is um, looking at his posture. Notice his hands are still down, and he doesn't see this coming. Um, he's in the process of de escalating. He's trying to, whatever's happened up to this point, it seems to me he's trying to negotiate and to, and to create a contemplative plane. Um, Mike Tyson probably said it best. I think he's, if I dare say, an expert in knockouts. He said everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And so this is what's happening here. Whatever plan he had is out the window at this point because he has been punched in the face. And now he's just in a pure reaction mode. He's going from contemplation, how do I get out of this? How do I calm my voice? How do I apologize? Whatever might be going through his mind to I'm under attack. And this is where fight card really appears. So do you notice in this frame 5220 that while he's being hit at with 9.23 seconds to the first shot, that the red shirt man, Mr. Santiago, appears to be moving forward to make an attack? I, I don't know if I can see it in this frame, but I certainly see it when, when the video plays. Yes, they're both moving in concert. It appears as if, I don't know if they signaled each other or if it was just happenstance, but they both decided at the same time to strike. And you can see that because both blows are happening in those seconds. Now, based on the movement of his head, I mean, the, the, a lot of people in this uh, trial have wanted to say he was slapped. Can we talk about what a slap is and how hard a slap can be? Because, um, you know, you can slap somebody and it might not hurt them too much. How would you d describe this hit? Well, I mean, it's not necessarily the shape of your hand. It's the amount of force behind it. So force is measured by mass and acceleration squared. So if you have a heavy mass and a lot of acceleration, you're going to suffer a pretty profound injury for most of us. You hold the hand back with a hand fist. Um, I don't know, a pool noodle, or even for that matter, a pillow from, from a bed. I, I've been picturing Mark in a pillow fight. And it can cause real damage if the mass and the acceleration are significant enough. So when you look at things like the potential injury, it's not necessarily the impact point, but the amount of force that's rushing through the body kinetic force of that strike going into that concussive ball to your head and rattling things around. Next slide. This is 5220, which marks when Mr. Santiago, um, the glasses are off, correct, by this point. Um, and Mr. Santiago is about to make contact with Mr. Casado's face, and there's 8.5 seconds left. So his, let's go back, let's just time between the two shots, the two hits to the head. That's what it is at 9.23. And in this frame, 52.20, his head is about to be struck, and it's less than a second later. Do you agree? <laughs> okay, next slide. What do you see here in 52.21? So now we can actually see the postural effect of the blow. Um, as uh, the gentleman in the red shirt throws that right hand, he takes uh, Mr. Casano's head and throws it back. Very disorienting. You put your head in the air and turn yourself around. You can lower your eyes back to the ground. Oftentimes, you'll have an immediate sense of dizziness. This is a very physical um, way of knocking somebody's head up into the air. So there's a huge disadvantage here. The balance of Mr. Casado is off. Um, he can't see anyone right now. He's looking into the sky. He doesn't know how many attackers he has. Aside from the fact that his glasses have been knocked off, I don't have any idea of how that affected his eyesight. But under the circumstances, someone with perfect 20-20 vision would be completely visually disoriented. And if he, had, this is an individual who's worn glasses since he was four years old, um, do you think that would have any significance on how disoriented that could make him? I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that question. Uh, it's not my area of expertise. But I do know if you have, I can just say generally speaking, any type of a handicap, a limit, uh, a body part, particularly visual, that doesn't work right, you're, you're not going to gather as much information from which to make your decision. And you had used the term concussion. and there's no evidence that he was diagnosed with concussion. Um, but the medical examiner did testify 
um, that after this blow, he would expect him to be dazed, and that it would take him a, a couple of seconds or more to recover from that. I don't know if that's semantics or what I say, because the dazing is happening because of that pretty rapid brain. I mean, it is the knockout technique that you, that you study boxing. It's usually going to be about the, the lower part of your face that is thrown up at a diagonal to cause that concussion or that dazing, and ultimately it through some hard technique. Do you notice anything about his legs? Um, well, as I said, he's off balance. He clearly is, um, it appears to be stumbling backwards. He's not engaging, he's not in the fight, he's not trying to spar at this point. In fact, he's never trying to spar. He is moving backwards. Let's move to the next slide. At 52.23, it seems that he's come back up. He has, and now we can see him being actively engaged. This is not an individual who is satisfied with that strike or those two strikes, but someone who's going to continue to engage. So, Mr. Casado, at this point, I, I, I'll use your word, I'm sure it's haze. The, the timing is too short for him to have any cardiac recovery from that. And he is faced with a new character once again, who is now obviously closing the distance on him, a very short amount of distance, and he's moving in. Next slide. This is 52.23, and it almost looks as if Mr. Moya takes his left hand to the face and tries to hold it while he hits him with the right. Do you see that? Uh, I can't see it very well. All right, in the video, I'm going to yes. that um, but this is uh, five seconds, point four three until the first shot. Do you, do, you, do you see the blue guy trying to help it all, the blue shirt? No. Do you see the white shirt trying to help it all? No. Do you see the yellow shirt trying to help it all? No. Do you see the red shirt trying to help it all? No. Now, the red shirt has just hit him, but then he retreated, didn't he? Yes. Next slide. At 52.25, what do you see? Well, obviously, the striking continues. Uh, we still see the displacement of balance. Um, we see some drip to the rear still as Mr. Casado was dropping back um, and his assailant continues to move forward. Um, and at this point, I would submit to you that it's not likely that Casado can make a detail of who was actually confederated against him. He's not had time to process this. When you see this in real time, you realize he would not know if it's just this individual or if the other ones are, are also <laughs> surrounding him or perhaps uh, preparing to launch their own attack. So go, go back, please. After the second blow, Mr. Casado starts to reach into his pocket, doesn't he? Yes. But he doesn't pull the gun. No. He actually ends up backpedaling. Yeah, it looks like a readiness position, what we would call a readiness position. I think he's starting to understand the gravity of the situation that he's in. Um, it, it does not look as if he's, well, I guess some might refer to as trigger happy because he's immediately felt going to start shooting. But he realizes that um, he, he is, it's a, it's a term of self efficacy. He's not up to this fight. This is not a person that he wants to spar with. This is not a person he wants to grapple with. Um, and of course, he doesn't have to. It's not, it's not a legal requirement that you engage someone who is attacking you. Um, but he also, I think, realizes that at this moment, um, the gravity of the situation has deteriorated to the point where he may be seriously hurt if it was as this attack continues. Well, certainly the unpredictability of what's about to happen. I mean, he can't foresee what, what their intent is. Can he? Well, that's the anxiety part, right? So he doesn't know what's going to happen. When you talk about, you know, danger, it's all through the lens of the individual who's being hit. It's their perceptions. And so I would say that any reasonable person, if you took Mr. Casado out of this equation, in these given circumstances, would share the same fear that the gravity of the situation has deteriorated to the point where they should reasonably expect great bodily harm. Next slide. This is what we've seen, 52-25, and he starts uh, returning. It looks like the yellow shirt guy just smoking a cigarette. Yes, I, I, I'm not sure. Again, I try to look at it for what Mr. Casado was seeing, and I, I don't know if Mr. Casado sees him. Um, I don't know exactly what's going on in his mind. I do know that there are still people around him, more than one, even I'm pretty sure he knows not attacking. This isn't something Mr. Casado could know, but rather, so this would be part of the threat. But the blue shirt guy, um, which is Mr. Britton, um, he was part of that initial group. You had a word for it. Confederation. Confederation uh, when he stepped up. So a reasonable person would think he's still part of this group. I think that's true. 52-26. Did you notice his left, Mr. Casado's left hand is up, correct? Yes. And he's still backpedaling. The swings are coming. Um, and he still hasn't pulled the gun with 2.6 seconds until the first shot. Right. And I also see the gentleman in the black shirt with his hand down preparing for another strike. Um, it, it, it seems to me that this is the, the origin of the strike, that this is exactly what we have just seen several times in boxing. And that's different than a slap across the face. That's right. I mean, this thing is, this right arm is, is deep, and would right. you agree, down by his knee? Um, Mr. Boyd's right hand down by his knee, so ready to down, deliver a blow. So down by his knee. Yeah. Again, it's a two dimensional frame, so I can't say how low it is, but it is certainly a wound up strike. He is wound up for a solid strike. This is not a, this is not a and what does Mr. Casado's left hand up indicate? Um, this is pretty typical. Um, this is one of the things that I talked about with this, this uh, beauty factor, right? So when you attack, especially in the face, your hands will automatically come up. It's one of the first expressions we see babies do. 
you know, laying the grid of the angles of the things that your hands are on, because this is a computer, this is part of what we're trying to So this would be a more natural reaction to try to collect the flow. Next slide. 5226 is still, it uh, looks like, there's, it looks like the left arm is still delivering a blow. Yes, and the right hand, once again, uh, I, I think this is a quick, quick enough sequence that this is still the same general posture that we just saw. Next slide. This is 5227. It looks like the right arm of Mr. Moya has come through. It does, and on the video, you can't actually see contact, so I can't say with any certainty that he hits him, but I can tell you that the postural cues are the same. When he is hitting him, I think a reasonable person would say that the postural cues match what he was doing in the previous blows, so you could reasonably anticipate that he hit him again. You are familiar with the testimony of the gentleman named Nicholas Gray, who's just a few feet on the other side of Mr. Casado, what he said he saw about those final blows? Yes. And that he was being struck in the head? Well, hit, hit back against the wall and he thought he was going to fall to the ground. I remember him saying he was about to step in and catch it, but he thought he was going down after these series of blows. He thought his head was going to hit the brakes behind him. Um, so what he can see, I can't see. And uh, I wouldn't be able to clearly testify that I saw that happen. But I am aware of the fact that this witness, uh, who is looking at it without uh, it being in the frame like I am, um, was very concerned about Mr. Casado at this point to the degree that he was willing to jump in the middle of him and try to rescue him. Do you recall what that witness um, said about Mr. Casado's eyes? Uh, I think he said they rolled back his head. I think is what how he. And if that's accurate, what, what would that signify? Well, this is the frame of consciousness. That's typically what happens. And perhaps you're right unconscious for a moment. It is possible that you can actually um, phase out for a moment and then come back. Um, when you say a moment, moment, you mean like a millisecond? A millisecond before you actually fall. But typically, what happens is when you lose consciousness, you're obviously pulled back. And he, that witness described him as looking dazed, like a boxer. Is that consistent with what you? What you see here? He did, and I think the first time we consulted, I used the same expression. I said, looking like a boxer in the ropes that was just taking a, a beating. And uh, he's kind of leaning back. He's clearly not in charge of his posture. He can't really engage in a wrestling match because he doesn't have good balance. So he's just, he's really taking a beating. So this slide being 5227 in 2 minutes and 17 seconds to the first shot, I'd like you to pay attention to the movements from here forward of the red shirt and the blue shirt to see if there's any significance to you. So the next slide, please. 5228, it's 1.37 seconds to the first shot. What do you see the red shirt doing? He, he's moving towards the left. So he's he's not staying back. He's certainly about to interject himself into this fray. And this is Mr. Ramos Santiago? Yes. And what does the blue shirt seem to be doing? Uh, he's always been there. Like I said, I, I would think that Mr. Mr. Pisano at some point was always aware of his presence. I don't know that he could attend to him at any given time. He could just happen so quickly. But of course, he is dazed, and his hand is still on target to actually see what's going on. Um, so he is a constant reminder that there's more than one person involved in this. But the, haven't you seen the blue shirt start to turn his body toward Casado? Yes. Could that create some additional fear? Well, again, if Mr. Casado saw that, I don't know what he could attend to, but I think his presence, his omnipresence, that he was always right there, would give any person under these uh, same facts a belief that they were engaging more than one subject. So if he turned towards him, that might affirm it, but I don't think that necessarily strengthen the concerns that Next slide. This is still before, um, this is 5228, less than a second before the first shot. Would you agree that the blue shirt has even turned his body more? Yes. Yeah, so and Mr. Santiago, or Ramos Santiago, has moved closer towards the fray. Yes, yeah, so now there is an encroachment by the blue shirt that's right here. It's not just body postural cues are turning. He's actually, I think, taking a step here and has closed the distance also. Has anyone come to the aid of Mr. Casado? No. Next slide. This is 5229. This is the first shot. And do you notice that the red shirt is closer now? It is. And, and this is an interesting observation as well, that when that shot is fired, you notice that, that both subjects are still facing him. That's that processing time I was telling you about. The fact that when there is a stimulus, it takes about a quarter second to even realize something's happening before you can do something about it. So what we see is these two gentlemen in the presence of danger, serious danger from a firearm, continue to move towards him. That's because they haven't processed yet. That's firearm is out and that he is pointing at, at the gentleman in the left hand. So at this point, it, it appears that Mr. Arroyo is throwing a left hand Yes. and preparing to throw a right hand. It looks that way. Once again, the possible cues are consistent with what we've seen on screen. So at this point, the gun has gone off. You can see the muzzle fire. Yep. And Mr. Santi Reno Santiago doesn't immediately react to that, does he? No. So let's go to the next slide. This is now... The second shot, which is at four seconds, point four, I'm sorry. Mr. Santiago has not reacted to the first shot, is actually moving closer to the fray, isn't he? Right, and neither 
because the gentleman in the black shirt, he's still completely square to, to um, Mr. Casado, which is not typical for Benzie behavior. We tend to blade to cats. But once again, he's processing what's happening. And of course, these shots are happening so rapidly in milliseconds that it's within his reactionary cap. That's what we call the reactionary cap. And the same thing he said for Mr. Santiago. He does not understand at this moment what's happening. He's still moving within that few milliseconds. And instead of doing what, what you might refer to as a reasonable person to do and turn and run, um, we see him continue to advance in light of the fact that the shots are already been fired. Because the brain is still processing. It's still processing. The next slide. This is the third shot at 0.63 seconds. And Mr. Ramos Santiago still has not turned around or done anything other than move towards the fray. And notice no one has. And this just goes to show you how universal this processing is. We've got, you know, five people we can see on the screen all just kind of standing there with their hands down and watching this as bullets are flying. And so this is what the atypical behavior, if you knew there was a shooting, this is not the kind of posture that we would see people engaging. So um, it just, I think, reinforces the point that there is that reactionary gap that, that we all share with the same capacity. Because at the third shot, which is 0.63, Mr. Amoya is still facing Mr. Casado. Yes. Next shot, slide. The fourth shot, which is at 52.30. Mr. Amoya has now turned, and we are not yet to a second for the four shots going off. And please uh, comment on Mr. Ramos Santiago. So Mr. Ramos Santiago is still moving forward. Um, we can see for the first time that the gentleman in the black shirt realizes that he is being fired, and he starts to turn away, which is the typical blading I talked about, where one legger will move forward or backwards to try to reduce the um, surface area against the threat. So we're seeing him do that. He's starting to turn away, but it is happening again in a millisecond. And you'll see that, again, the other folks who are not under direct threat, who aren't being shot, their processing time is actually a little bit slower because they aren't the ones that are feeling the effect of the shooting. Next slide, which is also 52.30, but it says shot five, and that is when clearly Mr. Moya is retreating. Right. At this point, um, he's turned away. He realizes that he's under fire. He's doing what we would typically expect. He's creating distance. He's fleeing at this moment. Um, and I think at this point also, uh, Mr. Richard is, is observing this and realizing the gravity of the situation. He has stopped his forward advance. He is in a sort of freeze mode right now. He just sort of stops and looks. And, and again, this isn't a voluntary reaction. This is typically what ends up happening when, when someone is under, has a recognition that there is a very dangerous threat in front of them. So the white shirt and the yellow shirt are going to run. In your professional opinion, why haven't they run yet? I think they're still processing. I think that they just are, are not. This is happening in 1.6 seconds. We have to remember that. So even though when we look at the frames, it appears that they're just hanging out, this is going to happen very quickly when you run to take full speed. And you'll see that their reaction time seems pretty normal. But when you break down the frames like this, you can start to get into the signs of reaction which is when we actually recognize things are occurring. And we can see here in the science of reaction time that they're not reacting appropriately. There are bullets flying in the street. We've got one who's just leaning against the wall. We've got another one who's still smoking. And of course, the one who's under fire has realized the gravity of it. He is starting to react for the very first time. And it looks like the one who's really attending to what's happening, the one with the red shirt, has gone into a freeze mode. And so it appears that at this point, or even through the next two shots, at least the ones that do strike, uh, Mr. Moyer, there was never a full turn, a full revolution. Would you agree with that? Yes, I noticed uh, that now you start getting into forensics of it, but you know, even the shots in, in, in the back were from uh, on the left flank. So it was really just a continuous follow up reaction, the same little movement, which generally occurs in somewhere between a quarter and a half second. All right, and the next slide. This is at 52.30 with shot six. Still, the, it seems like Mr. Moore in the white shirt is starting to perhaps move. Right. I think he's, he is starting to move. I mean, he's starting to realize w what has happened. And I think at this point is where we actually see them take off the run because that's the normal thing to do. Next slide. So now we're at shot seven, which is 1.6 seconds. Mr. Moore has finally decided to run. Yes. Like, sure. And that's all because of the processing that you described. It's part of the processing. So he's, he, and by the way, at this point, the shooting's over. So he starts running as the last shot is fired. So he's there for the entire volume of shots. He's watching it. He's relaxed. He's not reacting to it. This is the processing that goes on um, when you recognize the stimulus in the environment and then have to contemplate what to do about it. These folks here are actually contemplating. Their forebrain is still working. I would submit to you that the, uh, Mr. Moya is, is working off the limit system at this point. He's under attack. He's dealing strictly with heuristics. Turn and run. Turn and run. That's all his brains are separated. Turn and run. And these guys are going, what's going on? Is, this, is he really shooting? Those are the kinds of things that I would expect people who are not directly under threat would be processing. And so they take a little longer. 
I'm going to show you what's been marked um, for identification as Exhibit T. Any first Take a look at that. Tell me what that is. This is a copy of my CD. Is it an update copy? I think so. Relatively so? Relatively so. And is it an accurate copy, true and accurate copy of your account? Certainly we have. Yes. Would you uh, move that into evidence? Any objections? Okay. Is it that first step? I'd like to um, have the witness look at exhibit, as exhibit 12. We're going to go frame by frame. This is um, at the F5221, but more specifically, this is frame 13621. And this is after Mr. Ramos Santiago has hit um, Mr. Casado. And we're going to go frame by frame. And I want you to watch the um, behavior of Mr. Ramos Santiago. Tough man. Seems to be smiling. Do you agree? Smiling and looking right. Grabbing his crotch? Yes. Is there any suggestion that he's going to now come back into the fray, or is there anything you see about this frame that is, is um, important? I can't say that. He's certainly not dissociating from the, from the fray. He's very much involved. He may be looking for law enforcement. Um, he's definitely not focused on uh, what the gentleman with the black shirt is doing, but he's not. He's very much a part of the scene at this moment. Okay, so Pete, let's watch as he returns. What would that do, his returning? Now, we don't know if Mr. Casado can see that. But in his periphery, perhaps an objective person, somebody in that shoes, could see some movement coming toward them. Um, is, you, you, you talk about that. Yeah, I, 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 he probably would see the movement, by the way. Again, he wouldn't be perhaps able to give details of exactly what's happening. But a um, person coming at you, you tend to, your, your receptors would pick that up. And it would suggest that, um, once again, you're under, or about to be under multiple attacks, somebody else is about to re engage. And could that uh, contribute to the fear level and anxiety? Sure. Okay. So you told us um, through these frames, could you just put in conclusion what you think the stressors are that this this gentleman was under uh, at the time he fired the gun? Um, yeah, first, the big stressors is that he didn't know what was going to happen. I don't even think he knew why it would happen. I think there's a good uh, escalation of force that he would perhaps typically see where people are shouting at each other, arguing with each other, falling, fists, posturing before the first blow is even thrown. This is a sneak attack. He's out of nowhere, he gets hit, and he's never able to cover from it. At that point, um, he is uh, confused. His head has been concussed, and he's off balance. He's never able to recover. The garage is becoming and becoming and becoming. He's trying to figure out a way to make it stop. And so, of course, there's not a lot of time to contemplate. So, at this moment, the stressor is, what do I do about it? And this is where we go into heuristics. We go into that snap second decision. And as I said to you previously, this is as hard a decision as knowing that you're under attack is actually taken out of knowing you have to shoot somebody. There's a huge psychological process there. Shooting people, they know that. Um, law enforcement officers, soldiers suffer terribly if they're involved in instances where they've had to shoot people. So he's having to make this decision. It's not common for humans to want to do that or sometimes even to be able to do that. And so that's a huge stressor. What am I going to do about this? The only chance I have is to go for the handler that I carry in my pocket. So I think all of that's happening just at the same time. He's trying to protect himself. He doesn't want to get hurt seriously. He sure doesn't want to get killed. And he has to respond with a firearm. And I don't believe, I saw a record of never shooting an individual. So this is uncharted territory. It's something he's never done before. How about the fact that Mr. Memoria is shot in the back? Do you believe, in your professional opinion, Mr. Casado uh, should have been able to determine that there was a turn and stop firing? No. And you base that on everything you said or anything additional? Everything I know, my training and my experience tells me that a situation that unfolds this quickly, oftentimes we will see a whole empty magazine. Um, and that's what happens here. 
This is not lengthy, about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Join with his eyebrows now. <laughs> This is complete speculation. <laughs> Did any witness say that he said that? The state has eyewitnesses who've testified about this encounter. They testified that he was asked to leave. Did any of those witnesses testify that that Casado said? <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> sorry, sorry, uh, Dan and Patrick. <laughs> I should have known you would object to that. I, I didn't say that. I still think that's negotiating behavior. And, and so all of that has to do with what you believe Louis Casado was thinking at that moment or not? Um, I'm only looking at body language if it was Mr. Casado or someone else I would testify to say. I can't tell you anything that would be several times because none of us know what's going on in his head precisely. But, it, but when you are trying to analyze something like force, you have to know the posture of views and what they mean. You also indicated that um, you referred to this group as a confederation. So you didn't refer to it as a group, you just called, called it a confederate, that they're confederated in some common purpose, correct? Yes, the, the point of using the term confederation was not to, to amplify the danger, but to show that they were all together. They, they knew each other, they were speaking together. Um, which is different than a group, for example, if you walk up a group of people standing in front of a bar who aren't talking to each other, they still be a group of people, but they don't show any type of confederation if they're together. So that's why I use it. Right. I mean, the implication there by using that language, instead of confederate or confederation, instead of just a group, the implication there is that this group was surrounding him for the common purpose of. I think the word bullying was used uh, to threaten him in some way. I mean, that's the reason you chose that language rather than simply referring to it as a group. Well, I think we have to look at it from the person who is being bullied. And so it would seem, based on my analysis, that if somebody is surrounding you and tensions are escalating and they were all previously talking to each other, that they are, in fact, confederated. And now the anxiety is that how many are going to attack me? Who's going to attack me first? Where should I turn my attention? Those kind of things. And so I'm just trying to describe the environment in which a person would feel fear based on the fact that there's many people that are all centrally involved with an escalating situation. Right. Even though some of the people that are in that group never really even moved hardly a muscle. And yeah. it's like the gentleman in the white shirt, he stood there, leaned up against the wall the whole time and never moved. Yeah, and with the benefit of hindsight, I think you can say that. 
Um, but that's not something Mr. Casado could tell them. And that's the point. We have to analyze it from Mr. Casado's shoes. What happened at that moment? Could he know that these guys were playing smoke signals and maybe missed the ball? The answer is no. He didn't know that they were all talking together. So you would assume the worst case scenario that you're outnumbered by these individuals. In hindsight, when smoke clears, yeah, you can say these guys weren't involved at all, but that's not a benefit. So again, your your assessment here today is to interpret what you believe was Mr. Casado's perspective of the number of the individuals that were present at that particular point, not correct? So I was asked to look at it like a chess game to make an objective analysis of what these figures mean, how how human factors play into the role of uh, feeling anxiety, feeling danger, based on the stress of an escalating situation. Could that happen? Um, and I think the body language that I went through frame by frame shows that it was escalating. Um, not on behalf of Mr. Casado, but on behalf of the gentleman in the black shirt and the red shirt. So he is being attacked by multiple people. How many, he doesn't know. And I think any reasonable person placed in that situation would have a healthy respect for the fact that there's a lot of people that are confederated together that all might jump in and correct. Okay, you didn't answer my question, so I'll ask you again. Your testimony here today is you're trying to convince this court of what Mr. Casado was thinking about the number of people that were in the group that was the point, not correct. I don't know what he was thinking. I know that a reasonable person would perceive that incident as involving multiple people. So the bottom line here is you don't know what he was thinking at that time, correct? You don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. know. You don't know what he thought about the group of uh, people. For all you know, Mr. Costado may have not seen the other people in the group, and I'm not talking about this gentleman in the red shirt or Mr. Moya, but other people in the group, which you testified to that were confederate. The bottom line is you don't know what, how he perceived those other people. For all you know, he may have not have thought they were afraid at all, correct? Sure, and you don't know either, and that makes this a level playing field that we can only make inferences based on things like hospital cues, relative position, reactionary gap, the kind of things that I look at when I analyze. But um, no one can say with any degree of certainty except Mr. Casado, perhaps not even him because of the memory problems that often occur, what he was thinking at that moment. Are you saying that Mr. Casado had a memory problem? What's that? Are you saying that Mr. Casado had memory problems? I don't know if he did or he didn't at that point. Uh, you were also asked questions about Mr. Bridge. He was, he was the, the uh, African American gentleman that was in the blue shirt. Yes. who was sort of in that area. In truth, he never really, you know, he might have turned briefly, but he never did anything, did he? No. And I think there was some question about, was he bowing his arms up? But you never saw him do anything of a threatening nature, did you? No, just that he was there and in close proximity. You have no idea how Mr. Casado perceived his presence there, do you? No. Don't you think it would have been important to know what Mr. Casado was thinking at that time? That's objectionable. All right. That's what we're testifying to. It would be nice to know, um, but I don't know. And I, and I don't think that he has broken down to the point where I could know that, or anyone could know that. So my question is not whether it would be nice to know. My question is, would it be important to know? It's not necessary. It's not necessary. No. It's not necessary in this particular case to know exactly what the person who used the force to fire seven shots at another human being hit him four times, twice in the back. It's not important to know what that person was thinking at the time he fired those shots. Same objection. I say the objection. Because how would, how would you know what Casado was thinking unless you compelled them to testify? You, you can't say, well, a person, uh, we have to know what they were thinking in order for them to have a privilege of self-defense, because that would mean you could only have a privilege of self-defense if you're willing to, if you can be compelled to testify. We have a, a Fifth Amendment constitutional privilege not to be compelled to testify. You said it would be nice to know. Why would it be nice to know? Any information, any information that I get that helps them keep the picture is, is good. And unfortunately, especially in these types of cases, um, you're always having to make inferences based on observable behavior. And so you're not always, as a matter of fact, you're rarely aware of what somebody's thinking. And I say that because oftentimes people who experience this, and I think I explained why, have perceptual distortions in what they see and what they feel and what they hear. Maybe different, for example, than what other witnesses see and feel and hear, and what videos sometimes we can force. So it's difficult to know what they were thinking at that time, it's not impossible. Um, it's a huge problem for researchers, by the way, to be able to even ask an athlete, what were you thinking when you got that field goal? Um, we struggle with case studies because we don't always know what they remember, or sometimes we don't know if they're telling the truth. We don't, there's a lot of things to what goes on in someone's head that we can't figure out. 
So we have to deal with inferences based on observations. So you left the implication that all the things you testified about here today, you know, about the Winchester and, and how people perceive these people in the end, the bottom line is we don't know whether we perceive those things that you talk, we actually perceive the things that you talked about here today all. Well, in the same way that you described them. We were called here to analyze what we think happened from an experiential perspective. And as the expert in this area, these are the kind of things I've seen before. And so I can only apply my education, my training, experience to try to understand what it is that I'm observing, and that's what I'm sharing. Um, but if you, if you want me to say absolutely what you're thinking, I can know, so we do that. But there's a way to know that, right? There's a way to know what? To know what you're thinking. I'm not sure. But you, you could talk to it, right? Objection to relevance? Overruled. Well, as I said, sometimes you don't always get it straight because you have fragmented memories, you have perceptual distortions, um, and sometimes people don't tell you the truth. Okay, so why, why do you think that he might not tell you the truth about what, what he was perceiving? I don't know if he would or would not tell me the truth. I just know that that is a problem whenever you are doing um, uh, self-reporting in any type of research. You just don't know why people say the things they do. In modest situations, we often, and I know with law enforcement officers, we have, we, we refer to it in research as the John Wayne syndrome. You know, they just want to look good after the event. And so they flavor and have a story with things that sometimes might make them look good. And we know that that sometimes does happen. Um, so once again, having a video as strong as this is a great opportunity for us to not have to be that concerned about what we are thinking, because we can see and make inferences from the relative positioning, the reaction to the gap, the number of assailants or potential assailants, and so on and so on. And that's what I'm testifying to. So, so we don't. So don't even try to talk to them and find out. We, we don't try to talk to them, right? Did you did you try to talk to Mr. Casado? No. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm Judge. I want to play a objection. All right. Um, number one, the law is you know, this court is charged with doing is determining about whether an objective person would do the same thing under the circumstances. Objective, not subjective. These questions are all subjective. Number two, Jefferson v. State and other cases that I can pull up, there is no burden on the defense to prove otherwise. It is the burden of the state to prove by clear and convincing evidence that he wasn't sufficiently afraid, an objective standard. These are inappropriate questions, attempting to shift the burden, and I just want to make sure that the objection is clear on the record. Yes, Your Honor. I mean, this is a defensive witness. So we, we presented our evidence in the case. This is a defensive witness who has got up here and testified and made implications about what Mr. Casado was thinking. And I think it's a fair game. That door has been open. The defense chose to open this door. And I'm, and I'm just simply walking through it. You can't <laughs> lie no. throughout the entire testimony of what Mr. Casado was thinking. And I think it's only fair to ask, well, there's a way for us to, to know what he was thinking rather than simply watching the video and trying to figure it out and assuming what he was thinking. So objectionable. But my question was, did you try? I tried to talk to him, no. Completely agree with the defense. That was utter burden shifting by the state. Extremely objectionable. He did. You were asked. Well, Mr. Posada was going to leave. Would an objective person under that situation be perhaps confused by being told to leave a public street? Perhaps. And wouldn't it take some time to process this request, this demand? To leave a public street? Sure. And isn't the best evidence of him not wanting to, or, or piece of the evidence, not wanting to engage in any kind of fisticuff is when he put his hand up? That's what it appears. And is it at that point when he would have been given time to leave that that would have been the best opportunity? If he chose to, again, the standard is not he has to, right? I think it's important for standard to keep that in mind. Um, so I don't want to draw any assumptions that he was thinking about leaving. Because he didn't have to leave. There's no legal requirement for that. But had he negotiated and thought, I'm outnumbered, something bad about happened to me, I would say probably at the point where we could have taken out the stand. Truly being threatened, where he gives the universal sign of negotiation, that would have been the moment for him to make a decision to flee. And he was hit within a second. Within a second. Did he do anything based on your observations of all the videos to escalate this issue, escalate the confrontation? No. Never. That's all right. 
Yes, I want to thank you very much for the you. All right, so that was it for Dr. Bedard. I thought he did a fine job. Uh, I thought the uh, the state's uh, cross examination was completely inappropriate. <laughs> and the legal standard here, keep in mind, is that the fence does not have to prove self defense. They have zero burden to prove self defense. The state in this hearing has to disprove self defense by clear and convincing evidence. And a trial, the state would have to disprove self defense beyond any reasonable doubt. Uh, the, the defendant's under no obligation to explain what he did uh, personally, both under the Fifth Amendment uh, to the U.S. Constitution, I expect under the Florida Constitution as well, but in any case, it's applied to the states, and the Fifth Amendment is, of course. And uh, <laughs> and so this this struck me as real desperation on the part of the prosecution. I, I was surprised the judge let it go as far as it did, frankly. Uh, but I, I don't think the uh, I don't think the the prosecution scored any particular points there. Uh, but they 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 didn't have uh, they didn't have much to go. I mean, uh, Bedard uh, did a good job here, unlike in the Michael Draker case, uh, and uh, as I already discussed, and uh, I expect the defense was pretty happy with uh, their expert witness there. Uh, we have one more witness for the day. That's this. Oh, I can see the the chat is going to go crazy here. It's a uh, blonde woman. She is. Uh, let's see, uh, Roy Bedard and uh, Dr. Dr. Deidre Leake, or Lake, L-E-A-K-E, a facial plastic surgeon. Uh, this will be the last defense witness for the day. Tomorrow morning, when we get to day four of the hearing, and I'll try to do that tomorrow on uh, Wednesday, uh, January 18th, unless the snowstorm that's coming uh, keeps me out of the office in the morning. Um, but if I don't do it tomorrow, I'll definitely do it Thursday, day four of this hearing. Uh, they have one more witness, and that's a uh, Dr. Lawrence Miller, a psychologist. But this is the last witness for today, and presumably she's going to testify about the kind of uh, injuries that uh, a person can suffer when they're uh, repeatedly forceful, forcibly uh, struck in the face. And those are pretty maiming injuries, folks. The, the bones in the face are not that hard to break. So let's see what Dr. Deidre Leake or Lake has to say. And let's see, her testimony is about, uh, is short. It's only about, uh, let's see, only about 10 minutes, less than 15 minutes, I think. And that'll wrap us up for the day. So let's go ahead. Leak. And what is your occupation? And do you have a business in town here? And give it a little closer to the mic. Say that again. Facial rejuvenation. And tell me what what the business does. I'm a dental department of work with our elevator knowledge that can help us create those patient occupations. We treat implanters, cosmetics. Folks, I have the volume cranked up as high as I can on my end for the court.
So it'll be interesting to see if this is reminiscent of the George Zimmerman trial. So in uh, in Zimmerman, uh, they took uh, George Zimmerman's mug photo. Uh, he didn't look too bad in the mug photo, uh, but they took his mug photo after one, he'd had a chance to uh, wash his face, wash the blood off his face uh, in the bathroom at the police station. And second, uh, after uh, EMS that arrived on the scene had a chance to move his nose, which had been punched sideways on his face, the EMS on the scene basically grabbed his nose and repositioned it <laughs> in, the, in the correct orientation on his face. And we know this because uh, the responding police officers took photos right there at the scene before Zimmerman had been treated by EMS. Um, and his face was covered in blood and his nose was literally sideways, like someone had hit him in the face with a board. Uh, those photos were never promulgated by the media, of course. Uh, they only showed his, uh, his, his mugshot photo where he'd already been cleaned up. And then they lightened his photo to make him look more white, lighter in skin tone than he actually was. Zimmerman sued, uh, I believe it was NBC that did the uh, photo uh, whitening, um, but uh, the uh, unfortunately for George Zimmerman, the, the civil suit against uh, the media for the, the various terrible things they did to him, the misrepresentations of fact, knowing misrepresentations of fact, uh, was presided over by the same judge who was his criminal trial judge, and she did not by all appearances, I can't read her mind. I'm making reasonable inferences from her handling of objections from the defense versus the state. Uh, she did not like George Zimmerman all that much, and uh, she just dismissed his civil suit against the media on the grounds that Zimmerman was a public figure. There you go. So the media lies about you. I guess under, under that judge's uh, standard, you can never have a civil suit against them for lying about you because their lying about you made you a public figure. But back to Dr. Uh, Dr. Leak. So some of you may remember from the George Floyd case, uh, George Floyd, of course, had Derek Chauvin's knee on his back. He, they, uh, this arrest was being observed by, uh, oh, 15 or 20 people on the sidewalk. Uh, and the court allowed every person on the sidewalk observing this to testify about it, even though they all saw the same thing. And that was not deemed to be cumulative evidence, even though their testimony was identical, just basically 20 versions of the same narrative. Um, the upper portion of the left upper lip 
and um, and the opposite and a uh, abrasion on the inner surface of the of the wrist and intimately uh, photographs of it and he had um, serotonin and swelling on the lateral nasal mucosa and the septum with the tender and swollen nerve bed. Well, I just go a little slower at 30 points because some of the um, terminology I'm not so familiar with. I'm not sure if you guys, I want the record to be clear. So let's just stop, stop, start with number one. Explain it? Yes. Okay. Um, soft tissue injury of the nose typically has to do with swelling rather than assault um, or fall. Um, and the nasal mucosa is the area inside of the nose um, on the lateral aspect typically. And um, Where's the word mucosa here? The lining of the nose. It says that there was injury to the lining of the nose? Swelling, yes. And bruising. And how did you determine that? I looked at the speculum. And so, number two. On the left septum, which is the partition in between your nose and the tooth making about two sides, there's swelling and erythema and tenderness to the touch. What is erythema? Erythema is redness, which was different from his right side. And number three. Swelling in the infraorbital areas, which is the upper and lower eyelid, the swelling and the mild bruising and the separations on that uh, infraorbital bony area. And where is it? Point to your face. Where is that? Let's go right below the eye. Yes. On what side of the face? The left. Abrasions of the cheeks. Yes. Um, those are um, where the just a very fine layer layer of epidermis has been removed. It's not a complete laceration. It's had to be scraped upon concrete and small amounts would come off. And the photographs uh, depict all these injuries? Yes, sir. And the lip laceration and swelling? I didn't change the sound, folks. That's the court. The court made some kind of adjustment to the audio. Uh, as, as we're going through this, I just want to share with all of you. So uh, I mentioned the George Zimmerman stuff uh, just briefly. So on the left here is the picture taken of Zimmerman's face at the scene by the police. You can see the nose is, the nose is broken, obviously. Uh, his, on the right, we have uh, what his nose looked like after EMT. This is the same, within hours, he's wearing the same jacket. So the right photo is at the police station. The left is at the scene. He's sitting in the back seat of a patrol car. Uh, the police officer, responding officer, took that photo on the left. You see the blood on his face. You see his nose is clearly broken, uh, dislocated at the very least. EMS basically grabbed his nose and, re and straightened it at the scene. Uh, and then when, Z when Zimmerman got to the police station, he washed the blood off his face. That's how you end up with the picture on the right, which is the one promulgated by the media, never the one on the left, showing the viciousness of the attack to which he'd been subject by Trayvon Martin. Um, that's if you're, you have the hip hard enough for falling, that it causes swelling and the mucosa comes off and there's just a, a small laceration where the skin has popped and um, broken apart. And so when you use the word laceration, you, you, does that mean there's blood? Yeah, there's blood from abrasions and from um, uh, the laceration. And is, is that internal or external? It depends on where it is. If it's in the, if it's internal in the mucosa, where it is, it's right here at the inside. If it's on the outside, it'd be on the outside. <laughs> um, on the inner side of the mouth along the cheek, uh, he had soft tissue swelling and abrasion similar to the uh, lower lip. And yeah, I'm not photographed that. I didn't have the equipment for the inside of the mouth camera. Number. What number are we on? We did six and what laceration of the eyelid, I think is good. Um, he had a small hematoma institution with breaking of the skin of the left upper eyelid. And where was that on his eye? Can you point to that? Yes, right here. 
in the creek and just above the creeks. And does the, the photographs depict that as well? Yes, they do. Now, based on your um, examination of him, did you decide to do some type of further uh, investigation to see what the extent of his injuries were? Yes, any time that someone has um, been at that type of trauma uh, and has the injuries, then we got a CT scan um, to make sure there's no bony fractures or nasal fractures or orbital fractures. And did you do all those, those scans? I did that scan, and due to um, uh, other injuries, and you said he was hit multiple times, I did do an MRI to look for subarachnoid hemorrhages and counter concussion. And what were the results of those scans? There's um, no bony fractures in the CT scan. The MRI is uh, not here, but it just showed uh, intranasal mucosal swelling. And have you uh, observed and watched the video uh, that was captured at Dos Gatos that shows Mr. Uh, Posado being uh, attacked by two men? Yes, just the far as hands him. And the, would you call, let's start with the first two blows, as a doctor, would you refer to them as slaps or, or punches, or what, how would you refer to those? I call it blunt trauma. And can you tell the judge whether or not what would happen if Mr. Casado, after that second blow, after any of the blow, would have fallen down and hit the back of his head? Where's the potential for injury there? You have a counter concussion as well as possible subarachnoid hemorrhage, or even if he hit a curve, uh, he would break his neck. If, if the attack would have continued more than what it had, what did occur, uh, what would you expect to have been the injuries to Mr. Casado? He probably would have had head trauma, a orbital blowout fracture, maxilla fracture, zygoma fracture, nasal fracture, mandibular fracture, loss of teeth. And that depends obviously on how further these people, these men attacked him. Correct. That's all the question I have. Cross examination. <clears throat> if I understood your answer to one of the last two questions that Mr. Hunt asked you. Um, he asked you for what would happen if he had fallen down and hit a curb or whatever. I think you said, did I understand you say he would have suffered hemorrhage or broken neck? Right. It was a speculation question. It's, it's, not, it's not a guarantee, though, right? He, he could have, but. If, the, if, if that would have continued, it would have happened. And how, how is it you can say with absolutely this? Because any time of continued blunt trauma, that always happens. Okay, so you don't have any way of knowing absolutely 100% for sure that it would have happened. It All right, folks, so that's the last witness of the day. I will get to questions uh, tomorrow morning uh, or in tomorrow's hearing. That's the end of day three of the hearing. Day four of the hearing starts with a defense witness, Dr. Lawrence Miller, a psychologist. Then the state has two rebuttal witnesses, uh, Dr. Alan Dean, an optometrist, presumably to rebut Casado's lifelong optometrist who testified earlier for the defense about the state of uh, Casado's vision. Of course, he wore glasses. And uh, the state also has rebuttal witness, Dr. Richard Ho, H-O-U-G-H, a criminal justice and criminal criminology professor, presumably a, a use of force expert witness to... Um, uh, contest the testimony of Roy Bedard today. And then the parties will go into, I guess what I'll call their closing arguments, uh, with the state arguing against self-defense, against a grant of immunity, and the defense arguing for. Obviously, we know the uh, defense was successful. When we get through that, um, I'll, I'll do a breakdown or step through the, um, the actual order from the court granting immunity in this case. That was handed down on uh, December 30th, a nice New Year's Eve present for Louis Casado. And uh, and then we will have the live appearance of defense counsel, uh, Dan Hilbert and Patrick Kanan on Friday afternoon, Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern time. They'll be joining us live to share their uh, insights, thoughts, comments uh, on this self-defense immunity win. And congratulations to them for that. Uh, very, very fine job, certainly, that we've seen so far. I don't, don't expect that to change. Uh, but let me get to uh, questions. First, I'll look at uh, law self-defense members. Uh, Kyle asks, law self-defense member, Kyle, what's your read on the judge? As a layperson, he seems pretty dialed in, curious as to your read, comment 
Uh, calling Santiago by the state wouldn't have gone any better than any of their other witnesses. Probably a good call on their part. Yeah, the, the state witnesses. Now, in fairness, we didn't see the first day of the hearing, which was would have been made up entirely as state witnesses. Uh, but uh, we saw the state witnesses the second half, and they weren't favorable to the state. If anything, on cross-examination by the defense, that their testimony was very favorable to the defense. So the state, I think other than the, those shots, the fact that um, the victim ended up being shot in the back and in an apparent running away motion uh, is really the only thing the state has going for it. And of course, that's that's readily offset by the context of how the shooting occurred, that all seven shots were fired in 1.7 seconds and so forth. Uh, the judge seems fine. I mean, I found a lot of those objections today uh, in, in the, the hearing we're covering today um, by the state. Well, you know, uh, isn't there a way we could know exactly what the defendant was thinking uh, at the time? Like the defendant could just tell us and then we would know. Um, I certainly found that objectionable. I was surprised the judge didn't squash that harder. Uh, but again, uh, in fairness, there is no jury here, right? So the damage is that a jury would hear that and and make an, an improper inference that the, that the defendant has some obligation uh, to testify. The judge obviously knows that's not the case. So it's not the kind of damaging that that one could argue would be occurring were those statements or arguments by the by the prosecution being made in front of a jury. But still, I I just find them inherently objectionable. Uh, let's see more law of self-defense. Uh, Donnie asks question, Tuller drill applies to use of force, deadly weapons, dangerous instruments, personal weapons. It applies to anything where distance is a factor, where the aggressor has to close on the defender. It takes a certain amount. There's a distance at which an impact weapon cannot be brought to bear readily. There's a distance at which it can readily be brought to bear. There's some intermediate distance at which it can be brought to bear faster than the defender can protect themselves. So, and typically those are impact weapons. If someone has a projectile weapon, I mean, especially in modern times, a gun, then distance doesn't matter so much, right? Someone who's 50 feet, 100 feet, 100 yards away with a gun can still hit you with the gun, especially a long gun. Uh, but it's an impact weapon. They have to close on you to bring that weapon to bear. It doesn't matter what the na nature of the impact weapon is. It could be it could be a machete. It could be a knife. It could be a bat or a tire iron. It could be a fist or a foot. Uh, the nature of the weapon only affects the element of proportionality. How much damage is likely to be inflicted? Uh, the whole tool or drill question is one of imminence. Is the threat imminent? And imminence here can be usefully defined as uh, what we call the AOJ triad, ability, opportunity, jeopardy. Unfortunately, a lot of, of self-defense instructors teach AOJ of, as if that were the entirety of self-defense. It's not. There's up to five elements of a claim of self-defense. AOJ is only imminence. It's a very good framework for imminence, but it's only one of the five elements of self-defense. Instructors who teach AOJ as if that were the entire legal question are in effect presuming that the other elements are, are present and favorable for the defense. They're presuming that the students in their class are law-abiding, so they'll have innocence. They're presuming that the students they're talking to will only use a gun if they're facing a deadly force threat. They're, they're presuming the students are going to make reasonable decisions. They're presuming these other elements. AOJ applies only to imminence, but it's, it's a very useful framework for imminence. So how do you know when a threat is imminent? Well, it's imminent when that aggressor has the ability to cause you harm, the opportunity to bring it to bear, and they're acting in a way that suggests jeopardy, that they intend to do that. Uh, ability could be a knife, but just because someone's holding a knife doesn't mean they have the opportunity to immediately bring it to bear. Someone holding a knife 100 meters away doesn't have the immediate opportunity to bring it to bear. So you need all three. You need the ability to cause harm, and there's always some ability, right? just a fist, everyone has a fist. So they have ability to cause some degree of harm. Do they have the opportunity to bring it to bear? And do they, is their conduct such that you can infer they intend to do that, the jeopardy component? Ability, opportunity, jeopardy. When all three are present, you have an imminent threat. But in the context of an impact weapon, whether or not someone has the opportunity to bring it to bear depends on how close they are. And that's where the Tuller drill comes in. Now, I will say modern, the current state of self-defense instruction, the, the, the many instructors I know who teach this stuff, 21 feet is considered way too short. 
Uh, the typical distance taught these days is about 35 feet. Uh, so it's it's been considerably lengthened for a number of reasons. One is the fact that we 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 no longer presume that a single round from a nine millimeter pistol is going to stop the threat. Right. Uh, we see people shot all the time, multiple times, and it's not until the last the fifth, sixth, seventh shot that they're finally stopped. That all takes more time. And during that time, the aggressor is still closing. Um, and you could mortally wound somebody and they still stab you with a knife and kill you. Right. So. So uh, the distance of the, the, the relevant tooler distance has been regularly lengthened over since Dennis did his first studies. Uh, let's see. Uh, Donnie asks, uh, law self-defense member Donnie, Andrew, in your opinion, did the prosecution produce sufficient evidence to, to J suspicion? I, I don't know what you're asking. The, the standard here is, uh, did the state produce sufficient evidence to meet their burden to disprove self-defense by clear and convincing evidence? I don't think they even came close. Um, now, if this had been not a 1.6 second series of shots, but a 16 second series of shots, so that a reasonable person in Casado's position would have had an opportunity to realize that the victim was running away, that would be a different case, right? But small differences in facts have big differences in legal outcome. Here, in the, in the time the shots were fired, 1.6 seconds, I don't think the state's proven by clear and convincing evidence that a reasonable person subject to the attack that Casado was subject to uh, would have had the opportunity to realize that uh, the victim here was no longer an imminent deadly force threat. Certainly not by clear and convincing evidence. Let's see. Yes, the defense counsel show is uh, Friday, Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, Dan Hilbert and Patrick Kanan are joining me live to discuss this case. So I would certainly, guys, I, I do all this from largely an academic perspective, right? You all know my legal practice is a consulting practice. I'm not lead counsel on cases anymore. I haven't been for more than 20 years. Uh, these are the guys actually fighting in the trenches. These are the guys with the real world expertise. When I consult on a case, I'm consulting to attorneys like this. Uh, they are the, the warriors in the arena. So I would urge you to join us at 1 p.m. Eastern time on Friday to hear what these legal warriors have to say about this case. Uh, I can't I, I can't, and don't claim to be able to rep replicate their perspective on having to fight these actual fights. I'm very much an observer, uh, a, a well-informed observer uh, for, for many decades now, but uh, not lead counsel on these cases. Uh, let's see, where did I go? Where did I go? Here we are. Uh, yeah, a uh, law self-defense member, uh, Kyle, has a comment. A secondary impact injury is known as a coup contra coup injury, where the acceleration deceleration of the head plays against the momentum of inertia of the brain. So you have the impact and then the inertial impact of the brain inside the skull, right? So your brain is floating inside this, this bony case, right? Someone hits you here and your skull moves, but your brain has to catch up. So this side of your head impacts your brain on this side. And then your brain gains momentum and smacks off the other side of your head. So you end up with two injuries on opposite sides of your head from a single blow. Let's see. Uh, Law of Self-Defense member Dave, a question. Great book, Andrew. He's talking about this book, by the way, Law of Self-Defense Principles. And you too can get this excellent book and you can get it for free. Uh, look at Amazon. Amazon has the book, 1,200 re reviews, five-star rated, one of the best-selling books in the criminal law section at Amazon.com. But don't buy it on Amazon. Amazon will charge you $25 plus shipping and handling. We only ask you for the cost of shipping and handling to pay our warehouse guys, to pay the U.S. Postal Service to get the book to you. We eat the cost of the book. 
lawselfdefense.com slash free book is where you can pick up this book. I encourage you to do that. Very easy. Most people tell it the biggest compliment we get on this book is that it's easy to read. Most people finish it in an afternoon uh, and it teaches you 80% of what I know about use of force law, which is quite a bit in a very easily digestible package. Uh, also, I'll pop up as long as uh, I'm still doing questions. Uh, on April 15th of this year, we're doing what might be our only law self-defense advanced course of the year. At the most, we do two. The next one wouldn't be until probably October if we, if we do a second one. This is our full day course, uh, the most comprehensive course we have on self-defense law. It's taught live by me, Zoomed to you on your computer. Uh, and the great news is if you, um, and we cover uh, defense of yourself, of course, we cover the five elements of self-defense in great detail. We cover the practicalities of the criminal justice system, what it looks for in an attractive target for prosecution, so you know not to do that. We talk about defense of others. We talk about defense of highly defensible property, like your home, business, occupied vehicle. We talk about defense of personal property. We talk about interacting with the police in the aftermath of a use of force event. We spend about an hour on that alone, uh, and it's a more complicated and subtle subject than you might think. Uh, we talk about how to develop your own personalized, legally sound self-defense strategies uh, and a lot more. It's a full day course. Great news. If you sign up for the April 15th course is this month in January, uh, it's 50% off the normal registration. That saves you $100. Uh, if you sign up in February, you still get a discount, but it's only 25%. If you sign up in March for the April 15th class, it's only a 10% discount. And if you wait to April to sign up, it's it's the full course, uh, full cost for the course. So I would encourage you to sign up sooner rather than later. Let's see what else we have. Um, uh, yes, uh, Dave, Law, Law Self-Defense member Dave. Question, great book, Andrew. Learned a lot by reading as I currently applied for a CCW in California. How does having a CCW permit help the process after a self-defense shoot, either from the standpoint of how a good defense attorney or prosecutor might leverage? I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't really make much of a difference. I, I mean, and partly it depends on what you're taught in your CCW course. A, a lot of CCW courses teach garbage, especially on the legal stuff. Uh, so if if you're taught garbage and you believe it to be true, uh, the legal system doesn't care what you thought the legal boundaries of of self defense were. The court doesn't care. The, the jury's not getting those jury instructions, your, your imaginary understanding or, or you, your misinstruction on self-defense law. Uh, the court, the legal system only cares about what the actual legal boundaries of self-defense are. Uh, so to the extent that you're mistaught and you follow that misinstruction, uh, you could well be acting outside the legal boundaries and then you just get convicted. So in that sense, the CCW of course could be harmful. Uh, of course, if they teach you good information, then it can be helpful. But a great place to get good information is lawselfdefense.com slash free book or our Law of Self-Defense Advanced course, which is applicable to all 50 states, folks, at lawselfdefense.com slash advanced. Sign up this month for 50% off. Uh, a CCW can be helpful if you would otherwise have been illegally in possession of the gun, for example, uh, in, in, not in California, as it happens, but in many states, stand your ground, like Florida, uh, requires that you are not engaged in unlawful activity. Well, if you are unlawfully carrying a gun, you're engaged in unlawful activity. A CCW could save you from that problem. You don't lose self-defense then, but you might lose stand your ground. You might reacquire a legal duty to retreat. Uh, so in that sense, CCW can be helpful. It can certainly be helpful in a tactical sense, in the sense that, uh, you know, I guess you're more likely to carry more often, if you have a concealed carry permit, uh, I mean, that's why I have a concealed carry permit. Uh, so I would encourage you to get the concealed carry permit. In terms of the legal arguments you might have to deal with if you're compelled to actually use that gun in self-defense, it, maybe it helps a little bit on the margins, but it, it's certainly not decisive. Having a nowhere on the five elements of self-defense do you see having a concealed carry permit, right? By the way, don't forget, you can get this cheat sheet. It's right below my name here. Uh, right below my image, lawselfdefense.com slash elements. It lists the five elements of a self-defense claim, provides a brief description of each. doesn't cost anything. We give that away for free. Uh, let's see. Oh, very sad. Uh, Slippery Jim in North Carolina, Law Self-Defense member says, uh, Dr. John Lott's mother has passed away. I know you're good friends. Uh, not sure if you know. No, I didn't know. So John and I have... Uh, 
we've traveled in the same circles. We've had a mutual admiration society for decades, really. I'm a huge fan. He's been a guest on my show before. Uh, I, I just, um, I, I consider Dr. Lott one of the, one of the heroes, of, uh, an Amer a genuine American hero. Uh, and of course, we all have parents and our parents eventually pass away. There's nothing to be done about that, obviously. But my condolences uh, sincerely go out to John uh, in what is uh, always a terribly, terribly difficult and emotional time, the loss of a parent. Uh, I can only imagine what he's going through. I mean, I lost my mother when I was a relatively young child. It happened a long time ago for me, uh, but it's, it's never good, folks. Uh, so, John, hang in there, buddy, and uh, my sincere condolences. Let's see. I think that's all the self-defense member questions, and let me take a quick look. We've had zero Super Chats today. I wonder if uh, YouTube is mad at me. And still zero Super Chats. Well, I want to thank all of you for hanging in here today. So, uh, the, the next live stream for this Louis Casada uh, self-defense immunity hearing will be day four of the hearing. A psychologist for the defense will be the last defense witnesses, a couple of rebuttal uh, witnesses for the state, and then the closing arguments, so to speak, by the state and the defense. Um, and after that, the hearing's done. And six weeks after that would have wrapped up, I think November 17th or 18th, uh, then it was about another six weeks before the judge wrote his order granting immunity. In this case, we'll also cover that order. Uh, if I don't do that tomorrow, I, I'm going to plan to do it tomorrow. Depends on what the, the situation is here. We've got a big winter storm coming into my neck of the woods in Colorado. So I'm not sure I'll be able to readily get to the office in the morning. But if I don't do it tomorrow on Wednesday, I'll do it Thursday. We'll cover all that. And then Friday, once again, we have the uh, defense attorneys in this case, Dan Hilbert, Patrick Kanan, doing a wonderful job. We'll have them live on our show 1 p.m. Eastern time. But I'll send out an email uh, to everybody uh, apprising them as the situation develops. Until all of that, until all of that, folks, I just want to remind you, uh, first of all, thanks for spending your time and energy with me again today. I can't tell you it's humbling. It's really humbling. I really appreciate it. Um, and as always, if you carry a gun so you're hard to kill, and that's why I carry a gun so I'm hard to kill, so my family is hard to kill, then you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law so you're hard to convict. Until next time, I remain Attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense. Stay safe.